Dreamscape presents Reptile Memoirs by Celia Olstein Narrated by Julie Maisie I is another Arthur Rambeau Part 1 Live Or listen Wednesday the 16th of July 2003 That first time, his body was a paradox, like living granite or silken sandpaper. He was hard and soft at the same time, coarse and smooth, heavy and light. The first thing that struck me was how warm he was, as if I had believed his body would be cold both inside and out, as if I hadn't wanted to believe that he was alive. Only later would I learn that he didn't give off any heat of his own, only absorbed what was around him. He lay in my arms, barely a metre long, and still just a little baby. He lifted his head, supporting himself against my arm, and turning his shining eyes in my direction. Perhaps he was trying to understand what I was, whether I was prey or a potential enemy. His split tongue vibrated lightly in the air, and he moved slowly up along my chest towards my throat. Once there, he stopped, half of him suspended in the air, his stony dead eyes on mine. I looked straight into his narrow pupils, into a gaze that was completely steady, free of any impulse to blink. He seemed to be seeking some kind of connection, despite the impossibility of communication between us. There was something ethereal about him. This ability to hold such a large portion of his body in the air without the slightest effort, or so it seemed, as if he had no need for contact with anything earthly and could have simply remained in constant weightlessness had he so wished. Just the thought of having such bodily control seemed impossible. It made me feel weightless, light-headed. I lifted my arm, and he hung down from it as if from a branch, moving searchingly towards my face. He likes you, said the woman with the American R's and L's, bringing me back to the cold attic room that housed all kinds of species in cages that lined the walls. There seemed to be a propensity for laughter in the woman's voice. Do you like him? It seems so. Like... The word was insufficient, something I might have said about a cool jacket. This was something else entirely. Can I hold him? When can I hold him? Ingvar and Egil looked on from either side of me. I had almost forgotten that they were standing there, despite the fact that Ingvar was a couple of years older than Egil, and although Ingvar had a beard and long dark hair like mine, while Egil was wearing a white shirt, his hair slicked back and blonde, right now they seemed like twins in their early teens. For them the word like made sense. The two of them liked the snake in the way that they liked bands and beers and anything else that might briefly preoccupy them. What was it that I felt? Maternal affection? Love? A connection that crossed the differences between species? When I looked down at that tiny face, so far removed from my own, I thought it looked back at me with trust, even understanding. It wasn't long since the idea had come to us. The living room had been heavy with smoke at five o'clock in the morning in Orlison's coolest basement apartment, where the red lava lamp stood spewing up its globs 24-7, we were the small group that remained of what had previously been a living room full of people. Close to calling it a night, but not quite ready to do so. The mood was subdued, the air sweet with smoke, and Ingvar sat in the armchair playing classic rock tunes on his guitar. Even Egil, who spent the entire evening pumping the living room full of 50 cent and outcast, had rolled down his shirt sleeves and settled on the rug, with his arm around a girl who was probably in some of his classes at the Norwegian Business School. I was high on the atmosphere and one of Ingvar's strong joints had withdrawn into myself. I lay on the sofa, 
concentrating on the ceiling, which was undulating up and down, up and down as if it were breathing. Having found the rhythm in it, I had intended to lie there until I fell asleep, but then out of nowhere a guy appeared. He had been outside and came wandering back into the apartment. He must have been an acquaintance of Ingvar's or Egil's. I didn't care which. Later, I couldn't remember his face, only that he sat on the floor beside my head and wanted to talk to me. But I was too busy watching the ceiling breathe. After repeated attempts at getting my attention, he went and sat with the others instead. I slept, or became one with the ceiling and ceased to exist. But soon enough, I was back. It was Ingvar's exclamation that woke me. The girl Egil had been hitting on was half hidden behind his back, her hands over her eyes. Egil himself sat with his eyes glued to the TV. On the screen, a man was standing in the jungle, half submerged in a muddy puddle and pulling something from the water. It was a snake with gleaming brown and black scales, as thick as an alligator, but much longer. The snake got bigger and bigger as the man drew it out of the water. Its skin was brown, black and yellow, a huge python. The man called out as he pulled forth an ever fatter, ever rounder coil. This is a big snake, he cried. The head, there's the head. An Australian accent and quick movements. At that moment, the snake opened its jaws and lunged at its captor, furious. The man backed away, giving a stifled cry, the snake following after him. I swallowed, heard Egil's nervous laughter and curses as if from somewhere far away. My heartbeat seemed to drown out everything, filling the room with the sound of my blood. My cheeks turned hot, my hands clammy. I didn't usually feel such an intimate connection to my body, not like this. There was something about the coiled snake's soft movements, the muscle power that must be hidden beneath the sleek scales. I felt drawn to the screen, where the man had taken a camera from his pocket and positioned himself to take a photograph of the enormous animal. Right then, the snake and I yawned, almost in unison. We stretched our necks, displaying a long and flexible oral cavity with tiny teeth that almost merged into one. A wet, soft palate, a tongue that waved in the air. Then we struck. The room erupted in unanimous fear and fervour as we sank our teeth into a thick, hairy arm. I thought I was going to die, the Australian man said. I thought it had me. He sat in a deck chair a tent in the background. It would have killed me had it not got its lower jaw stuck on my trousers. I never would have had a chance against it otherwise. The clip of the snake biting the man was shown over and over, in rapid succession. The soft pink mouth darted forward, darted forward, several times at speed, and then again in slow motion. I saw how the snake bit how a pale pink tooth snagged on the fabric of the man's trousers before finally breaking free. The thought of that tooth, how it would feel against my fingertips. I closed my mouth, swallowed. I know where you can get one of those. It was the new guy who spoke, the one who had come in from somewhere outside. Not as big as that one, obviously, but I know where you can buy smaller ones like it, babies. When I think back, try to remember what the guy looked like, I recall only a head without features, free of eyes, nose or mouth. But I remember that the room fell silent for a moment. Egil turned his head and flashed me a huge smile. I tried to mimic it, but struggled to overcome the intensity of emotion I was feeling. I was afraid they would notice how fast I was breathing, how I was swallowing saliva, how my cheeks burned. I nodded, slowly. Egil turned to Ingvar, who had a similar smile on his face. He nodded too. And so, wordlessly, we decided. We would get ourselves a snake. 
The evening came to life again, the room filling with laughter and voices. The new guy held up a glinting silver digital camera and snapped some group photos of us. Me, Ingvar, Egil, the girl, the guy, and in the background, the TV screen, featuring the frozen image of a six-metre-long python. The new member of our family was a metre-long tiger python, still just a baby but I was already lost in this tiny creature. Had the feeling of being suspended in mid-air above an abyss, an astonishingly pleasant sensation. Before I passed him on, I lifted him to my face and whispered, You're coming home with me. It must have been a figment of my imagination, but I thought I saw him nod. Mariam Christian Sun, Friday the 18th of August, 2017. Mama, can I get a magazine? Eben holds up a pastel-coloured comic book covered in glitter. The character on the cover is supposed to be a sexy zombie with shimmering lipstick, pouting with overly large lips. As a rule, only Tor takes Eben along to the store. I like to get the shopping done on my own. But today is mine and Eben's Just Us Day. It was my suggestion. School starts on Monday and I wanted to be the one to take our sixth grader out to buy new clothes and school supplies. Wanted to set aside time for the two of us in the hope that we'd become closer again. Our relationship has become more difficult as she's got older. Distant, somehow. We've been at the Storkaya shopping centre for almost three hours. I let Eben choose herself an outfit, and she picked out a pair of skinny jeans, a lace top with a button at the neck, which suits her, and pink shoes and a matching hoodie that she put on straight away. We stood before the mirrors of the clothing stores, taking pictures and messing around. We even found a yellow sweater in her size that looks like the cashmere jumper I have on today, and we sent Tor a photo of us. Eben is so like me when I was her age. It sometimes hurts to see it, how alike we are. But today, it's been sort of nice. After we finished our shopping, we sat in a cafe and ate ice cream. I asked her safe questions, and she answered them. We talked about horses for a while. She has a friend who's taking riding lessons and is eager to join her. I promised to speak to Tor about it, but she smiled as if I'd already given her my permission. Eben is a beautiful eleven-year-old, with locks of fair hair that fall down into her eyes, a narrow nose and thin lips. The absurd figure on the zombie comic book she's holding up to me provides a garish contrast. Eben puts on a face intended to charm. It probably works on Tor, who lets his soft-hearted nature guide him far too much. But this is a poor tactic to try on me. It makes me feel duped. For eleven years, I've looked after her, made sure she wouldn't come to any harm, wouldn't fall off the sofa, get food stuck in her throat, or swallow any Lego bricks. I've comforted her when she has cried, when she's been ill. She doesn't appreciate any of that. Gifts? And permission to do things, that's all she cares about. I take the magazine from her hands. For a few seconds, she looks at me, a light still shining in her dark eyes, and seconds pass in which she still has hope of getting, getting, getting. I flick through the magazine. More conceited zombie girls gazing from the pages with big, made-up eyes. They do everyday activities, go to school and put on makeup. The people behind the magazine know how to take advantage of the way young girls' eyes twinkle at the sight of all that glitters. What can you learn from this? Eben looks down, scrapes the floor with her new shoes. Eben, what can you learn from this? I don't know, she whispers. It looks to me as if there's nothing at all to be learned from this. Why do you want it? She continues to look down at the floor, half shrugs the one shoulder in response. Their hips are narrower than their necks, I say. 
I set the magazine back in her hands, stand behind her and open it to the first page. Look at this. No story, almost no text, and the text that is there is nothing but jabbering prattle. The only thing this magazine offers is ugly pictures of half-dead girls in makeup. Why do you want this, Eben? She shakes her head, tries to move, but I restrain her. Turn to the next page. Look at this. I turn the page again. Do you see? Ten pages and still no story. It isn't about anything. It's about nothing at all. I can hear the strictness in my voice, but I can't let my daughter continue to fall for something so tasteless. Next time, she'll know better. She tries to twist away, but I hold her in place with my elbows. She looks down at her new shoes. Let's go of the magazine so that only I'm holding it, along with her now limp hand. She whimpers, tries to pull her hand away. I've gone too far. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I just think you shouldn't read things that are going to make you dumber. Find something better and I'll buy it for you. Eben snatches the magazine from me, ducks her head and walks with quick steps, disappearing off behind the shelves. Then my mobile rings. I rummage around in my handbag and find Eben's phone first. She's asked me to look after it because her pockets aren't big enough. I dig around some more and find my own. It's one of the accountants. He's probably looking to arrange a meeting about employing more personal assistants. OptiHealth, my healthcare company, won a major contract in June. There was a photo of us in the Tiedenskrav newspaper. We were pictured with marzipan cake and sparkling wine, and after spending the summer planning, we're now ready to start delivering. But today, my daughter is more important than my role as the company's CEO. I've promised myself that. I put the phone on silent and let it ring on. Eben isn't at the magazine racks when I reach them. I pick up another comic book that seems better, along with a book of crossword puzzles. Stand there for a moment, looking at the magazine with the heavily made-up zombie girls. We can talk about it this evening. Eben isn't at the checkout either. Not by the shelves of sweets and not outside the store. I take the items from my shopping trolley and load them onto the checkout's conveyor belt. Take out my mobile to call her, but then realise that I have her phone. I think she's too young for a shoulder bag, but I'm clearly going to have to buy one for her soon. At the till, I pay and try to ask the boy sitting there whether he's seen an 11-year-old girl, but I may as well have asked the till itself. I pack my items into carrier bags, roll my shopping trolley through the exit and stop between two stores, glancing left and right. When I still can't see any sign of her, I start to shove the trolley hard in front of me, taking long strides out along the pavement, aware that my patience is wearing thin. I grip my teeth as I force the shopping trolley up the hill to the multi-storey car park. She isn't at the parking meter, nor is she waiting beside the car. I turn, looking about me in all directions, but there are only a few cars to be seen and no little girls. This is probably the point at which I'm supposed to start running around hysterically, call on the security guards and have a message read over the shopping centre's PA system in fear that someone has taken her. That's what she wants. But she will not punish me. I refuse to be part of her game. I begin to load the groceries into the car, throwing in the carrier bags ever more aggressively, the eggs have probably been crushed in their carton and I hope they're on top of the magazine I chose for Eben. I thrust the empty shopping trolley against the wall with a crash. It topples over and lies there, wheels spinning as I get into the car. The hem of my 4,000 kroner coat gets caught in the door, its fabric ripping as I pull it towards me. I start the car. Eben is such a fast runner that she'll likely be home in ten minutes. I refuse to follow her. I'll soon be out on the road. If I want, I can simply keep driving, put family life behind me and never come back.
Live. Orlison. Saturday, the 23rd of August, 2003. He had his hood pulled up over his head and was walking hunched over with his characteristic gait. I recognised his sweater from a distance, its grey and green stripes worn thin after years of washing. We came close enough that I could see the sweater was spotted with flecks from the light rain. Then he lifted his head and I met his ice-blue gaze, the smile that was almost expressionless in his pimpled face. As ever, he had a pouch of snus tucked under his upper lip. It was almost possible to believe that he had always looked like this. He must be 28 by now? Patrick waved. A nausea surged through my body. I spun around, looking down and making a sharp turn into the doorway of the first and best store, the jeweller's, but I regretted it as soon as I was through the doors. This was no escape route. It was a dead end. I walked over to a wall of cabinets containing gold jewellery and heard the jingle of the bell as he came in after me. The bright memories came first. Our laughter as he swung me around and around in the living room until we both crash-landed on the floor. The way he would put slices of ham and cheese on his face to make me laugh. Memories from the time before I started school, before the woman who called herself my mother began to disappear for months at a time. It was as if those memories were wrapped in cotton wool, as if my head turned to cotton just thinking of them. After the bright memories came the glimpses of everyday life. Patrick, who never woke up on time, the clock radio that buzzed and served up a dry newsreader voice into the darkness of the windowless room. It buzzed until Patrick pulled its plug from the socket. I would stand there, tugging at him until he got up, or until he told me to go to hell. Then I would spread butter on a slice of bread, drink a glass of chocolate milk and walk to school. When I came home in the afternoon, he might be lying on the sofa, or he might be out or he might be standing in the kitchen making toasted cheese sandwiches for us. The days drifted into each other, an entire life made up of things we did or didn't do together. The breath from his nose when he tickled me, the TV that was almost always on, glasses of congealed milk and bowls of leftover porridge on the counter, the blobs of toothpaste he would leave in the sink, which I would smear across the porcelain with my finger. Everyday life gradually became less the three of us and more just us two. The darkest memories came last. By this point, Patrick had moved so close to me where I was standing before the cabinets of gold jewellery that I could smell him. These memories I couldn't bear. I wanted him to leave so I would be spared having to think of them. I stared at the gold jewellery things I could never afford. The only piece I wore was a gold-plated key on a chain around my neck. I saw its reflection there in the glass case, and I saw Patrick, who at that moment reached out a hand and touched it with his fingertip. Have you become a latchkey kid, Sarah? A shock flashed through my body. I shrugged him off. Oh, Sarah, he said. I held my breath for several seconds, trying to keep the nausea at bay. My name is Liv, I said, and I don't know you. Rua, Christiansen, Friday the 18th of August, 2017. The clock on the computer screen is approaching 12. I check it around every four minutes occasionally glancing out of the window where the Sundborton ferry is returning to the harbour. The wind blows tiny raindrops against the pane. When I first came here, I thought the window facing the sea would be something that gave me pleasure. Now all it does is remind me that Christiansen is just as depressing as Orlison, only with a better view from the office. I've long since finished the interview with the girl who claimed she was raped while asleep. I'm just giving her testimony a final look over. Of course, 
I could have eaten lunch with the others. Could have joined them for a piece of the Dane's latest apology cake. When I was new on the force, I used to like these gatherings over cakes. I even pretended to love them when I went for the job interview in Christiansund. Anything to get out of Orlesund. But apology cakes aren't the same when you have a desk job and are no longer in the field. You just become the person who eats and never bakes, who hears the stories and analyses them, but never experiences them personally. Some of the old guys who are no longer in the field bake cakes to share regardless, but that's just idiotic. It isn't just that I'm no longer out in the field. After all that's happened, I can hardly stand to be around people anymore. And when police officers eat cake together, they ask questions. They want to dig around in you, know everything that's going on inside your head. I don't intend to share a bloody thing. I have no intention of revealing a single detail they have no need to know. They think picking up a junkie off the street is tough, that it's a tragedy if nothing comes of their attempts at flirting. I can't talk to these people about what it's like to have lost everything meaningful without ever having realised just how important it all was. Or what it's like to be 60 years old, with every year that passes just another year wedged between kiddo and me. It's too late for me. In the past lies an ever more distant memory of the people I didn't value while I still had them. In the future... Only death awaits. But I can't say this to my colleagues. So I remain the grumpy old man who sits there in silence, eating their cake. I won't let them force me into being that guy. My stomach rumbles, but I intend to wait until there are as few people as possible in the cafeteria before I go for lunch. To kill time, I play the video from the interview with the girl again. She sits with her head bowed as she speaks, her hands in her lap. Her hair hides her face from the camera. I knew him from before, she says, from school and stuff. He'd never, like, made a pass at me. There wasn't anything between us. That night, at the party at his place, he tried it on, but he wasn't pushy or anything. My own voice chimes in after a clearing of my throat. Now, you say he tried it on. What did he do? Silence. Then, he wanted to talk about things. Private things. Then he wanted to kiss me, but I pulled away. I said I wasn't interested, and then he gave up. Afterwards, everything seemed fine. He's the kind of guy you feel safe around. I wasn't afraid to lie down next to him and go to sleep. The girl begins to cry. I watch myself hold out the box of tissues. Tell me what happened next, I say. I slept, she says. I didn't wake up until he'd started. He did stuff to me while I was asleep. My own voice interrupts again. I know this is difficult, I say, but you have to try to be as specific and detailed as possible. When you say he did stuff, can you tell me what you mean by those words? I remember how I felt on those first occasions when a young girl cried like this in front of me. How incensed I became at the perpetrator or perpetrators. At times... I had more to give those girls than I had to give my own daughter. They needed me more, too, with all they'd been through. Now the empathy stops at the halfway mark. I can no longer bear to feel that emotion. I'm afraid I'll see red and then lose it. I stop the video in the middle of the statement. Look for a moment at the young girl's bowed head. Remember kiddo running up the street towards the house where we lived as a family. She was always so happy to see me. All at once, my heart starts to pound in my chest. I shake off the memories and close the video. I walk towards the stream of police officers who are on their way back to their desks in the operations centre. Soon many of them will be gone, 
The operations centre is being moved to Orlison in a few weeks. Everything disappears from Christiansen. There's only me swimming against the current. On my way up the stairs, I stop to tie my shoelaces, listen to the police station's hum of voices like a swarm of bees. I know that I can't stand much more of this, but I can't fucking stand any of the alternatives either. I straighten my spine and decide to jog up the rest of the stairs, even though nobody can see me, running past the wax dummies dressed in old police uniforms. The worst thing is that I used to wear one of these myself back in the early 80s, when I was new to the force and wore a neat police cap atop my thick mane of hair, engaged to be married and full of anticipation for all that lay ahead. All of that would go up in smoke. Bita walks out of the cafeteria, a bottle of sparkling water in her hand. Her face is so densely covered in freckles that she looks like a map. Her customary red plait hangs down over the epaulette of her uniform. She raises her hand in greeting as I pass. People greet each other far too much here. It's exhausting. Once I'm through the door, I hear a shriek, followed by piercing laughter behind me. I turn and see that the Dane has dressed up as a mannequin in a wig and an old uniform. The tall man is doubled over with laughter. Vita has to sit down on the steps and dry her eyes she's laughing so much. I know it's stupid of me, but I can't help but think that the Dane was standing there as I passed by just a few seconds ago, that he waited, stock still, as I walked past so he could jump out and scare someone other than me. There are still a few small groups of people sitting in the cafeteria, the ones who take long lunch breaks. None of the food looks especially appetising, but I decide to go for a chicken salad, pick up a newspaper and make a beeline for one of the tables by the window. The football coach, Magna Horset, is on the front page of Tiden's Krav today. He wants to help Christiansund retain their position in Norway's Premier League. I flick through the paper's pages to find the interview. Don't really give a toss about how Christian Sun FC are doing in the Football League, but at least the article will be about something other than the business sector or hospitals. Wrong. Even Hosseth has an opinion on the planned regional hospital that has already cost taxpayers 450 million kroner to try to figure out. It's a week since Christian Sun lost the appeal in the hospital court case. The hospital will instead be built in Molde. Plucking up my courage, I stab a piece of chicken with my fork. I've just managed to open my mouth over it when, from the corner of my eye, I see someone coming towards me. Well, hello there, stranger. Orsman is wearing a greyish-brown sweater that matches his white hair in a way that is far too clichéd. He doesn't get that I'd prefer not to be seen with him, that his presence calls attention to the silver strands on my own head. There's nothing to do but brace myself for Orsman's inevitable stories of school visits and concerned conversations with the town's youth. How's it going, Orsman? He sighs and sets down his tray on the table. You know, the longer I work here, the more convinced I become that there's simply no hope for the next generation. At least you don't have to deal with the sexual assault cases. Give me a drunken brawl or a break-in any day. The sexual assault cases are the ones that really get you. One of the most difficult things to accept about Osman is that we actually get along pretty well. It's depressing. I've heard that you're pretty skilled at handling those cases, Rua. I was talking to a couple of guys over a slice of cake earlier. They say you're a capable interviewer. I'm surprised that they've been talking about me, but I suspect Orsman isn't telling the whole story, that there was a but in there somewhere. Orsman starts relating a story about some young boy of 13 he's been trying to help. I quickly zone out look down at my salad and consider whether I should bother taking another bite, fill up my fork and look at the pale meat, the dressing the colour of mustard. Rua! Bita is calling me from the door, 
Her freckled face is serious this time. Meeting. Team room. I can see it in Beta's bearing, how she suddenly seems ten years older. I can smell a big case from miles away. That's what I need right now, for something to happen. I wasn't hungry anyway. I get up, taking my lunch and newspaper with me, and walk over to the rubbish bin, throw both items into it with both hands, the plastic lid giving out a loud crack. We hurry down the stairs to the third floor, but in front of the door to the team room, Vita stops. She holds out an arm, wanting me to go in first. I turn my head and see that Orsman has followed us. He's standing on the stairs and looking in our direction. As I reach for the door handle, I suddenly feel unwell. The room is half dark and full of people sitting in silence, all looking at me. Then there's a bang and the air is filled with raining confetti. On the wall, a sign that says, Rua, 60 today, lights up. And in chorus, the room erupts into a rendition of the birthday song. They sing, bow, curtsy and turn around, just as the song's lyrics dictate. I should have known. Of course the bastards intend to rub it in. Liv, Orlesson, Thursday the 28th of August, 2003. Oh no, 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 no! The car on the TV screen spun off the road, straight into a concrete wall, and was flipped over onto its back. Egil swore, flinging the controller at the pedestal with an angel figurine on it that stood in the centre of Ingvar's room. What the hell are you doing? Ingvar smirked, giving his long dark hair a flick as he swerved his car neatly across the finish line. You have way too much of a temper. But Egil's dad will happily buy us a new Xbox if this one gets broken, I said. You let it out, Egil. Oh, shut your mouth, Egil answered. The mocking, the bickering. Under all this was only good feeling. This was one of the things I liked best about these guys, that we could yell at each other without it being taken the wrong way. You don't talk like that to someone you don't like, not in that tone. We each knew that the others could take it and that they wouldn't go too far. Nobody misunderstood, nobody fell out, and it gave us all a chance to let off some steam. Egil flopped down on the bed beside me and straightened the beige Lacoste shirt he was wearing. It was slim fit, of course. He hadn't spent all those hours at the gym for nothing. Egil was irritatingly well proportioned in everything from the breadth of his shoulders to his jawline and cheekbones to his nose, forehead and eyebrows, which met in the middle. He was the kind of guy many girls convinced themselves they wanted because they thought that was what everybody else wanted too. Girls who looked like images from a glossy magazine thought they were looking for an image from a glossy magazine, and Egil used this for all it was worth. Only, I knew that in Egil's case, there was actually a good guy underneath it all. I lifted my arm. Nero hung down from it, his scaly body seeking to return to the heater below the window, and Egil took the snake from me. I sat down on the floor next to Ingvar and grabbed the controller. Ingvar started the game again and the vehicles lined up for the race. My white Jaguar and Ingvar's black Lamborghini next to two other fancy cars. The intoxicating sound of four motors filled the room. Some women in short grey skirts came up and prepared us for the start signal. Then we were off, full throttle through dark streets, I was so over-eager that I cornered with my entire body. I turned the car too hard, so its back end bumped into the crash barrier. No high score for me. Ingvar was soon in pole position, sailing elegantly across the asphalt, taking a long jump from the crest of a hill and making a controlled landing into the next turn. I was too concerned with what he was doing, and so crashed into a voxel with red stripes along its sides. We lost control. Both of us. Egil laughed loudly in his usual taunting way. 
seeming to have forgotten that he was in my position just a few minutes earlier. I regained control of the car and swerved around the Vauxhall into a perfect turn, only to find that I was now going the wrong way. I was soon at the back of the race again. I sighed, pulled carefully over to the roadside verge and parked the car. I think it's obvious what you're doing all day, Ingvar, when you're supposed to be writing music, I said. Ingvar raised an index finger as the words new high score appeared on the screen. You're just jealous, Ingvar said, because I'm so good. Good at not having a life, retorted Egil. Ingvar drove on without saying a word. I went and sat on the bed beside Egil while Ingvar carried on, driving alone in the lead, scoring points. You'll be here for the party on Saturday, right? Egil said. He tried to get Nero to lie like a cat in the crook of his arm, but the snake didn't seem to understand. Instead, he sank, pulled by gravity down onto the bed, resting his head on his coiled body. Nero was calm by nature. It was rare that he moved at all. He could lie in almost the same position for hours at a time, saving his energy until the next opportunity to hunt presented itself. I don't have any money, I said, or any leftover booze. Egil let out an exasperated breath. You always scrounge your drinks off me. And anyway, I'm not really up for it. Egil looked at me. I actually just want to spend the weekend doing my course reading, I said. Seriously, go to bed early and stuff. Spend all Sunday reading instead of lying in bed hungover and hating myself. Egil raised an eyebrow. I'm sure one party isn't going to stop you from becoming a nurse. Come on. It won't be like last time. It'll be cool. Ego probably remembered more than I did about the things I'd rattled off at some point in the early hours between last Saturday and Sunday. I'd vowed never to tell them about Patrick, but bumping into him in town that day had had such a strong effect on me. You'll be up for it as soon as you start drinking, Egil said. That's what I'd thought too, when I'd come back here that day and started to get ready to go out partying. Mostly, I just wanted to bury myself under the duvet and ride out the anxiety that was flowing through me. But instead, I'd decided to make it the best night ever, told myself that it would be fun just as soon as I started drinking. It wasn't. I couldn't even remember what I'd said, only that I had said far too much. I didn't even know that Ingvar already knew Patrick. Egil stared at me, giving me a dejected look. He was waiting for an answer and seemed to have no intention of accepting a no. I sighed. Just kidding. Of course I'm coming. I extended my index finger and touched one of the narrow stripes of pale scales on Nero's head, right at the top of his neck. If you looked at his head from above... The pattern looked like an arrow, a stroke of white at the very back and a dark, narrow tip that pointed towards the snout and jaws. I had spent so much time staring at this head, this wondrous signpost, in recent months. He's so beautiful, I said. I just can't get over it. Jeez, said Egil. Way to make a guy feel good. <laughs> I mean it. Just look at that body. He had shed his skin a week earlier. I'd been able to watch the entire process, from when his body had taken on a greyish cast, his black eyes included, until he scratched himself against the bedposts to pull off the brittle grey-white membrane. The new scales that were revealed shone in vivid colours, polished and gleaming. People once thought that snakes were immortal, they saw them being reborn from their own skin again and again. His skin was now hanging from the ceiling light in my room. I wanted to keep every rebirth, remember all the snakes he had been. Can't we bring the snake out at the party? Egil asked, fluttering his eyelashes. I looked at him. Just at the after party then? I shook my head. It's not as if there are policemen on the guest list or anything, just cool people. 
If he gets scared, we'll put him away again. It'll be fine. Until he bites somebody and she calls her mummy. I'll keep an eye on him. Warn everybody not to startle him. Egil, we're done talking about this. It's not just your snake. Ingvar, what do you think? Ingvar had turned off the Xbox and was now putting on a CD. Electric Wizard's Dope Throne, his favourite album. Slow guitar riffs filled the room as Ingvar slumped down onto the bed on the other side of me. He was wearing a band T-shirt that was so faded it was no longer possible to see what the image on it depicted. He had a book in his hand. Shall I tell you what I was thinking about earlier today? Ingvar said, holding up the book. Alice in Wonderland, I said. Children's books, Ingvar. I thought you only read Russian novels the size of bricks. It's a classic. Who do you think we'd all be if we were characters from Alice in Wonderland? Egil laughed. I certainly know who you'd be, Ingvar. You'd be the caterpillar that sits on a mushroom, smoking all the time. Ingvar threw his arms wide. All the time? It happens once a week at most. For some of us, that's pretty often, Egil answered. And who knows what you get up to when the rest of us are out at lectures. That's a lie. And anyway, it's medicinal, Ingvar said. Ingvar had epilepsy. He rarely had seizures, but he was always on guard against them, and he rarely drank alcohol. We had agreed that if he was ever home alone and called one of us but couldn't say anything, then we should assume he'd had a seizure and go to him straight away. Luckily, so far, he'd only ever had seizures while someone was with him. Egil grinned. It hasn't been proved that cannabis helps epilepsy sufferers, Ingvar, so don't try to make excuses for your drug use. Egil's easy too, I said. He's the Mad Hatter. One never-ending, meaningless party. That's your life, isn't it, Egil? Well, you're fucking rude, Egil said. And anyway, you're way crazier than me when you drink. Who's lived then, Ingvar? Is she the cat? She could be the Cheshire cat. Ingvar raised an index finger. Or I could have gone for Alice, too. But there's an even better option. Liv is the Queen of Hearts. Because I'm the boss of you two. Well, that. And you're the party queen. But the Queen of Hearts is the most important character in the whole book. She makes the story dangerous. There's no story without her. I don't get it. You think I'm dangerous? I don't get it either, Ingvar. Egil said. But think about it. Who was it that dragged us out for a midnight swim in February? Who climbed up Surketoppen in the pitch dark with a gang of drunken fools? Who crawled through a bush and into a fancy garden to steal that thing? Ingvar pointed to the angel figurine standing atop the pedestal, one of those fat, baby-like cherubs that you saw everywhere, but discoloured by green stains and seagull shit. It looked far from cute. I had named it Beelzebub. I remember when the light came on in the first floor windows, said Egil. You ran like fuck with that angel. Exactly, said Ingvar. How many nights would we remember if Liv hadn't been there to liven them up? Without her, there wouldn't be much that was memorable. Just an eternal, absurd tea party. I shook my head. For a guy who smokes all the time, Ingvar, you're actually really fucking smart. I don't smoke all the time. Liv is the one who's going to end up in prison, said Egil. I'd put money on it. Just wait and see how wrong you are, I said, laughing. So then it's decided, Egil said. Ingvar persuaded you. Nero can come to the party? Actually, I agree with Liv, said Ingvar. The snake will end up biting someone or maybe even trying to choke them. I want no part of it. Then my phone rang. The number on the screen wasn't one I had stored in my contacts. Hello? Her smoker's voice was rasping. Yes, you called me, I said, getting up. I walked out into the hallway, past the walls covered in embroidered decorations from our landlady's youth, towards the bathroom. Then I caught a whiff of a scent, a strong spray of perfume. Sarah, is that you? She sounded emotional. 
I flipped down the toilet seat, imagining the face of a middle-aged woman floating at the bottom of the bowl. Pulled down my jeans and underwear and sat down. It's Liv, I said and peed. She fell silent as I pressed the telephone hard against my neck, studying the sea of various dust-covered soaps, aftershaves, razors and other male beauty products, along with the washing powder, hair bands, some nail clippings, a tennis sock. I generally kept my own things in my room, unless I was taking a shower. It's Mama. I heard the sound of her breath as she drew smoke down into her lungs. The darkness. I wiped, flushed. The toilet half filled and sucked the paper down into the drain. I washed my hands under piping hot water. The woman on the phone said, Hello? I heard Patrick ran into you in town last weekend. Her voice cracked. I dried my hands, imagined how they would feel if they were covered in scales. My skin was such a thin layer, so delicate. I'm so sorry about that, Sarah. Her lies forced their way through. It felt as if they were working to loosen something within me. I looked at myself in the mirror, my face pale in the harsh light. I tugged on the gold chain I was wearing around my neck bringing the gold-plated key out from under my sweater and fiddling with it, stroking the small teeth at its end with my fingertips. I cleared my throat, which put a stop to her torrent of words, a relief. You've got the wrong number, I said. This is Liv, not Sarah. Are you doing well, honey? You don't understand, I said louder. I don't know you. I closed my fist around the key and tried to shut out the smell, the voice. Surely we can find our way back to each other again? I hung up. Her voice remained in the room as a vibration. I left the phone on the sink and went back to the bedroom. Egil and Ingvar looked at me. So many wrong numbers these days, I said. I took hold of Nero and held him up in front of me, studied the deep hollows in his snout, which he used to observe the infrared rays in the room. He could see our body heat. I wondered what that looked like. Nero parted his tiny jaws and hissed. Egil and Ingvar shuddered, but I wasn't afraid. I didn't think he would do anything to me. Instead, I tried to listen wanted to open my mind and understand his language. Could I make out a word, deep inside there? If I simply looked past everything that sounded like an S or an H, ignored my human alphabet, I might be able to discern what he wanted to say. He had no lips, so if he tried to make an M, how would it sound? If he tried to make a T with his forked tongue, a G, without vocal cords. His words could never be like human words, so he would have to use his own. Subtle nuances of H and S. If I listened closely enough, I would understand. Did I dream about it that night? That I saw myself as a burning flame, ablaze in the bed, and heard my own voice whispering? Or was it his? I don't remember what he said. We should try feeding him live mice, I said to Ingvar and Egil. Don't you think that must be better for them? More natural? Mariam, Christiansun, Friday the 18th of August, 2017. The windshield is full of tiny dead flies. I turn the wipers on, squashing them into reddish-brown streaks that arc across the glass. I drive. The road lies behind me as more of it appears up ahead, an eternal ribboning movement. On the dashboard is a pile of bills, because I'm an eternal self-contradiction. I run a regime of tidiness in my home that I'm unable to follow myself. I spray the windshield with wiper fluid, continue to drive. 
I could keep going until I reached Trondheim and stay there tonight, drive on in the morning, make it a fair distance before Tor becomes so unsettled that he reports me missing. A phone starts to vibrate again, mine or Eben's. He's calling constantly, probably thinks that his young wife has gone off to visit some lover or other, and now he's afraid our happy facade is about to collapse. That politician Tor Lin and his trophy wife, of whom everyone has such a good impression, are about to part ways. The ringing stops. I follow the turns that twist their way through the still summer green landscape. The fjord occasionally disappears behind houses or trees, but it's still there, pursuing me. The cool water is on the hunt, lying in wait for the right moment to pounce. I'm so tired of mountains and fjords. Would probably be just as tired of jungles and savannas if that was what surrounded me. I don't know much about the world out there, other than that it feels as if my heart is trapped here. It isn't enough to cast a glance at the horizon and see the water disappearing into the distance. I want to disappear myself. On the ferry, I stay in the car and close my eyes. One of the phones starts to ring again, then the other. The sound of the vibration is more muffled, as if it's tightly wrapped in something. I don't know why he continues to call when no one answers. I take a few bites of the baguette I bought at a petrol station. It tastes vacuum-packed and reminds me that everything is perishable. I put the sandwich down on the seat next to me, sit there staring straight ahead in the closed mouth of the ferry as I wait for its jaws to open and show me another world. The landscape changes as I drive deeper into Sertrundelag, less fjord, more forest. A rock face appears on my left-hand side, a perpendicular wall that bears obvious signs of blasting, to clear the way for people. In my bag, one of the phones buzzes again. I increase my speed, feeling the power in the turns, how I'm ripped along by the car's muscle. I think about what it would mean to simply take off, to leave for good, feel the impossibility of it, it wouldn't just involve leaving the company I've spent years building up, or my house, my husband, my life. Am I to demand that Eben come and live with me, become a single mother? In many ways she's more his child than mine. I could never take her from him. It's more that I want to remove myself from them. I weigh heavily on them, dragging them down. They'd be better off without me. Another fjord peeks forth through the landscape. I slam on the brakes, pull over onto the hard shoulder, turn off the ignition and sit there with my hands in my lap. There are women who leave their children. Nobody understands them. How could they do something like that? But even if the longing to vanish like dust in the wind remains, that too now seems impossible. When I think about disappearing completely and never being able to see my child again, it hurts. In my mind's eye, I see how Eben pushes her hair behind an ear as she sits and reads, and this awakens a warmth in me, tiny bubbles in my blood. She is, in spite of everything, my child. I get out of the car, lock it, even though there's not a soul in sight, and cross the road to continue down the sloped bank to the fjord. It's quiet here. Nothing but the occasional crow nearby. I bend down and stick my hand into the water. It's cold against my fingers. I look around. A car drives past, is gone in a flash. I pull off my expensive work shoes, lift my skirt and grab hold of my tights, pull them down, leave them lying on the ground like a dead skin. I step out into the water. It stings my toes, my ankles. I haven't been swimming this far north in years. It's Tor who takes Eben swimming, on the rare occasions when the sun is just about out and the wind warm enough that he can be bothered to put on his swim shorts. 
I had forgotten that there's something good about the stabbing sensation of feeling your feet go numb in cold water. I lift my skirt, walk out until the water almost wets my underwear, stand that way for a moment, looking out across the calm water. I so wish to be timeless, placeless, free from the meaningless laws of physics. It isn't the house, the town or my family that traps me. It's my body. I wonder how long it would take for somebody to find me were I to disappear completely into this dark water. But I'm not brave enough, don't mean it enough. There's something that stops me, some insistent force. I turn and start to walk back up the slope, my underwear and skirt wet because I move too quickly. The cold stings, and now I'm probably going to get a urinary tract infection. I return to the shore, sit down on the grass and look out across the water. My freshly laundered skirt is flecked with wet earth, but it doesn't matter. It's as if an old memory floats up and lies there, bobbing on the water's surface, a bubble that refuses to burst. I can't run away like this. It won't do any good. The thing will stay with me regardless. I get up and walk back to the car, shoes and tights in my hand. The asphalt is unfamiliar underfoot and small stones gnaw their way into the soles of my feet. I brush them away, get into the driver's seat, take my phone from my bag and wait until it's finished vibrating yet again. I'm being unfair to him. Know that I'm much more than a trophy wife to him. I don't want to listen to any of the countless voicemails. I turn off the phone, then do the same with Ebens. Then I start the drive home. I sit in the car for a while with the engine switched off, looking up at my house. It stands there in all its banality. The curtains in the windows I selected precisely so that they would stand out as little as possible. The coniferous hedge has been cut exactly as coniferous hedges should be cut. The gates are freshly painted, the garden furniture new and clean. Nobody who walks past this house will see the slightest trace of decline. It's on the inside that we're collecting dust and rotting away. I have a mental fantasy that tends to calm me whenever my emotions get the upper hand and which has often helped me fall asleep. I start by emptying the entire house of furniture, clothes, toys and all the myriad things we've filled it with over the years. See a van driving it all away. Then I take a bucket of water, a scrubbing brush, a cloth and some strong cleaning products. I start at the innermost end of Eben's room, working my way out the door and continuing with mine and Tor's. I spend a long time scrubbing and cleaning the bathroom upstairs, where we most often shower. When I'm done up there, I wash my way down the stairs and continue with the living room, kitchen, bathroom and toilet on the ground floor, as well as the large room we only use to store old clutter. Finally, I scour the hall until it's gleaming and white, the way it was when we moved in. A freshly polished chandelier, clean white carpet treads on each step. I wash my way all the way out onto the front step, where I stand, alone, before a closed door that no longer bears any trace of us. Not the tiniest bacterium, not a single strand of hair. It's a laborious ritual, which I can drag out infinitely. It always brings me a sense of calm. I slowly open the car door and then sit there, staring straight ahead, as if I'm waiting for something. Perhaps for something to fall from the sky and make my life different. Rain falls into the car, but I'm already wet. When I finally get out of the car, I crane my neck to look into the living room window. It doesn't look as if the TV is on. Regardless, it's so late that she's probably gone to bed and Tor is probably relieved not to have to listen to the sound of the TV for a while. He'd prefer it if we only ever watch the news. Anything for you, dear daughter, he often says to Eben, touching her fair-haired head as she sits in front of the screen. 
he's always been a good father to her. Reasonable and patient too. That patience is like a warm embrace that protects his little flock. It's actually strange that he's called me so many times today. He's never called me like that on the occasions I've taken a little trip by myself before. Not even the time I spent the night at a campsite before driving home again in the morning. All his prior experience dictated that I'd be back again. He knew that all he needed to do was be his usual, patient self and wait. What's different this time? On the front door hangs a sign that Eben made at school. Three smiling faces, two adults and a child, and our names printed in childish letters. Beside the faces is a large tree, which the teacher must have helped Eben draw. The Lynn family. I pass a hand across the sign. I so want to understand the mothers who say they would do absolutely anything for their child. Those words have come out of my own mouth too, but I haven't meant them. Not deep down. The tiny bubbles are there. The pride I feel when she does well. The comfort I offer her when she is ill. But when I try to find that deeper bond, it slips away. Would I jump in front of a train for her? Fight off a bear? I'm not sure. Eben must have actually tidied away her shoes for once. Perhaps she's taken something I've said on board after all, big girl that she is. I smile to myself and open the closet. But her shoes aren't there either. Nor is her jacket hanging on its hook. It's not on the chair, nor balled up on the shoe rack, where she would often leave it when she was younger. Was she really so angry that she rushed upstairs with all her outdoor clothes still on? Tor is sitting in the kitchen. He glances up from his laptop, meets my gaze. His phone is beside him on the bench. On the table, an empty coffee cup. His face glows with worry. His skin seems greyish and his forehead is creased with deep lines. I look at his blue eyes, the deep curves of his receding hairline he dislikes so much, even though it actually suits him. The slightly too large glasses he wears when he can't find the pair he likes. I suddenly feel a tenderness for my husband. How could I have thought of leaving him? Where have you two been? He gets up. My gaze lands on the kitchen counter, freshly wiped clean. I realise that the food I've bought is still in the car. I look at the chair where Eben usually sits, at the window ledge where she tends to set her mobile to charge at night, but of course I have her phone in my bag. You too? The words come out in a squeak. I'm unable to say any more. See how his face takes on a confused expression. I turn on my heel and walk in the opposite direction, towards the hall, Take the stairs two at a time and flatly ignore Eben's knock-before-you-enter sign that's been hanging on her door since she was six. I storm into her room and take a deep breath, ready to shout at her, give her a huge telling off. But the bed is neatly made and empty, as is the chair at the desk. I jog back down the stairs, stop in front of the living room door, feel the adrenaline surging through my body. That's what she wants for me to be afraid. She's probably sitting in there laughing at me. I tighten my grip on the door handle, throw open the door. The living room is bathed in dim evening light. I look towards the sofa, the dining table and the empty chair in the corner. Turn and walk towards the bathroom, but there's nobody in there either. I remember that I haven't checked the bathroom upstairs, so I run back up again and wrench open the door. What's going on? I hear Tor say from downstairs. The walls tremble from my own hard steps across the floor. I check the bedroom that Tor and I share, almost collapse as I walk back down the stairs to the ground floor, open the door to the room of clutter and stand there staring stupidly into the chaos. I go back to the kitchen. Has Eben gone out? I try to sound normal, unworried, but my voice is faint. Tor stares at me. The muscles in his neck tighten. His eyes seem to bulge. It dawns on me that he's angry. 
and if Tor is angry, then this is serious. You're telling me that you don't know where Eben is? The realisation reaches me at the same moment as his words. The clock on the microwave says 22.23. The shopping centre has been closed for several hours. And I don't know where my daughter is. Liv. Orlison. Friday the 29th of August 2003. We gathered around my bed, as if around an altar, Egil and Ingvar on either side at the foot and me at the head, standing next to the headboard. We had spread out a large white sheet, which Ingvar and Egil were holding up at the corners. Inside the sheet, a little white and brown mouse was running around, scrabbling and slipping against the white fabric. Egil leaned forward and peered over the edge, making little puckered kissing noises at the mouse. Nero lay resting in my arms. He lifted his head and stuck out his tongue in quick thrusts. I sat on my pillow in the lotus position and set him down on my legs, pulled the white sheet down for him. He scented the air with his tongue, aware of the prey now. His scaly body began to move, sliding towards my naked feet and making rough, smooth contact before he slipped over the sheet's edge. In the night, I had been woken by a sound in the room, like a wind coming from far away. Something barely audible but present, like an itch. The bright summer night made it impossible to tell whether it was two o'clock or six. I picked up my phone, saw that it was five past four. The sound was faint, but there was no doubt that I had heard something real. It was a sound full of smells, full of dreams. I bent over the edge of the bed and peered under it. Nero's stone eyes stared at me. He lay curled up on the rug. For a moment, I thought the sound had stopped, but then it started again. So low that I thought it might have been with me my whole life or never existed. It was coming from him. I lay down on the floor, closed my eyes and listened, thought I could make out the traces of this energy that danced in the room between us. Pure contact. Then I heard the first word. His voice sounded ancient, full of dust. When I first heard it, I thought that this must be what he had wanted to say to me all along. His meaning was so clear, despite the fact that it was expressed with just a single word. Dear. A warmth spread through my body. I crept close to him and whispered, You're dear to me too, Nero. Then a new susurration rustled out into the room, and I heard another word. Live. I had never thought any living creature would be able to make me happy, had believed that I would carry loneliness with me wherever I went. But last night, when I lay under the bed with Nero after he had whispered his first words to me, I felt a happiness spread through my veins, out into each finger and down through my feet, back to my heart and out again, as if I had found the way into my own body. The next word I heard from the depths of him was a wish. Hunt. It was a long time since he had last been fed, and he was dissatisfied with the frozen mice we dangled in front of him to create the illusion of living prey. He missed hunting. It was in his nature. When I woke again, early this morning, I was lying alone on the rug. I hit my head on the slats of the bed when I tried to get up. For a moment, I had the idea that he'd abandoned me, had found a way out and fled. But then I found him hanging around the plant on the window ledge. The rays of the morning sun hit his glossy skin. Yet again, I was fascinated to see his body balancing in this way, resting, yet simultaneously tense, in order to hold himself aloft. I lay down on the bed, tried to coil myself up as far as my stiff spine permitted, and then stretched out, bending from side to side with my arms alongside my body. 
Had any person seen me, they would have wondered whether I was having a seizure. But Nero looked at me and understood what I was trying to do, that I was attempting to get closer to him. Now the mouse was running around and around in the white space we had created for it, its little paws clawing and scrambling, continuously turning in new directions and failing to find a way out. I wondered whether it forgot where it had already been, or whether it tried a route again because it could see no other option. There would soon be no more directions in which to turn. The white space was being slowly filled by snake. Nero approached, a shadow in the mouse's world, seemingly new, but something that had always been there, a clouding of the mouse sky. In the next moment, the white and brown animal was trapped. The mouse thrashed about for a moment, stopped, then thrashed again. From its tiny mouth came a succession of desperate squeaks. Nero held the mouse firmly, squeezing, until the animal stopped its thrashing. Blood spattered the white sheet. I felt a tickling sensation inside me, in my chest, my belly, and deeper. Egil gave out a long, half-whistling exhalation. Then the body of the snake carefully tightened itself around that of the mouse. This is totally sick, Egil whispered. None of us said anything further. Nero continued to squeeze ever tighter. It didn't seem to cost him much effort. His body was tense but calm. Then something happened to his face. It seemed to open into a smile. His huge jaws slid apart, the skin at the corners of his mouth stretching like soft cloth. He enveloped the prey with his mouth, its white fur sticking out. The snake's brown and beige head was broad and flat and took on an even wider and more absurd leer as he swallowed. Soon, all that could be seen of the mouse was a pair of pink feet and a tail, before that too sank into Nero and was gone. Egil and Ingvar dropped the sheet onto the bed. They both stepped back without a word. A small lump moved down the snake's long stomach a barely visible protrusion in the radiant skin. I stretched out my hand and carefully stroked it with my fingertips. Wondered what it would feel like to be in there. It must be warm, probably wet and cramped too, like being in the womb. Reptile Memoirs One day I just knew. My tiny world was inside a thin, white shell from which I now realised I could break free. I pushed my head against the white membrane, carefully at first, testing the elasticity of the tough material, then harder, until the shell cracked. Through the opening, I found something cool, this new substance that I would learn to recognise as air. I had, of course, drunk all my amniotic fluid, and when I first felt the cool air descend into my lungs, it brought the sweet relief of finally having something I'd had no idea how much I needed. I looked around at the new layer of the world that had opened itself to me, a layer in which the universe's boundaries were an enormous, shining snake's belly, curled around its countless white eggs. Mother. Siblings not yet hatched, I slipped slowly out into the day, gliding across my unhatched brothers and sisters. There was so much to take in. The heat that glowed from above. A distant taste of life in the air. All manner of loud and piercing noises from some place unknown to me. Sounds that rose and fell. Vibrations from mother as she kept her eggs warm. By the time the light and the darkness had switched places several times, I had a dozen brothers and sisters who slipped in and out of their eggs, depending on whether they wished to sleep or to play. We coiled ourselves around one another, keeping our bodies close, each pulling in our own direction. Found new hollows between coils, slipped under, up and out. We learned the strength of our muscles, 
how easily we could duck away and hide, only to emerge again. Where one body ended and the next began was immaterial. We were both ourselves and all the others at once. Mother was hiding something from us. She shielded us from what awaited behind the great coil. At first it didn't interest us. We thought the coil must be the limits of the universe. For us, the days were a single intense wave of movement, heat and taste. Still, we knew that there was something we must learn, that there was a reason we tested our muscles on one another. We knew in our bodies that there must be some purpose for our strength. I clearly remember the first time I glanced up and found Mother's back was gone. It hadn't been an end after all, rather a beginning. Around us the ground was bare, the path open. I was hungry and the air smelled faintly of food. Small creatures that were hiding somewhere close by. Now it was up to us. Now we must spread ourselves like a river across the soil on our way to replace the bitter taste of amniotic fluid with that of flesh. I sought my way down from the empty eggshells towards the dry earth, tasted my way ahead between small stones, completely silent. The animals must be here somewhere, but the tastes in the air were distant and unclear. The only living heat I could see around me was from my brothers and sisters who came up on either side of me. I readied myself to dart forward, to streak across the ground with the hunter instinct that existed in my body and commanded me, requiring no conscious effort. I discovered that the air, too, had a boundary. No matter where I slithered, I met invisible resistance. I licked at the air with my tongue, but the barrier had no taste. The barrier simply was a new truth. Confused, I lay beside the barrier and tried to understand. I knew there must be something on the other side. I could clearly see it, hear it and smell it. Now I could even feel its motion. It was a creature so enormous that Mother's back was small by comparison. It was its height that was most impressive, how the being towered over me. It came closer, lifted one of its long limbs and tapped on the barrier. Tap, tap, tap. Shooting vibrations through my body. Live or listen. Saturday the 30th of August 2003. Everything was spinning. The room was moving in a circle so I could no longer distinguish the walls from the ceiling, my arms from the hands that held onto them swinging me around. People in an erratic stream of skin and colours rushing past in red, yellow and white. I saw hair and clothes and somebody laughing. I laughed back, unsure to which face. I'd had too much to drink. Tried to focus on a fixed point the black leather sofa and matching armchair, the dusty paintings on the walls that the landlady had probably bought second-hand for cheap, the chest of drawers in the corner, bright red, Ingvar's chest of drawers that was never used for anything, Egil's CD player with its speakers spewing out rhythmic words. It was always Egil who was first to choose the music in the living room. I liked Ingvar's better. It was more depressing and psychedelic, more in line with how I felt. Egil's dance music, all his racket, his burning need for life to be one endless party and nothing but fun, fun, fun made me uneasy. Had it not been for the fact that I knew him to be an entirely different person when his noisy course mates weren't hanging around, I wouldn't have bothered to maintain our friendship. That's just how our relationship was. We gave and we took. The person swinging me around had a shifting face, like sand. I wanted to stop, tried to pull my arms away, get them loose, but instead he pulled me closer, moved more slowly, stroked a hand over my hair. I was dizzy. I grabbed his arm so as not to fall. He embraced my shoulders, 
pressed me to him and rocked me from side to side, in time and then out of step with the rapping from the stereo system. It was as if the movements in the room didn't correspond to the sounds, everything seeming to lag behind. Nor did I know whether I could trust gravity. Up wasn't always up. Sometimes it was to the left, and I had no idea where my head, stomach and legs were, which way was up and which way was down on my body, whether any of it belonged together. Pieces that didn't really fit, but which could still be hitched to each other, an unsuccessful attempt to solve the puzzle. That's what I was. I lay my face against his sweatshirt. It had a design on the chest that I touched with my hands. The music pounded through my fingers. A while ago, Egil had tried to give me water and asked me to sit down. I'd simply laughed at him and emptied the half-full glass over his head. The thought of how furious he'd been made me giggle. What are you laughing at? the guy asked. I looked up at the silver chain around his neck and then at his chin, a round chin. I was just thinking about how bad this band is, I said, pressing my finger hard against the print, although I had no idea what it depicted. I giggled again, louder this time. Right then he grabbed my chin, hooking hard fingers under it and lifting my face. He pressed his lips against mine, shoved a reckless tongue that tasted of something bitter between them. A burning rose in my stomach, a bubbling at the very back of my throat. I twisted out of his grasp, in need of air, shoved my way between dancing bodies as I headed for the door, suddenly remembered the glass of banana liqueur someone had put in my hand, how vile it had tasted. I leaned on the chair and tried to force down the vomit. But it was no use. I managed to open the door and throw myself outside, leaning over the low wall that surrounded the terrace. Brownish-yellow puke spattered down the wall and across the flower bed, drops of it flecking the green leaves and pink petals. We were supposed to look after the garden. It was our responsibility. But the landlady had given up caring long ago. It was she who cut the grass and weeded the flower bed. At least I had now fertilised it. I walked across the grass, still with the taste of puke in my mouth, grabbed a large leaf from the plum tree and licked it, trying to rid my tongue of the taste. I leaned against the tree trunk, felt the cool dampness of the leaves against my face, closed my eyes and tried to find my way back to a world that didn't feel as if it were bobbing on the high seas. At least it felt good to get away from the music, all the people and the noise. Cigarette. The guy I'd been dancing with was leaning against the house wall, holding out a packet. The light had flared up beneath his face a childish face on a tall body. His head was shaved almost completely free of hair. The tiny remaining strands were so pale they seemed to merge with his skull. His body was skinny, and he was wearing a hoodie that made him look small, a copy of m and In his ear was a shining diamond. Fuck, yes, I said. He came over to me with a pack of cigarettes leaned against the tree, his arm propped above my head. The smell of his aftershave made me feel unwell. His face was so close to mine. He wanted me to light my cigarette using his, to screw it, as we said in high school. But then the nausea returned. I held the cigarette to one side and bent over. He grabbed my hair as the vomit sprayed out once more. I retched and felt my muscles tighten. My stomach was empty, but my body wasn't ready to give up just yet. The guy's hard groin pressed against my behind. His hand on my stomach was farther down than I would have liked. I wiped my mouth on my arm, leaving behind a viscous yellow trail, sucked on the tiny glow that was left on the end of the cigarette until it blazed as I walked towards the steps. The guy stayed standing on the lawn, watching me as I smoked. His eyes were so dark they were almost black. 
He had a narrow face, almost free of facial hair. Still, I thought he must be several years older than me. Sometimes you can just tell, without knowing how. He waited as I stubbed out the cigarette against a step. If I went inside now, he would only follow me. Why can't I see your room? Why not? Why not? I'd have to dodge him, slip away as unnoticed as possible. I usually win, I said, feeling that the cigarette had helped a little, although I was still very drunk. You usually win what? I pointed at him. Staring contests? I'm the most stubborn person I know, actually, but you're a real challenger. He came all the way up to me, put a hand on my hip. I like to stare, he said, letting his hand slide back to grab one of my butt cheeks and squeezing it. A new nausea surged up in me. I remembered Patrick's breath. I ignored the impulse to flee and instead leaned in closer. You're really fucking pretty, he whispered, pinching my lower lip between his fingers and tugging it. I smiled and dragged him closer to the house, to a place not far from the terrace door, but where nobody could see us without coming outside. I sat down on the grass and pulled him down beside me. I giggled and put a finger to my lips. Lie down. Close your eyes. He did as I asked, lay flat on his back with his face turned up and his eyes closed. He smiled absently as I began to open his fly. I pulled down his jeans, simultaneously taking off his shoes and socks, which I set neatly beside the flower bed filled with large salmon pink flowers. Under his jeans he was wearing boxer shorts with a logo around the top, boxers to show over sagging jeans. I got up and grabbed the garden hose that lay alongside the house wall, flipped up the red handle that started the water. The guy shrieked as the stream of cold water hit him. I dropped the hose and ran laughing towards the house, heard loud cursing behind me. I slammed the terrace door shut and twisted the lock with a click, squeezed my way through the mass of people, saw that Egil was dancing with a girl with long red nails that she was using to scratch his face. I was pretty sure she had breast implants. I was constantly fascinated by the women he conjured up. They must come from a place where the bimbo photocopier was in operation 24 hours a day. I forced my way between clusters of bodies who talked, jostled and laughed at each other. Fake smiles and artificially high voices. Fingers playing with glasses. I pushed past a couple who were making out. I walked towards Ingvar's room, opened the door and was met by a wall of music. The vocalist from Bongzilla was roaring and grunting from the speakers. Ingvar lifted his hand in greeting as he passed a joint to the person next to him. The room was dense with smoke and with people. The bed and the rug on the floor abounded with jabbering bodies. I sat down on the floor shoving myself halfway into a group of kids who looked like they were in high school. When it was my turn, I took my time with the joint, taking several long drags and letting it fill my chest, closing my eyes. I soon felt less drunk and more content. The voices around me lowered and the room became more remote. I could no longer hear the words, as if something had crept into my ear canals something that was expanding. It was nice. I took a last drag and opened my eyes to pass the joint on. In the doorway, a man stood looking at me. It was the M&M guy. He had a large wet patch on the front of his hoodie. Behind him were two dudes with big arms, bulging muscles. The way they were standing was like a parody of a Tarantino film. The M&M guy looked at me. I'd expected him to look away, but far from it. His gaze held as if it were black stone. It didn't suit him, standing there with the two gorillas. They made him look skinny, like a weakling. It was so comical that I started to snicker. And once I'd started, I couldn't stop. I bubbled over, tears of laughter gathering, and soon I fell backwards and lay there, 
laughing loud and heartily. When I looked back towards the doorway, the guy was gone. At the same time, I noticed that the room was quieter. As I leaned against the bed, giggling to myself, I felt someone prod me in the shoulder. I lifted a hand and gently pulled on Ingvar's beard. Good shit, Ingvar, I said, wiping away the tears. Ingvar's expression was stern. What the hell was that? He pointed towards the door where the M&M &M guy had stood. Just some guy who wouldn't stop pestering me. Ingvar sighed. Well, that guy who wouldn't stop pestering you is my dealer. I sat up. That's David Lawrenson? You always make him out to be so scary. He looked pretty pissed off. I shrugged. I'm not going to sleep with somebody just so you can get your hash. Ingvar sighed and sat up again on the bed. Coming from the speakers was Weed Eater, a band I liked listening to when Ingvar, Egil and me spent afternoons alone together. But right now, the music was far too loud, too heavy, mixed with the voices in the room. It was transformed into a seething mass of chaos. I thought that must be what it sounds like in hell. Hey, Liv! Egil was suddenly standing over me. I made space for him to sit down next to me on the rug, but he only leaned halfway down and cast a glance at two girls who seemed to be waiting for him. I was just wondering, those two ladies over there are curious about Nero? Don't you think we could bring him out here just for a bit? Stop it, Egil. Just for a bit? Or they could go into your room and say hello to him? I pulled him closer so that he lost his balance and had to sit down. I don't even get why you told them about him. Can't you get yourself some action without Nero's help? He's not just yours, you know. He was supposed to be the whole flat shares snake. Forget it. Egil bent down to my ear. Give me the key, he whispered, but I squirmed away. Beside my door, I pulled on the gold-plated chain I was wearing around my neck, and the key emerged from beneath the neckline of my top. I carefully stroked my thumb across it. I'd had it plated in gold when I moved here. My first key to my very own room, a place nobody would be able to enter unless I let them. Of course, I'd had a key to my so-called childhood home, but my room was always open, and for many years I shared it with Patrick. There was something holy about having a thing like this, my very own lucky charm. I turned and checked to make sure that Egil wasn't standing behind me before I stuck the key into the lock. Not long after, I was inside, locking the door behind me. I breathed out, walked over to the specially constructed terrarium by the window where Nero lay resting on the heat mat inside. When we bought him, the American woman had advised us to keep him in a locked room. Even though the terrarium had a sliding lid, he still might be able to get out. And if he got out of the house, it would become a story on the national news. I'd let him out onto the grass a few times anyway, but only under strict supervision. Ingvar and Egil left the doors to their rooms open all day, so the snake had to stay with me. I opened the terrarium lid carefully took hold of Nero's pliant body and lifted him up. His forked tongue sought the air. He stretched, seeming to be on the lookout from this new height. Hi, I whispered. Have you missed me? I crept under the duvet, taking him with me. His small scales tickled my stomach when I put him under my T-shirt. I stroked my fingers over his dry surface. When we got him, Egil said that he thought snakes were either slick, like snails, or sticky and soft, like worms. Perhaps I, too, had had such an expectation in my fingertips, but it was wrong. It was more as if his body was strewn with a blanket of tiny, smooth fingernails. I couldn't get enough of it, the feeling of touching the roughness of his back. When I had just moved in here... I might have ended up getting it on with that guy. I might even have brought him here, 
just so that I wouldn't have to sleep alone. I'd tried it a few times. It didn't help in the slightest. It only ever ended in a sense of unease, stinging genitals and too little space to turn over while asleep. This, on the other hand, sharing a bed with Nero, provided a kind of relief. I lay there, listening for his voice in the room, trying to find my way back to the words he had whispered the previous night. But he was silent. Had it all just been a figment of my imagination? Talk to me, I whispered, and felt a tear run down my cheek. It surprised me. I wasn't usually one to cry. Rua Christiansen, Friday the 18th of August 2017 Come dance with me. Ronya smiles and holds out a tiny hand. She's intoxicated and her cheeks have a rosy flush. Her brown curls, usually pulled tight into a hairband, now hang loose. Ronya Solshin is her name. It's a surname that promises sunshine and nobody honours that promise better than Ronya. She's the very embodiment of open and welcoming still marked by the naivety that adult life hasn't yet managed to quash. Needless to say, she still has a fair bit to experience in life. Thanks, that's very nice of you, but I don't dance. The bar they've chosen is crowded, full of drunk people staggering and speaking in excessively loud voices, suddenly leaning over a chair to talk to you. The most popular place in town, they say, because of the karaoke. The screeching of drunkards who have lost all inhibition, clinging onto a microphone. Great fun, they think. Not knowing the lyrics makes it even more amusing. Ronya leans across the table, casts a glance at the others who seem to be occupied with other conversations. She types something into her mobile, her thumbs moving quick as a flash, and shows it to me. I just want to say that I think you were right to be angry. They have no right to ask you about those things. I arrived at the restaurant late. The others had gone there straight from work, while I'd been given permission to run a few errands, change into a fresh shirt. Consequently, I ended up at the worst place at the table, the innermost end, where I sat right in the firing line for personal questions from police officers I haven't had a damn thing to do with since I started working here. They wanted to know whether it was true, what they had heard, that I had lost my daughter. Creased their faces into emotional expressions. The worst thing is that they think they're being kind. They think it helps me. They're dragging kiddo to the forefront of my memory to wave her about in front of me. They don't get that she's not a conversation starter. She's my daughter, my flesh and blood. I ended up asking them to shut up, bluntly. I nod to Ronya, give her a smile and thanks. Kiddo used to call me a grouch. Back then, I wasn't angry the way I am now. Irritable, perhaps. Principled, absolutely. At times, I was distant because my job was such a huge part of my life. Now, however, I'm a grouch. The grouch in me has become a friend, a protector. I hate the guy, but I need him. That's just how things are. I look down at the message from Ronya. Delete the message she's written and type back with clumsy fingers. It's always okay to be angry. Not at the bad guys, not when making arrests or during questioning, but otherwise always. She takes the phone and reads what I've written. Then she nods and straightens up and heads off towards the dance floor. She seems so unworried, so free. I'm at least happy that the music is too loud for any tentative attempts at intimate conversation. Most of the others are up on the dance floor with Ronya. She soon has her arms draped over the Dane's shoulders while he finds a place for his on her back. I wonder whether he's the right type for her. 
He seems decent enough, I suppose. But she'll get bored. These young girls, they need time before they settle down. Constantly on the lookout, and so bloody open. She'll be hurt over and over again before she learns to close herself up. Do you want anything? Shahid asks. I'm buying. His eyes are swimming, and he's leaning into me unnaturally close. Shahid has often struck me as being one of the most practical people I've ever met. His glasses are functional, his shoes comfortable, and he cycles to work, wearing a grey and orange rucksack with a water bottle tucked in its side pocket. Training and transport in one. Now, my usually sensible boss is waving his visa card in the direction of the bar. Drunk people can smell sobriety from a mile off. They do everything they can to obliterate any sign of clear diction or self-restraint. I point to my half-full glass and say that I'm fine. Are you doing OK, Rua? Are you enjoying it, working with us at the station? So he's going to try to have an intimate conversation, despite the fact that he has to shout to be heard over some tottering woman in her forties who thinks she's hitting all the high notes. Even if I'm not doing OK, which in a sense isn't untrue, I'm not exactly going to sit here and shout it out to my boss. I consider not answering at all, or asking whether this is an employee appraisal interview. Everything's fine, but I think I need to start heading home soon. He places a hand on my shoulder, a gesture of drunken intimacy. Stay a little longer, Rua. You're the guest of honour, after all. The guest of honour never wanted any 60th birthday party, but none of them seem to have realised this. Shahid is in his 50s himself. I'm sure he loved being the centre of attention when celebrating his last major birthday. Stay a while, he says again. It's nice to have you here. It isn't so often we're all out together. You need the social side of things. I'm sure you know that, too, with all your experience. It helps to know your colleagues if you're going to get on well at work. We have to be able to talk, air things out, given all the stuff we go through. But tonight's just about having fun. Cheers! I chink my glass against his. He turns to face the people sitting on the other side of him, and I look down into my beer, trying to breathe and count to ten want to say that I don't need to be taught that it's good to have a debrief. Of course it's good to have a debrief. About work-related stuff, the kinds of things you experience when you're on the job. And it's good for people who have little stress in their lives, who simply need to let off a bit of steam every now and then. For me, on the other hand, it's impossible. A slow song begins. Ronya and the Dane are slow dancing her head resting against his chest. She's so small and slight, while he's tall and huge, seeming to fold himself around her. Hands that drown her hands, shoulders that overshadow hers. They almost suit each other, but not quite, as if he's too large a version of what she should have had. He's polite, someone with a good head on his shoulders. That's good for her, at least. I'm not sure why I care so much about which guy she's seeing. I just think she's nice to talk to. I want her to be OK. There's a vibration on the bench. It's coming from Shahid's jacket, but he doesn't realise that his phone is ringing and continues to talk to the guy on his other side. I have to nudge him to get him to react. Instead of passing me on his way out, he elects to go the other way, making three other police officers move. I end up with Orsman next to me. He's managed to change into a fresh shirt and a knitted pullover. So, how are things going with the new guy? If I had ten kroner for every time I've been asked how things are going this evening. Things are not going well. I've run away to a new town, only to discover that nothing changes. It's so stupid. Just like that old nursery rhyme about the man who wanted to move from the gnome. Everybody knows that the cursed gnome is going with him. 
I lift my glass to say cheers and, just to have something to talk about, ask whether he's ready for the autumn term school visits. There's a reason Orsman is easy to talk to. To him, everything stays at surface level. Work, the weather and feeling worn out. He's eagerly awaiting his retirement, has just 18 months to go and is looking forward to finally being able to sit in the chair on his terrace and watch the birds in his garden. An old bachelor with dreams of lonely domestic bliss. I share his interest in birds, but for me it's something darker. I watch the birds because they remind me of what I miss, a sense of purpose. I watch them build their nests and collect food for their young, and think of the day somebody will come along with a chainsaw and cut down the entire tree. Orsman wouldn't understand if I told him this, so we generally talk about which species have visited our bird tables, me in my former life and he in his current one. The music stops. Someone clears their throat, and then a female voice comes over the speaker system and says that we have a birthday boy here tonight. I look towards the stage, where Bita is standing with four other police officers around her. Rua Ulsvik is 60 today, so let's sing happy birthday. Orsman grabs my arm, tries to pull me up. I insist on staying seated. But most people have quickly narrowed in on the birthday boy. The entire bar looks in my direction and sings along. A woman wearing a shirt with the bar's logo comes towards me with a huge cake full of burning candles that blaze in the dark room. I clench my fists beneath the table, know that I have to smile and say thank you and blow out the candles and make a wish, but I don't know how I'm going to manage it. I should have been the one who died, if anything in this damn world made sense. I shouldn't have been left behind to get older like this. I get up, can feel my smile as a stiff, fake line in my face. I wave, bow and nod as people film me and take pictures on their phones. I blow out the candles, have to take another breath to extinguish the last of the flames. Soon, half the bar has gathered round my table and is trying to congratulate me. A woman who must be in her sixties herself wants to buy me a drink. She's so drunk that she hasn't noticed that half her bra is sticking out of the neckline of her top. I politely decline. The next person to talk to me, though, will be told to go to hell. My stomach hurts, my chest is tightening with pain, and my cheeks are on fire. I try to jostle my way through the crowd, just have to get down the stairs and out the door, out into the fresh air. God help me if I have to spend another fucking second here. Rua! Shahid sticks his head in from where he's standing out on the balcony in the middle of a group of smokers. He's holding his phone against his chest, has seen that I've stood up to leave. He signals for me to go join him. For a moment, I actually consider going out to him, but I'm all out of patience. I'm going home. I pass a couple who are clinging to each other in the corridor and make my way down the stairs. On the pavement outside, I stop and take a deep breath. It burns my lungs. Rua! Shahid has come running after me. He tells whoever is on the other end of the phone that he'll call back. <laughs> Something's happened. He looks pale. He's holding his mobile between two fingers, as if he's holding something that's too hot to touch. He looks around him at the bouncer and a few girls who are standing a short distance away. A girl's disappeared, eleven years old, been missing for nine hours. I clear my throat. And they just reported it now? He nods. Seeing as it's a child, and she's never run off before, I'm opening an investigation immediately. Hopefully they'll find her tonight, but just in case, you know how it is. Time can be costly, should it turn out to be a major incident. We can't have all our investigators out partying right now if it turns out she's still missing tomorrow. We have to go home and get some sleep, all of us. I nod. 
feel the knot in my chest loosen, a relief. I clear my throat again. I'm good to work now. Shahid looks at me, astonished. You have to sober up first. I look down at my hands, haven't wanted to admit what I'm about to say. I've been drinking alcohol-free beer all night, I say. Live. Orlison. Friday the 9th of January, 2004. In a dark room sat a dark girl. Her long black hair was brushed forward over her face. She sat on a straight back chair at the centre of a ring of water. There was the whispering of a missing TV signal and a faint tone. The film's female protagonist approached the dark girl, stretching out a hand to touch her. Then in an instant, the girl grabbed the woman's hand the room spun in a circle and a scream rang out. The woman woke in her own bed. She had a bloody mark in the shape of a hand on her arm. I greedily helped myself to the contents of the popcorn bowl and rested my head on Egil's shoulder. Nero lay on the back of the sofa behind us, his tail touching the back of my head. Outside, wet snow was blown against the window panes. The lights we had hung above the terrace door before Christmas were only just hanging on after the season's festivities. Egil had spent Christmas Eve with his family and had returned with a strong need to reassert himself. It felt as if the entire town had marched through here between Christmas and New Year's. We could have made a film like The Ring, Egil said. You would have slipped straight into the role of Samara, Liv. Shh! Ingvar said. He was sitting in the armchair, his feet up on an old bottle crate, his dark hair hung down into his eyes. It could just as easily be Ingvar who played Samara, I laughed. We could have swapped roles. Ingvar threw a kernel of popcorn across the room so that it hit me in the face. I sent it back, but it flew lopsidedly through the air and landed on the rug. Egil came to my aid by taking a fistful of popcorn from the bowl and sending a shower of it towards Ingvar. I let out a silly shriek and clapped my hands. Knock it off, children, Ingvar said. One of us is actually trying to watch the film. You've seen the Japanese version, I said. You know what happens. I don't watch films to find out what happens, Ingvar said. The doorbell rang and the front door opened. Several voices could be heard chatting out in the hall. We're just setting up, one of the members of Ingvar's band shouted from out in the corridor. Ingvar answered with a wordless cry. On the TV screen, the lead character had found the dark girl's childhood home and had begun to discover the neglect to which she had been subjected. Egil stretched out his muscular arm, onto which Nero had seen fit to climb. I'm just saying, said Egil, when he's grown so long that he stretches all the way across the back of this sofa, we're going to fucking bring him out when we have people over. I'm going to do it no matter what you say. One day, before too long, you'll both move out of here and then I'll get to do whatever I want. Forget it, Egil, I said. I'm taking Nero with me when I move. It isn't just your snake, so that's not your decision, Egil said. I've paid for pretty much everything, including the snake and the terrarium. Your dad has, you mean? Shut up. Could you two quit it? Ingvar grunted from his chair. What's with you anyway, Ingvar? I said. Time of the month. Ingvar got up and brushed the popcorn remnants from his clothes. I can't be bothered with this shit. It's impossible to watch a film with you two. Ingvar disappeared into the hallway. I turned my eyes back to the TV screen, but I'd lost track of the plot. I don't like it when you do that, Egil said. Drag my dad into stuff like that. It actually kind of bothers me. I know, I said. I'm sorry. At Christmas, I had a dream about shooting him. Like in the head. He formed the shape of a pistol with his hand. He's a total psychopath. I mean it. He has no emotions other than greed and discontent. 
I don't think people like him deserve to have any power over others. People like him obtain power over others, I said. He nodded. I should rebel, make sure he gets what he deserves somehow. One day, I'm going to do it. Something that hits him where it hurts, in the wallet. Burn down the house, empty his safe. On the bench beside the TV, the lava lamp sent up a large yellow-green bubble. Is there something wrong with Ingvar? I said. He isn't usually so touchy. Egil took his time chewing the popcorn he had just put in his mouth. There is something, isn't there? I asked. He sighed. I've been at him a bit over some stuff. It's nothing to worry about. I paused the film and turned towards Egil. Nero licked the air in my direction. Why don't you want to tell me? Egil looked down. Because I really don't think you'll want to hear it. Just spit it out, Egil. Egil held the snake in front of him, focusing his gaze on the scaly creature. He's seen Patrick a few times, Egil said. In town. I saw them talking. I immediately closed my eyes, trying to squeeze away the memories with my eyelids. How Patrick smelled of beer and stale sweat. He was clumsy with dirty skin and greasy hair. The girls would talk about him, making sure he overheard. In the evenings, he would stand before the mirror, picking his spots. Ingvar says it's hard, Egil said, when the guy just comes up to him like that. I mean, they're old friends, but he's promised that they don't hang out anymore. Old friends. That was just the way it was. People knew each other. It wasn't enough to simply move across the fjord if you wanted to get away. I think Ingvar should have punched him in the face, Egil said. In fact, I think we should get somebody to go teach him a lesson. Like that guy David, Ingvar's dealer. He could help us. Not going to happen, I said. He is my brother, after all. Egil shook his head. You care about him. He doesn't deserve it. Has he been here? The apartment was suddenly filled with the loud, piercing sounds of instruments from Ingvar's room. It sounded as if they were trying to mimic a circular saw. Nero seemed stressed by all the noise. I took him down from Egil's shoulders. Fuck this, I said. I'm going to read. Oronia, Christiansun, Friday the 18th of August, 2017. August smells of fresh aftershave and whiskey. His arms are folded around me so that I'm almost drowning in his embrace. He bends his head towards me, all the way down to my face, so close that I can see the pores of his skin. Blonde stubble is just starting to appear on his otherwise super smooth chin. In the bar, everyone is singing happy birthday. We're standing on the steps, slightly hidden away among strangers, but someone from the station might pop up at any moment. I glance towards the bar but can't see anyone I know. August is very drunk. I've never seen him like this before. His eyes are swimming, his smile a long line. I giggle. I'm not used to seeing his face this way. There's something peculiar about having my arms around his neck, feeling the warmth of his breath. It feels so strange. It's not a good idea, this. Not a good idea in the slightest. We're colleagues, but it's almost as if it isn't happening for real. He smells good, and surely a little kiss won't do any harm. I have to stand on my tiptoes to reach him. His lips are thin, a bit softer than I'd imagined. His tongue moves carefully, a small pointed slug. A little smacking sound escapes my lips as I pull away. <laughs> I giggle again and rest my head against his chest. Shake my head at myself, hit my forehead against his rib cage. He breathes warm air into my hair. Maybe we shouldn't go any further right now, he says in Danish. 
No, I giggle, mimicking his speech. Maybe we shouldn't. Somebody bumps into us on their way past. I lift my head and see Rua's broad back as he makes his way down the stairs. The boss follows him. They hurry down the staircase and then disappear. August backs away from me. I hide my face in my hands, heat smouldering in my cheeks. Do you think they saw us? I take a few steps, straighten my hair. I have no idea what it looks like after he's been running his fingers through it. I think we should go inside and join the others before they come back. I start to leave, trying not to fiddle with my hair. I realise that I have no idea how my makeup looks either. Maybe my mascara is all over the place, but it's unlikely anyone will see. I lift my head, meet Beta's gaze across the room. She looks from me to August then raises an eyebrow and smiles. I should have known we wouldn't fool anyone. I stand in the queue at the bar. Don't want to talk to anyone, just to drink a glass of water and then go home. But Beta comes over and grabs my arm. I love this song. Come dance with me. I shake my head, but she doesn't want to hear it. Drags me out onto the dance floor. She puts a finger under my chin, tilts it up. Chin up, princess. So we dance. It feels better already. Freer than standing at the bar, feeling ashamed of myself. Perhaps this was what Beta was aiming for. Why she came over to me like that. I throw my hair back, look up at the ceiling and lose myself in the moment. The disco ball colours our faces with its shimmering silver light and we sing along to Wannabe by the Spice Girls and laugh. Then someone takes hold of my elbow, turns me around. For a moment I expect to see Auguste, but it's Shahid. He seems stressed. Party's over, he says. We have to go home and sober up. All of us. Live. Orlison. Tuesday the 3rd of February 2004. Her kitchen cabinet seemed like a portal to the world of cakes. She pulls out anise klingler, vinaigre, vertakaka and thick butter in a glass dome. The Serena Kaka biscuits must have been there since Christmas. She poured coffee into porcelain cups decorated with flowers. Brown cheese stuck to the roof of my mouth. I swallow down the bread and cake with big gulps of milk. They're making such a terrible mess down there, she said. It's too much work for an old lady. My son, she picked up a photograph of a middle-aged man and showed it to me. He wishes he could help, but he has enough on his plate as it is. Last time he was here... He took half of them away to the vet. It's awful to have to take such steps, but when you can't take care of them, well, it's nice that there are at least some young people like you who love animals. She patted me on the arm with a soft, slightly damp hand. When the old woman walked, she bent her elbows, hunched her back and thrust out her chest. She seemed like some kind of rare bird. I never had a grandmother, at least not one I'd ever met. Didn't know whether I had one who was still living, or what she would have thought of me if we ever did meet. I didn't know if her arms were like this woman's, the skin hanging in heavy folds from her underarms, wrinkled and strewn with moles like stars. She led me down into the cellar, where she lifted the blanket that hung like a curtain from a countertop. They were there in a box beneath the counter a mother cat and two tiny balls of fluff. The kittens squeaked when the light hit them and they began to toddle around. The woman lifted a small white and yellow-brown kitten which squealed in terror at being picked up. Its coat was thin and damp. The kitten lay there on its stomach in my palm as if in a ladle, helplessly waving its little legs. It mewed weakly, clawing at my hand. I gently lay the kitten against my chest. Hey, you, I said. You're coming home with me. I had to walk home. 
didn't dare take the bus for fear that someone on it might recognise me. I glanced at the people I encountered along the street, trying to figure out whether they were anyone I knew so I could avoid them before they saw me. I kept my back straight and chest lifted, despite the impulses I felt to hunch over, to run, to hide. At the same time, I did my best to avoid the slush, but it was no use. Water soaked into my shoes, making the legs of my jeans wet. It was a boring walk home, but never before had it elicited so much anxiety in me. In my hand rocked the cage. Every time I held it a little lopsidedly, the kitten slid over to the opposite end, letting out a fragile mewling. It was only twelve o'clock. The streets were relatively empty. This wasn't an area that was busy at all hours of the day, and I'd be fine as long as I avoided the high school students' breaks. Nor would Egil and Ingvar be home for a few hours yet. Nero was no longer satisfied with a live mouse or a rat every now and then. He took them and swallowed them, but they didn't satiate him. He kept me awake at night, drilling into my ears with his ancient voice. He went for me whenever he got the opportunity, wanted to show me how furious he was at not being fed enough. Now I never heard the words live or deer, only hunt. Hunt, hunt. He hadn't bitten me yet, but he had come close. I crossed the road, walked as close as I could to the remains of the old mounds of roadside snow, black with soot. Tried not to increase my stride. The risk of being seen was low, but my nerves didn't believe me. The mewling continued. What would I say if I bumped into anyone? There would have to be a partial truth if the lie was to be believable. That was always the case. But what would the partial truth be? I was looking after it for an old lady while she was in the hospital. A good friend of the family at one time. No, it would be too complicated. The cage smouldered between my fingers. The mewling made my temples pound. Just a few metres left of the main road... I avoided glancing into the car that braked to drive past me. It was a totally normal day, a totally normal day. I'd just been to the vet with it. I'm looking after it for a friend. She was taking an exam. Who was she? I was finally almost there, the mewling returning as I took a sudden turn. I had to stay calm. Just a single obstacle left now, and the riskiest one to walk past the windows on the ground floor, come up with a lie in case the landlady should happen to see me, as if this would be the thing that was the most unacceptable to her. She never peered out of the window, not during the day, nor in the evening either. She stayed hidden behind the curtains. But who knew? Maybe today she would peek outside just as I happened to walk past, with the cage heavy as a coffin in my hand, I walked calmly over the square in front of the house and glanced across. There she was, in the kitchen window, her grey-white hair like a cloud around her emaciated head. She was standing there, busy with something, and just as I looked into the window, she looked out at me. I automatically lifted my free hand to wave, but she just turned back to what she was doing. I did all I could to curb the shaking as I walked down the stairs. I had to stay calm. I had only borrowed it for a few days. Of course I was going to ask for permission if I decided it was something for me. Tried to unlock the front door with a shaking hand as a squeaking came from the cage. If I had only borrowed it for a few days, why hadn't I said anything to Egil and Ingvar? On the other hand, why would anybody care enough to ask me these questions? My eyes slid across the shoe rack and the floor, then over towards the living room, even though I knew that Egil would be at lectures and Ingvar was at a friend's house. He'd be practising with his band all day. I stood in the hall and looked out of the window at the patch of garden and the picket fence. A few cars slid past, I could still go back to the old lady who gave me the kitten and say that I was allergic, 
that I had changed my mind. Perhaps I would have felt better if I'd been able to involve Egil and Ingvar. With others, I could have written it off as something that got out of hand. We would have egged each other on. But I hadn't dared to ask them, nor had I wanted to. I'd wanted to experience it alone, guided only by the desire, the drive, to feed my snake. I let myself into my room with the gold key, set the cage on the floor and went to lift Nero out of his terrarium. I would often leave him free to rummage around the room as he pleased, but it was warmer in the terrarium. Even though I could tell he hated lying in there, even though I could hear him spitting out furious words when I put him in it, I knew that he needed the warmth of the heat mat. He wanted freedom, but I was fairly sure he didn't understand what that involved. Nero allowed himself to be lifted and set down on the dirty beige rug. He'd grown so large in such a short time and had become more difficult to handle, but he was always energetic when he smelled food. He'd already caught the scent of the new tiny creature in the room. He crept closer to the cage, his split tongue seeking the air. I opened the cage and stuck my hand into it, grabbed hold of the small body. The kitten whined and waved its little legs around. Its surreally thin fur created electrical wisps in the air. It whined at being picked up, at being stroked along its back, at being set down on the floor, at being in a room with air and movement, at existing. Perhaps there was nothing that didn't scare such a creature, apart from the heat of its mother, from which it had now been taken. An alarm went off in my body, my ears ringing and adrenaline pumping through me. But I reminded myself that this animal's fate had been sealed long ago. Nobody else had shown an interest in the litter. The others had already been taken to the vet to be put down. It would have been better to let them loose in the forest as food for the foxes. There were already far too many cats in Norwegian homes. Their owners wallpapered the walls of local stores with posters of kittens that were to be given away, to no avail. Better to give it to a hungry animal as food, I thought, than to fill the back room of a veterinary surgery with the remains of people's inability to take care of their pets. This way at least it would be of use. Nero moved quickly in the direction of the prey, which swayed unsteadily on its tiny legs. Perhaps the kitten saw the movement first, a gliding wave of body gathering around it. Then it noticed the snake's head. It screamed. Not a kitten's mule, but a terrified scream like that of a person, which was immediately silenced by Nero's teeth as they sunk into the kitten's delicate neck. Then there was only movement that remained, the snake's body as it pulled ever tighter around its prey. At least snakes were honest. They didn't try to conceal their actions with talk of morals. One minute we humans were speaking about good and evil, the next we were sinning against all we'd just said. The human being was a species that built walls of wood and stone around itself and its own so-called evils, called its prey beef and pretended it had never been alive. Why play such games? When a woman killed her husband, she was condemned, her actions deemed unnatural. Why not instead look to the female spider, who devours her partner as soon as they have mated? Realise that this, too, is part of us, that this is also nature. Nero's stone gaze fell on me for a moment, as if thanking me, before he began to swallow. I felt nauseated overwhelmed. There was a hard pounding in my chest, belly and crotch. I pulled down my jeans and underwear and, with somewhere between ten and twenty hard rubs, reached climax. Mariam, Christiansun, Friday the 18th of August 2017 I sit at the dining table in the living room paralysed. 
The walls are coloured by the flashing reflections from the blue lights outside. The warning signal to the entire neighbourhood that something terrible must have happened. Nothing has happened. I refuse to believe it. She must have just gone to visit somebody. In the worst case, she got some idea into her head and got on a bus. I refuse to believe that anything serious has happened. They'll find her in an hour or two. She'll ask for help from an adult or come home on her own. These things happen all the time. Children go missing and then they turn up again. They asked me to stay by the phone, just in case. My mobile and Eben's are lying on the table in front of me, neatly arranged beside each other on the placemat. I watch the blue lights flashing against the wall, take a deep breath and let it out. I should have gone to bed, really. Tomorrow is Saturday. Eben has a handball game and I've promised to bake a cake. The bags of groceries are still on the kitchen countertop. The eggs are probably broken, all of them, and the milk sour. I'll have to go to the store again early tomorrow before I can start baking. She can help me when she comes back. I hope she hasn't ventured so far that she doesn't come home tonight. I don't like the thought of her being cold and afraid. Or that she might talk to the wrong kind of grown-up. Mariam, Steinus and Lynn. There's a man standing in the doorway. He's taken off his shoes and is standing there in his socks, wearing jeans and a white shirt. He's tall, broad shoulders. His dark hair is shot through with a few grey strands here and there. He has thick eyebrows and a crooked nose. In his hand is a worn leather bag with a press stud fastener. He looks like a cross between a plumber and a geography teacher. Chief Inspector Ruhr Ulsvik. He has an ID card in his hand, greets me, gives me a firm handshake. R Roger. Ruhr. R O E. It's a Norse name. It means honour. He's from Orlesen. His dialect dances in my ears. His large chest lifts when he says his name. He lets go of my hand opens the leather bag and pulls out a dictaphone. I have to ask you some questions, Mariam. I hope that's OK. My eyes automatically start to flit about the room. More questions is the last thing I need. I just want to close my eyes and pretend this day never happened. Tomorrow, everything will be back to normal again. I've already spoken to... I've forgotten his name. He nods. I know. That's good, but I'd like to talk to you too, as long as that's all right. I don't like his tone. I think his pleasantness seems feigned, as if he's trying to charm me. I don't find him pleasant at all, actually. Could I ask a favour, Mariam? I came here in a rush and seem to have forgotten to bring along something to write with. I don't suppose you happen to have a pen and some paper I could borrow? I wonder whether he's the kind of person who thinks it's nice to be called by your first name all the time, as if I don't know my own name. Isn't the dictaphone enough? He gives me a smile that's difficult to read. Of course, but you know how it is, old habits. I like to note things down on paper. It reassures me that important information won't somehow disappear. If it's not too much trouble... I get up and go out to the kitchen. Think I have some paper lying around here somewhere, but I use it so rarely. I rummage around between the cookbooks, open a drawer that contains wooden ladles, serving spoons and a whisk. Finally, I find a notepad containing a recipe for sweet rolls and a shopping list. I can find nothing to write with other than a turquoise glitter pen that must belong to Eben. I look at it at all its glimmering colours. She loves pastels, little girl that she is. Why didn't I just let her have the magazine? When I return to the dining table, the policeman is standing there, holding one of our family photographs from the dresser shelves. He nods at it, puts it down. You have a lovely family, Mariam. My daughter is gone. 
Why is he standing there singing the praises of an amputated family as if it were whole? I look at the picture in which Eben is sitting between Tor and me, smiling, sunlight in her face. She must be hiding from me. When she comes back, I'll be sure to show her just how much trouble she's caused. I'll drag her down to the police station and get them to tell her how many people were out looking for her. Tor will be able to tell her how he walked the streets shouting her name, how scared he was. The previous policeman asked whether I had the phone numbers of any of Eben's friends. I was taken aback, but I gave them the entire list for her class. Tor's the one who keeps an overview of these things. We take a seat opposite each other at the dining table, where I've been sitting with the two phones in front of me for the past hour, staring alternately down at them and at one of Eben's old magazines that she's read over and over again while eating supper. It's become such a major part of our routine that I no longer tidy the magazines away. She removes them herself each time she gets a new one. Let's see, says Rua, noting something on the paper. I've been provided with a reasonable summary of the statement you've already given, but I have some additional questions. You said that Eben ran away from you after an argument in the grocery store? I felt my throat turn dry. Nod. Tell me what happened when she ran off. Eben wanted a comic book, but I didn't want to buy it for her. We argued and she ran off. I thought she would be waiting for me outside the store or by the car, but she was gone. He nods. Did you talk to the shopping centre's security guards or anyone in the store? I was too wrapped up in my own emotions to notice other people. I had a full shopping trolley. It wasn't very easy to move around. And anyway, I really thought she had to be waiting by the car. He makes a note on the notepad. When she wasn't at the car, why didn't you go back to the shopping centre to ask the security guards whether they had seen her? I thought she must have just run back home. It isn't far. He looks up. Would there have been anyone here if she came straight home? Tor was at work. She has a key to the house. I shake my head. She used to have a key, but she lost it and didn't dare tell us until several weeks later. We'd had to change all the locks. The policeman taps the little glitter pen against the notepad. I don't quite understand. If she didn't have a key... Why would you have thought she would run home? I look down at the table. Know that I should have been the good mother with her heart in her throat, running around looking for her child, crying and calling the police, even if only half an hour had passed since she last saw her little girl, because she's so afraid, so afraid. Instead, another Mariam took over, the one who is furious instead of afraid, who storms off, instead of staying to search. I'm unable to explain this to the police, but nor do I need to, after all. She's just run off and is hiding somewhere. He clears his throat. So, you thought that Eben had gone home. Then you got in the car to leave, but you didn't go home, did you? I went for a drive, towards Tronheim. I've already said that. He nods. You were angry, felt unfairly treated by an eleven-year-old, and so took yourself off for a drive? He makes it sound so childish. That facial expression again, which I can't quite decipher. There's something in it. A darkness. He notes something or other on the paper. Perhaps that I didn't answer the question? How long were you gone? Like I said to your colleague, I was back here around 10, 10.30. Which means that you were gone for between seven and eight hours. Do you have a habit of driving off, disappearing for hours at a time? I clear my throat. It isn't a usual occurrence. His eyes bore into me. Why is he so angry? 
Why did you just drive off, Mariam? Why didn't you look for your daughter? I've raised my shoulders without noticing. Forcefully lower them and take a breath. I don't know. You see, I'm getting the impression that you're lying to me, Mariam. My shoulders automatically hunch again. Why would I lie? He clears his throat, strikes the pen against the notebook with rhythmic clicks. Only you can answer that. Perhaps what you're saying isn't true, that you didn't try to look. How can I know you were alone in the car, that she wasn't there with you? How can I know that, Mariam? He started to say my name continuously now. It feels as if he's stabbing me with it, thrusting it at me. She wasn't, I say. My voice is shaking. She wasn't in the car. Another thing that's occurred to me, Rua says, is that she might have been in the boot. Was she in the boot, Mariam? No! I strike my palm against the table in front of me so my tea sloshes around. I haven't done anything to her. A flush spreads across the policeman's face. He coughs. Then he opens the leather bag with the press stud fastening pulls out something packed in plastic, a brochure or a magazine. A comic book. He sets it on the table before me. It's in a Ziploc bag. Sexy zombies wearing glitter lipstick. Was this the magazine Eben wanted you to buy for her, Mariam? If he doesn't stop saying my name soon. I can't take it any more. Where did you find that? It was found around here, down by the kindergarten. There's a shortcut up here, right? I nod. The policeman flicks through the notepad, holds it in the pen out to me. I need an overview of where you went, if you stopped anywhere to buy food or whatever. I'll need the names of those places. If you were gone for seven or eight hours, I guess you must have eaten something. I'll also need the time at which you took the ferry to Hulsa, since you said you were driving towards Trondheim, you must have taken it at some point, unless you've been driving round and round and round about for seven hours. I look down at the notepad he's holding out to me, back at the comic book with the glittering lipstick mouths. So she stole it and ran here, but she never made it home. I apologise for the brusque tone, he says, we are, of course, working on the basis that she's just gone off somewhere, stopped in to visit someone. Still, you know, the police must leave no stone unturned. He's still blushing. He gesticulates towards the notepad. Snack bars, petrol stations, if you went to a restaurant or whatever. A list of everywhere you've been today. I grip the pen. Think about what I've done. How I've tried to pretend there's something normal about all this. About how I've behaved. About the fact that Eben is gone. Do you think somebody might have picked her up in a car? My voice trembles. I don't think anything, he says. It hasn't sunk in for Tor just yet, I say. He hasn't had time to think it through. I wanted to... You know, just drive away. The policeman nods. He holds my gaze for a moment before releasing it again. Looks at the notebook between my hands, waiting for me to start writing. Liv, Orlison, Monday the 15th of March, 2004. I was five or maybe six years old, and lying in my bed. Patrick was in the living room watching TV. I could hear strange sounds coming from out there. It sounded as if he was watching a film. He had told me I wasn't allowed to leave my room after bedtime, but I desperately needed to pee. The glass of milk I'd drunk just before going to bed. He'd said I would regret it, and now it wanted to come out again. I imagined how the pea would be white in the toilet bowl. If I opened the door in total silence, 
he wouldn't notice and I'd be able to creep past him. I closed my hand around the door handle, began to push it down slowly so as not to make a sound. If I bit my tongue, I could concentrate better. I didn't want to disturb him, would just hurry to the toilet and then go straight back to bed. The sounds became louder as I pulled the door to me, just a little. The sound of women giggling. I cautiously stuck out my head. Patrick was sitting on the sofa, his back to me. His hair was long at his neck. I looked up at the screen and tried to understand what I saw there. The faces of two women at the edges of the image, the ones who had been giggling. Heads cocked to one side, long tongues, dancing hair. One of them had her hand around a man's thing, which filled the middle of the screen. A lizard, a slug. The women laughed and looked at us, sticking out their long tongues. What were they doing? Sara, Patrick laughed. What are you doing up? I shook my head, wanted to duck and look away. But right then something happened. The thing on the screen grew, stretching itself out to become long, like a big worm. It came out into the room, undulating towards me through the air, an enormous earthworm. Patrick's laughter thundered in my ears. I jumped up into a sitting position. The curtains fluttered inwards into the room, dancing like a huge cape. I got up and went to close the window, returned to the bed, where Nero lay stretched out right next to where I had been lying. When I lay down again, he extended his long body, showing me his yellow, brown and black scales. He had grown so much in such a short time. He was now twice as big as when we got him. I stroked a hand over his glossy surface. Snakes don't usually enjoy being petted in the way that warm-blooded animals do. I often thought that our relationship was something special, but for all I knew, this stroking might be bothering him. Sometimes it seemed that way, like now, when he reacted by winding himself up coil upon coil to become an accumulation of snake at my feet before sliding down onto the floor. He slipped across to the heater below the window and lay against the wall under it. I got up, walked the few steps across the room and kneeled down before him, stretched out a hand in order to re-establish the connection between us. I pulled on the coil, wanting to drag him out, but he resisted, lifted his head for battle and hissed at me. As usual, I heard enraged commands within that hissing. He went for me, and I had to back away. It was now a month since he had been given the kitten. Snakes could go much longer than that without food, but I had noticed that he seemed hungry again. I tried to give him a chicken breast, but he no longer touched dead food. He darted after my arm instead, hissing out his orders. The only thing that governed our relationship was my inability to give him food. He couldn't possibly conceive of how hard it had been last time, the risk it had involved, or how it had felt. For him, it was incomprehensible that prey did not simply arrive when he needed it. My body quivered as I put on a dressing gown and went out into the kitchen. I found the local newspaper lying on the floor with the paper recycling, opened it to the free section of the classifieds and sat down at the kitchen table. The column was full of advertisements from pet owners. There you are, Ingvar was standing in the doorway. He was wearing a T-shirt that said sleep on it in large green letters, along with an image of a dark caravan moving through a desert. I recognised the image from the artwork for the album Dope Smoker. I folded the newspaper, put it down on the table. You're up late, I said. He shrugged. I'm a musician. He opened a cupboard and took out a cup which he filled with water from the tap. We don't see you very often these days. You're just in there all the time. He jerked his head in the direction of my room. 
I have a lot of studying to do. In the middle of the night, too. I look down at my feet, bare against the linoleum floor. A dust bunny had got stuck under my big toe. I brushed it away with the other foot. Sleeping badly, then? Ingvar asked. I had a nightmare, I said. He took a seat at the table opposite me, ran a hand through his beard. Have you spoken to Egil lately? I shook my head. I'm just in there all the time, aren't I? He failed his exam. His dad won't give him any more money. I didn't know things were that bad, I said. It gets worse. His dad doesn't like him living here with us, thinks we're a bad influence. I laughed. <laughs> you have to admit, he's kind of right. He's threatened to write Egil out of his will. Egil is raging. You're coming to his birthday party, right? I picked up my thumbnail. Yes? Ingvar fixed his eyes on the tabletop. You know that it's okay to, like, talk to me if you need to? I tittered. Yeah, you're the best girlfriend I have, Ingvar. Stop kidding around. He looked at me. I mean it. I tried to squeeze away the memories with my eyelids. The rhythmic slapping sounds in the room when Patrick thought I was asleep. The later visits in the half dark. You've stopped meeting him in town? Ingvar nodded. And he'll never come here? He calmly shook his head. I promise. I looked at Ingvar, shook my head. It's too dark. For you, maybe. Not for me. The stains Patrick left behind were sticky and smelled sweet. It was no use trying to wipe them away, and there was no guarantee we would have any clean bedding the next day. When I thought back to that girl, the one called Sara, I remembered that smell. I looked at Ingvar, then back at my feet, kicked at the floor in front of me. I didn't want to call up those memories. What did I tell you? I asked Ingvar. That night, when I got really drunk and started talking about Patrick, I don't remember what I said. I don't want to repeat it, he said. He should have had his dick cut off for what he did. That's not the worst of it, I whispered. There was part of it that I didn't have the strength to put into words. How over time the little girl I once was had changed. She became more clingy, held her brother close, demanded his attention, danced around him in the kitchen. Sometimes it was even she who crept up into his bed. The worst of it is that I loved him, I said to Ingvar. That's why I had to leave. I accepted his hug. Ingvar's warm, bearded cheek his arms around mine. I let out a sob against his shoulder. That wasn't love, he said. Love isn't like that. Love is like that. For me. Ronja. Christiansson. Saturday the 19th of August, 2017. I pop into the store on my way to the police station to buy painkillers, salted biscuits and an energy drink. The Storkaya shopping centre stands there as it always has, showing no sign of whatever it was that happened here yesterday. I pay at the checkout and open the packet of biscuits as I make my way out the door. Put the first one in my mouth and throw myself onto my bicycle, pedalling the last stretch into work. It occurs to me that no matter what happened... It happened almost right under the noses of the police, perhaps even while most of us were out partying. I'm not even sure whether I've managed to fully sober up, but I don't intend to wait a minute longer. This is too important. I hope August hasn't made it into work yet. It would be nice to pretend just a little longer, act as if yesterday never happened, but as soon as I walk through the door of the department, I hear his voice. Not only that, but I'm sure that I hear a muffled, for fuck's sake, in his thick Danish. I've never heard him angry before. 
I follow the sound of the subdued cursing. It's coming from Shahid's office. The door is closed, so he must be speaking really loudly in there. I don't catch the rest of the words, but his voice rises and the boss answers in a tone that is probably intended to calm him down. Then the door opens and August comes out. I have to take several steps back so he doesn't crash into me, and I drop my energy drink on the floor in the process. He looks down at me in surprise before he turns and continues on down the hall to his office. Hi, Ronya, I hear the boss's voice say. I feel the blush spread across my face and bend down to pick up the drink. I was just on my way down to my office, I mumble. It's great you're here early, says Shahid. You're one of the first to get here. Listen, Torlin, the father of the missing girl, is coming in in half an hour. We have to conduct another interview with him and one with his wife later today. We need somebody to observe the interviews and take notes. Can you do it, do you think? Uh, of course. If the case drags out, you'll be assigned to other duties, but for now, this is what we need most. I'm going to watch the recording myself. I just have to see to a few things first. Talk to August about how you want to play it. This isn't what I'd imagined. I normally work with Beta. Usually, I'd have no problem being flexible, and nor will I this time either. Nothing unusual to see here, no problems at all. I grip my teeth until I'm back in my office. I have half an hour to sober up, to get myself really awake and extinguish this headache. Half an hour to get my heart rate down and rid myself of this blush. It'll be fine. As I walk through the door to August's office, I notice that he's wearing a facial expression that is difficult to interpret. Expectant and sceptical at the same time. I can still feel a little glow on my lips from yesterday's kiss, even though it feels strange. I feel awkward. I would prefer not to look him in the eye, but it will only be even more uncomfortable if I don't. Shahid asked me to observe the interviews, I say, take notes. He seems relieved, as if he thought I wanted to talk about last night. I involuntarily rub my shoe against the floor, making a sound that causes him to look down. He's an interrogator, used to looking for signs of nervousness. It apparently takes so little for me to make a fool of myself. That's good, he says, pretending not to see the heat rising in my face. I'll conduct the interview alone, but it would be good if you could watch from the observation room. Take as many notes as you can. He passes his hands over his thighs twice as he gets up, so I'm not the only one displaying signs of nervousness. He holds out an arm and I walk in front of him down the hall to the observation room while he goes to the interview room to check that everything is ready. We can collaborate. No need to feel uneasy. Not about the fact that I'm going to sit and stare at him on a screen for an hour or so. Not about what my colleagues think. Who cares about things like that? I'm a professional. I can keep my private life out of it and just do my job. On my way into the observation room, I realise that I ought to go to the loo before the interview starts. It would be stupid of me to miss anything. I hurry into the bathroom, feeling like a hungover teenage girl, just managed to get back by the time August enters the interview room with Tor Lin and starts reading him his rights. August slides easily into the role of reassuring interviewer. He asks whether Lind has problems understanding his Danish, whether he would like a glass of water, and apologises for the state of the premises. Tor Lind sits straight-backed in his chair in the cramped interview room. He keeps his hands in his lap. There's a little pot belly under his blue shirt and buttoned-up grey cardigan. He has silver-plated blonde hair and a hairline that's receding at the temples. A pair of silver-framed glasses surround his blue eyes. He's in his fifties and therefore some years older than his wife, but he bears his age well. Lin is a handsome man, in fact. He has a certain radiance about him. I note that he seems calm and composed, gives clear answers to the first questions about the case. As he told the officer who interviewed him yesterday, 
he got home at around five o'clock. He had expected Mariam and Ibn to be home already. When they weren't there, he called his wife and daughter repeatedly on their mobiles, but got no answer. Mariam didn't arrive home until around 10.30. She came home alone. Is there anyone who can confirm that you were at home? Lynn gives a ready answer. My neighbour across the street was out cutting the grass. Haven't you talked to him yet? August nods. We have. He says that you came home at five o'clock, but is there anyone who can confirm that you didn't go out again? That you were home the whole time? If so, they would have had to have seen me through the window. I was home alone. I become engrossed in August's fingers. They're thin and surreally long where they curl themselves around each other on the table before him. All of him is too tall and too thin, like a cartoon character. I touch my lips. Stupid. So, so stupid. Did you use your computer? August asks. Yes. Yes, I did. I, I sat and read quite a few articles online. When I wasn't trying to call Mariam, that is. What did you read about? I was looking for news. Traffic accidents and that kind of thing. Something that might explain why they hadn't come home. I called the hospital, too, to check whether they had been admitted. When did you call the hospital? Around seven or eight, I think it was. I write down the times. Now we have to check Lynn's browser history and call the hospital. I note that he sits leaning forward across the table, that he looks into August's eyes and doesn't seem nervous, that he asks several questions about the investigation and whether we believe we will find Eben alive. It takes a lot of self-discipline to present yourself this way, if you're not innocent. But we have to remember that he's a politician. He has the gift of the gab. He's used to making sure that he appears trustworthy. Tell me how you met your wife, August says. Was it here, in Christiansund? It was. She was a waitress at my favourite haunt. She came on to me, actually. Actually? Why do you say it like that? Well, as you might have noticed, she's younger and better looking than me. He's perhaps twenty years older than his wife. Not an unusual age difference, but it's obviously something that bothers him. I wonder whether he's insecure about something in their relationship. Perhaps he's afraid that she's not as taken with him as he once thought. How is your relationship with your wife now, after so many years of marriage? We have our bad days, of course. All married couples do. But I love her. I feel that every day. Does she love you? He hesitates, thinks. Yes, I believe she does. Although you can never know for sure, Mariam has it tough sometimes. There can be days where she isn't able to show us her love, but I trust that it's there. I tell her that too. I write that the interviewee seems to answer questions about his relationship with his wife openly and honestly, and I add in parenthesis that he seems like a good man. Think a little more and note that it seems as if he might be embellishing his family life as if he wants to cast even the darker aspects of it in a good light. Does your wife have a diagnosis? Lynn shakes his pale head. No, nothing like that, but she's had a rough time. And just so you're aware, Eben isn't my biological daughter. I'm not able to have children myself. Eben is the result of a rape. The interview room falls silent. Torlin clasps his hands on the table in front of him, gives August a serious look. I write, rape, underline the word several times. Mariam hasn't said anything about that. Everyone has been working on the assumption that Eben is Tor's child. Mariam is strong, Lynn says. She manages. It's just that some days I really see how that incident has left its mark on her. She can be hard on Eben, too, and I know that it bothers her when she lets her problems affect her daughter. Mariam also had a difficult upbringing, and that probably makes being a parent even more challenging. 
Of course, nobody wants to repeat their parents' mistakes. Did Marion report the rape? Lynn gravely shakes his head. She doesn't know who he is. It was an attack. It was dark, and she never cared to report it. When I met her, it was already several months in the past. Otherwise, I would have tried harder to convince her to make a report. So Eben isn't your biological child. But tell me in your own words about your relationship with Eben. She's my child. I couldn't love her any more if she were biologically mine. And now, once I'm done with this interview, I'm going to go straight back out there and keep looking for my daughter. Live, Orlesund, Saturday the 20th of March 2004 I lay under the warm juve, his body against mine, as the bass vibrations from the party outside spread through the bedposts and mattress. My earrings chafed against my throat, my tights against my waist. We lay there, Nero partly under my dress, his dry, rough body against my belly. He moved up towards my neckline a few times, tickling my skin with his coarse, smooth scales. A sudden hammering on the door, hard fists. Live, for God's sake, Egil called, tugging on the door handle. I put my head all the way under the covers, draw the snake closer, and studied those largely lifeless eyes with their vertical slashes for pupils. I'm not going out there, I whispered to Nero. I'd rather stay here with you. Just a couple of hours ago, I had been ready, all dolled up in a new dress. I had leaned against the edge of the sofa, putting on my makeup in front of the mirror on the wall. Egil had come in wearing a shirt that looked as if it had cost half the price of a car. I refrained from asking him whether he'd used his credit card. Egil, 20 today, hung on the wall in large letters. He'd paced back and forth, rattling off all the names of everyone who was coming. Said it was going to be such a great party. It had been nice, almost like when I'd just moved in. I had felt a tiny spark of expectation as we stood there preparing trays of red, yellow and green vodka jelly shots. I had been ready, even to risk meeting David or some other idiot who wanted to pressure me into things. I had wanted to be ready so that Egil would have the celebration he deserved, because he was a friend through and through. The only thing I hadn't been ready for was that he would start to bug me about Nero again, even before a single guest had arrived. That's the only birthday present you need to give me, Liv. Nobody understands why they never get to see him. They think I've made him up. I don't understand why you've even told them about him, I said. Because I don't have weird rules, Egil snarled. Do you have to brag to get attention or something, I said. Are you worried that they won't have the same respect for you now that Daddy has cut the cord? Egil's mouth fell open. He gave me a look that indicated he couldn't believe what I'd just said. Then he lunged at me. His fingers clawed for the key that hung around my neck. He tore at the chain. I thrust an elbow into his stomach, worked myself free of his grasp and turned and walked with long strides straight into my room. I pulled the duvet up over both of us and lay still. The party moved the house around us. Voices hit the walls and ceiling. Feet tramped against worn wood and linoleum. And Egil's fists hammered at the door. They couldn't break in, couldn't reach us where we were. We lay with our heads beneath the duvet, breathing each other's air in the dark. Have you ever thought, I whispered, that life is a brick wall you just hammer away at to see what's on the other side? He answered by licking the air with the two tips of his tongue. Many Native American peoples believed that snakes were messengers between humans and the underworld. They used to pray to these animals, asking them to carry their messages to the rain gods. Then, when it finally began to rain and the snakes crept forth from their holes in the ground, they took this as a sign that their prayers had been heard. 
You're the one who's closest to knowing what's on the other side, I whispered. Egil finally gave up his insistent hammering. We were surrounded only by the bass vibrations once more. I'd really messed up this time. He would never forgive me. But I couldn't stand even the thought of going out there now. The past week had been long and heavy. Sitting in lectures was fine, but having to do group work with girls who seemed to have a natural ability to know what was right all the time was harder. When they weren't talking about how to make up beds with hospital corners and how to dose medications, they talked constantly about boys. I didn't see myself in their problems. Men didn't approach me in the same way. With the other girls, they flirted and invited them out to do things together. They approached me as if getting ready to defeat an enemy. I had found girls difficult ever since I was small. They sat on the edge of the sandbox wearing pink bubble jackets, brushing the tails of their beautifully pastel-coloured My Little Ponies. They had perfect features, hair that fell softly around their cheeks. They looked at my grey jacket, a hand-me-down from Patrick, saw my worn-out trainers, my ash-blonde hair that was uncut and probably unwashed too. They saw all this and then they turned to each other and snickered. With the boys, it was simpler. It was enough just to be a girl who didn't act like a girl. I'd climb trees, fight, that sort of thing. This was, on the whole, a successful strategy, until one of them tried to push me down a steep hillside. I just managed to keep my balance, then grabbed hold of the first stone I saw and threw it at him. I didn't mean to hit him, but the rock sailed through the air, grazing his head as it passed him. It was all fine in the end. He wasn't badly scratched up. But his mother was furious. After that, none of the kids were allowed to play with me anymore. Only Patrick. I had read that snakes feel no sense of belonging. That they are not pack animals. When you see them hunting together, they're not collaborating, they're competing. Snakes do not bond to individuals. They do not make themselves dependent on others. As soon as all her eggs are hatched, the mother snake leaves her children. I believed I could have lived like this, completely free of friendships and familial bonds, to have contact with other members of my species only when they could be used for something. In a way, I thought that this was what bound him and me together, the fact that we were so independent. I only wish I could get properly close to you, Nero, I whispered. At that moment there was a knocking on the window pane, quick and insistent. Tap, tap, tap. I glanced over and saw a face peering in at me. I always kept the curtains open during the day so Nero would get as much sunlight as possible. I had almost stopped putting him in the terrarium, wanting to allow him to move freely. Now I'd forgotten to draw the curtains again. I reluctantly slipped Nero out from under my dress and walked over to the window. It was David, the stub of a cigarette between his lips, the same closely shaved hair and eyes like black holes. He was wearing a hoodie that was even baggier than the sweatshirt he'd had on the last time I saw him, if that was possible. I opened the window a crack. What do you want? Are you sick? Just not in a partying mood? Cigarette? It was the only word that would have made me open the window right then. I hitched myself up onto the window sill and reached out a hand for the pack, but he snatched it away with a smile. Let me come in first. I made space for him next to me. He jumped and pulled himself up onto the ledge. His shoulder touched mine. He lit my cigarette and I greedily sucked the smoke into me, taking deep drags down into my lungs. It was Patrick who taught me to smoke. He showed me how to inhale properly and laughed at me when I started to cough. David said nothing. He just sat there beside me, blowing blue-grey clouds out into the night's darkness. He finished his cigarette, 
stubbed it out against the wall of the house and threw the butt into the blackness that blanketed the garden. He turned his head and looked into the room. His body jerked. Then he laughed, a booming chuckle. So, that's Nero, he said. With great difficulty, he managed to get a foot over the windowsill and come into the room. Nero had climbed up into the plant just beside the window. David gently took him down, holding him out in front of him. Well, hello there, Nero, David said. For a moment, I wondered how he could know the snake's name. But of course, he would have heard it from Egil. I quickly took the last drags on my cigarette and climbed back into the room. It's crazy hot in here, David said. Must be over 30 degrees. Snakes need heat, I said. I'd got used to how warm it was in the room, just as I had got used to the floor being covered in newspaper so that Nero could slither around as he wished, even after feeding. Nero licked the air with the tips of his tongue, held his head aloft, seeming to study this new person in the room. His radiant eyes moved a little now, as if he were trying to register what was going on. Then he opened his mouth and gave out a low hiss. He felt threatened. David, on the other hand, seemed to take the situation in his stride. He carefully set the snake across his shoulders, did a couple of dumb dance moves and stopped in front of me. Sexy, huh? He laughed. His mouth tasted of beer and stale smoke. In some ways it was a relief to kiss him, our tongues twisted around each other. Nero continued to slide up over David's neck, draping himself over his shoulder on the other side. I tugged on David's white T-shirt, trying to pull it up. He wanted to move Nero, but I stopped him. I lifted the snake long enough for him to pull off his T-shirt, then put Nero back across his naked shoulders. I didn't really like having sex. If I did it, it was because the other person wanted to, and to pass the time. It didn't matter who I did it with, or whether they were men or women, it was only ever something to do. It did sometimes give me a little bolt of joy at feeling superior, because they liked me more than I liked them. David let me hold him down as I sat on top of him. The snake crept across his chest. He laughed nervously as I pushed him down into the mattress, harder, just to feel him sink into it. I closed my eyes and tried to concentrate on the tiny throb of pleasure that fluttered in my diaphragm, but didn't want to reach its full potential. I placed a hand against David's throat and held him down, squeezed my hand around his larynx. Thought back to the first night when I had been woken by Nero's communication, that pure contact. The words I believed I could discern among the flow. Dear, live. I knew that he was longing for something greater, something bigger. He wanted to thank me for the live prey. He hoped to get more and that I would be his hunting mate. Had I dreamed all this? Had I not lain here all these nights and heard it all? David coughed. He grabbed my wrist and pulled my hand away, pushed himself away from me. With his red face and messy hair, he looked as if he had wandered straight out of a psychiatric facility. I couldn't help but laugh. He coughed. Jesus, Liv, he said. You're fucking insane. Rua. Christiansun, Sunday the 20th of August, 2017. Hey, Rua. Somebody nudges me in the shoulder, shaking me awake. The light between the blinds dazzles me. I turn my head and see Ronya standing over me with a friendly smile, her brown hair tightly pulled back from her heart-shaped face. Just like the wandering heart she is, I think. I feel immediately embarrassed at the idiotic thought. Wandering heart. Jesus. It's time for the morning meeting, she says. I must have spent the night asleep in the staff room. The last thing I remember 
is pouring myself a cup of coffee and sitting down for a five-minute rest. The next moment, an incredible drowsiness came over me and I must have decided to lie down, thinking I'd just close my eyes for a few seconds to rest. And the next thing I know, it's Sunday morning. I sit up. My neck is stiff and painful from sleeping with my head against the sofa's armrest. Thanks for waking me, Ronya. I haven't even prepared for the meeting. I empty the dregs of yesterday's coffee into the sink, refill the water to make a new pot. Ronya leans against the kitchen counter as I start to make the fresh coffee. Have you been here since Friday? she asks. A typical young woman taking the responsible role towards an older male colleague. She probably does the same for her father. Such roles go in cycles. You provide the care during those early years and then move gradually, almost imperceptibly, into being the one who is cared for. If you're permitted to keep your child, that is. You know what? I have. I've become completely engrossed in this case. She nods. I feel the same way. It's like things can't happen fast enough. I dreamed about Eben last night, woke up several times. She smiles to herself as she says this. She's open about her feelings and tries to cover them with a smile, a tried and tested defence mechanism. This girl is the only person in this place who doesn't annoy the shit out of me. She doesn't try too hard. She's simply herself. I know all too well why I've had a soft spot for her all this time, why I've kept an eye on her and wanted her to be OK. It's because she reminds me of kiddo. Of course it is. But she isn't my daughter, and I can't protect her from the world. It's hard not to take your work home with you with a case like this, I admit. Let's hope there's a breakthrough soon. I turn away so she can't meet my gaze, take the coffee pot from the machine and set my cup under it so that it catches the first few drops. Ronya takes a colourful mug from the cabinet. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we solve this case quickly, she says. She's ready for battle. It was once like that for me, too. I would be chomping at the bit to get started. But it's no longer enthusiasm for the job that drives me. That train left long ago. These days, I run on pure rage. But I can't say that to Ronya. Instead, I clink my cup against hers. She checks her phone. It's five past, she says, surprised, then turns and begins to walk ahead of me, down the stairs. I follow after her, close at her heels, hoping that everything is ready for the presentation. I spent almost all of Saturday going through the security footage from the Storkaya shopping centre. Every second from every camera during those central hours, picking out the clips in which we see the mother and daughter disappear, each going in different directions at different times. A simple job, perhaps, but an important one. Ronya carefully opens the door to the team meeting room, Shahid is standing in front of the projector screen, gesticulating. He nods to us as we enter and take our seats beside the window. Behind him, on the screen, are the points we set up at yesterday's morning meeting. More and less probable hypotheses as to what might have happened to Eben Lin. Running away, accident, sudden illness, suicide, kidnapping, murder. Shahid wants to remind us of these possibilities so that we don't lose sight of them in the task that lies ahead. Under suicide is a list of potential reasons a child might take their own life. It happens rarely, but is not an impossibility. Under kidnapping and murder, possible motives are listed. Financial gain, paedophilia, revenge, familial conflicts, conflict among friends. The murder of a child by a friend is also rare, but not an impossibility. Although we hope the search efforts will give us positive results, Shahid says, and we all want to find Eben alive, it's also important that throughout the investigation we keep in mind that the worst may have happened. 
This will make us more open to finding answers and ensure that we're better equipped to handle the situation if the answers don't turn out to be the ones we're hoping for. He likes being up there, in front of everybody. I can see it in the way he lifts his chest towards the ceiling, how he uses an authoritative but pedagogical tone of voice. Even though he's neither particularly tall nor broad-shouldered, he has a natural authority about him. Before we talk about today, I'd like the head of each group to summarise the work that's been done since yesterday. He says, we can start with the group who interviewed members of the immediate family. The Dane gets up and moves to the front of the room. The tall man towers over his far shorter boss, who takes a seat in one of the chairs at the front. My team has interviewed Eben Lin's immediate family, the Dane says. That is, her mother, father, grandparents and aunts on her father's side. The family has informed us that the grandparents on the mother's side are deceased and that there has been no contact between Mariam Lind and her other family for many years. Mariam has been interviewed several times, first on Friday evening and then on Saturday morning. He casts a glance in my direction, apparently still angry about how I got all riled up in the interview I held with Mariam Lin on Friday. While August relates Mariam Lin's statement regarding what happened at the shopping centre on Friday, I take a quick glance around the room at all the other police officers. So many of them have been out trawling the local area, ringing doorbells and searching the streets, parks and car parks. What have I done? I've been sitting, staring at a screen, trying to hide what a bad job I'm doing. They all know that I'm too old to be working on electronic tracing. I have none of the competence that the others in the group have. I've just been stowed away somewhere. In front of me, a colleague has the Tiedenskraft newspaper up on her phone. On the front page is an image of Mariam and Eben Lin, smiling and wearing almost identical yellow sweaters, the last photograph to be taken of Eben before she disappeared. Pale locks of hair frame the face of both mother and daughter. Investigation is stepped up. Who chooses a picture like that when trying to find their missing daughter? It seems calculated, as if Mariam Lind is taking full advantage of the opportunity to showcase herself. Perhaps she thinks it will help bring in more money for her firm. People are weird like that. Wasn't that the company, the one with the CEO whose daughter disappeared? What a tragedy. I have no problem imagining she might be that cynical. In the interviews, we focused on whether Eben had exhibited any unusual behaviour recently. August continues. Signs that something or someone had been bothering her. Signs that might lead us in the direction of what might have happened. None of the adults say they noticed anything out of the ordinary. One of the girls in Eben's class says that at some point earlier in the summer, Eben had said that you can't trust adults, not even those you know, she supposedly said. When the girl asked what she meant, Eben didn't respond, but the girl says that Eben had a strange look on her face. We've noted that the friend remembered this as something unusual, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's of any significance. Shahid nods patiently at the Dane's lengthy report. Thank you, August. Can you tell us your plan going forward? When interviewed, both Tor and Mariam Lin have related that Eben was the result of a rape that occurred here in Kristiansund in 2005, says the Dane. We're going to interview individuals previously sentenced for rape and check out their alibis. It will be especially important to check whether any convicted rapists had been released and were in Kristiansun around the date on which Mariam Lynn claimed she was assaulted. After the Dane, it's Bita's turn to present findings from the inquiries thus far. She stands straight-backed as she speaks, like an actor on stage. We've made inquiries at the Storkaya shopping centre and in the area around Eben's home, 
And we've also collaborated with the tip line. She gives a toss of her head, so her long red plait dances on her shoulder. There are many witnesses from the shopping centre. We've also spoken to witnesses who claim to have seen Eben in the period after she disappeared. The most dependable are two people who say they saw her on Harburg Brinkmannsvai, one of whom says he saw her stop at Myra's Flowers. Shahid puts a map of Christiansen up on the projector on which details pertaining to the case have been marked. It shows a probable route between the Strawkaya shopping centre and Eben's home. There are also uncertain sightings, says Beta. People who didn't know her, who may have thought they remembered something after seeing Eben on TV. We've also had a number of sightings reported in Siriglona and Gormenlona, but we regard the sightings in Hagbarg Brinkmansvai as more probable. They're closer in time and place to the disappearance and supported by other evidence. These observations strengthen the hypothesis that something happened to Eben on her way home to her residence in Siktapunkta, as does the fact that none of the neighbours in Siktapunkta saw Eben around the time she disappeared. It's likely that somebody would have seen her had she made it home. Two neighbours were outside in their gardens around the time in question, and they confirmed that they saw Tor come home, but neither of them saw Eben. Since the comic book was found not too far from the house, we regard it as probable that there was somebody there who stopped her from making it all the way back. Shahid thanks Beta for her presentation. I think that leads us nicely into hearing from the electronic tracing team, he says. When I get up, my legs feel like jelly and my heart is hammering in my chest. But this is no longer visible from the outside. I manage to keep it to myself. Should anyone happen to hear it in my voice, they'll just think I'm nervous about speaking in front of an audience. But inside me, Kiddo's house is ablaze. I often think of those flames burning deep within me. I take over Shahid's computer and bring up the video clip of Eben running out of the supermarket in the Strokaya shopping centre. Video surveillance from Storkaya shows that Eben Lin leaves the supermarket at 15.47 on Friday, I say. As you can see, she's wearing blue jeans, a light pink hoodie and a pair of pink trainers. From the supermarket, she runs out through the first door and turns to the left. This would be the natural route for her to take if she were walking home. At 16.02, we see Mariam Lin come out of the same store with a shopping trolley full of groceries. She looks around for her daughter and then moves quickly out of the same door that Eben just ran through. Mariam, however, turns right towards the car park. She's captured on video again at her car. The footage clearly shows that she's angry throwing bags of shopping into the vehicle before shoving the trolley against the wall in rage. Then she gets into the car and drives off. The car leaves the shopping centre at 16.16. 16. Shahid shifts back to the map again, and I show where Eben walked after leaving the shopping centre, pointing out where she was captured on a webcam at the Spari Bank 1 Savings Bank in Lungavayan. I ask Shahid to switch back to the larger map, which shows Mariam Lin's movements and the places we can assume with reasonable certainty she visited after leaving the shopping centre, all confirmed by credit card payments. A snack bar and two petrol stations, as well as the ferry to Hulsa, where she was also captured by a surveillance camera. In interviews, Mariam has said that she was on her way to Trondheim, she set off in anger, wanting to leave her family. On the way, she changed her mind and turned back. I believe we should search here. I make a circular movement above the map in the area Mariam visited. As I've said before, we cannot rule out the fact that Eben may have been in Mariam's car. Even though they left the shopping centre at different times, 
We cannot be sure that Mariam didn't pick up her daughter later and that something may have happened. The fact that there was conflict between mother and daughter before Eben disappeared is a factor we mustn't overlook in this case. I look over at Shahid, who puts on his stern boss's face. Where are you suggesting that we look along this route, Rua? It's a huge area to search. I believe we have to do the same as we're doing here in Kristiansun. Map out likely places we should search, places where Mariam may have stopped along the way, and places we know that she stopped. Search any areas of forest and bodies of water. I'm starting to stutter, realise that it's becoming difficult to argue for this project. Shahid holds my gaze, gives me an encouraging smile. The mother's movements may warrant following up, Rua. They might be important. There are many possible leads, as you know, but we have no eyewitness sightings of Eben outside the town centre. We've spoken to the employees at the snack bar and petrol stations where Mariam Lynn made purchases. None of them remembers having seen a child. Furthermore, Mariam Lynn has no criminal record and none of the witnesses described her in a way that should give us cause for concern. Even if Mariam did kill her daughter, it's just as likely that the body would have been dumped here in Christiansen. It's a big enough operation searching with divers and helicopters here in the local area, never mind if we're to do the same from here to Halsa. I'm not saying we'll never expand the search, but we're not going to do it right now. Thorough checks using cadaver dogs have also been completed on Mariam's car. This last fact I interpret as a direct reference to my interview with Mariam. Shahid clears his throat. For now, we have to prioritise mapping and following up on eyewitness accounts before we start going out and searching at random. However, it's important that we know where we should focus our search efforts should the investigation move over into the next phase. Something none of us hopes will happen, of course. Next phase. He means if this becomes a murder investigation. It would be great if you could take the lead on that, Rua, if you have the capacity for it, Shahid says. Now, any findings from Torlin's computer? I feel my face flame red. Of course I should have provided proper justification. I was working on the assumption that the mother would be a natural suspect. I clear my throat. The data traffic supports his statement. He spent a lot of time browsing online newspapers and using search engines between 1700 and 2230 on Friday. We've also confirmed that he called the hospital at 1925 and inquired about Mariam and Eben. Anything from Eben's mobile phone? There were no findings of interest on the mobile. She seems to have only ever called her parents on it. She was logged into Facebook, so we've looked at her messages from recent weeks on there, but none of the conversations stand out. A thorough search of her iPad didn't turn up anything of interest either. Good, Shahid says. Then we don't need to spend any more time on that. Thank you, Rua. I look down at the floor as I thank my audience for their attention. Blood rises to my head. I hear the boss asking the crime scene technician to come up to present the total lack of fingerprints on the soaking wet comic book, how it's been sent to the National Criminal Investigation Service for further testing. The whole investigation is made up of hints and missing leads. I can't take any more. I have to get out of here. I close the door to the team room behind me. Wonder how long it will take before somebody figures out that I'm on the surveillance footage from Storkaya. Wonder whether there's any way out. Whether I can jump on a plane, flee to a far-off foreign country and put this whole fucking mess behind me. But it's no use. They'd find me, no matter where I went. It's only a matter of time.
Reptile Memoirs I rested my head on my belly. It was warmer here on this side of my living space than on the other. Should I feel the need to cool down, I would move over to the other side. But for the most part, I lay here. I kept close to the invisible barrier, trying to understand and break through it, but it was no use. This was how the days passed. Outside the window, the sun rose and set. I could slither to the other end and I could slither back again. I could close my pupils so that everything turned dark, sleep a little and open them again. Observe what was going on out there. My brothers and sisters, inside their own glass barriers, lay just as still. I heard the scratching, flapping and scrabbling of animals kept behind bars and doors. I knew how those animals smelled, because I had detected the scent of them on the few occasions I had been permitted to spend time on the other side of this glass. In here, it smelled only of my own excrement. Hunger tore at my body, making me irritable. I kept an especially close eye on the animals out there, as it was a long time since I had last been given food. Animals with feathers, fur and scales. Animals that flew or ran or jumped, with tails dancing after them. I could have eaten them all. I could almost taste the fresh blood in my mouth, even though I had yet to experience it. I yawned, slowly moved my body into a new position, instead resting my head farther down my body, closed my pupils and slept. The same dream as always. A world I had never properly seen, a memory from previous generations that must have been stored in my cells. I lay resting under a bush where the sun wasn't so strong. Insects scuttled around me, and the air tasted of bushes, trees, and living creatures. There was also water close by. I could see the sun's rays glistening on its shining surface. Right then, a movement entered my field of view. A tiny lizard on skinny little legs, toddling across the pebbles, clambering over small stones. I knew at once what I had to do. This was the best thing about instinct. It always knew what to do. I darted forward, following the prey along the ground, over tufted mounds and under roots, and managed to stop it just before it disappeared up along a tree trunk. Just as I was sinking my teeth into the tiny reptile, just as I was about to use all I had learned, all my strength, I woke up. This was how my days passed. Always this dream, and then waking to this frightful, dead room. One day, the cold woman was standing outside the barrier once again, a being that towered high above and controlled the world. I called her the cold woman, because she was cooler than the other live animals I had seen, and because she served cold food. The cold woman was hard. It was she who had put me here. It was she who held me captive, who only ever let me out of this odour-free confinement when buyers came to visit. She who tormented me with all these noisy creatures I couldn't have, who tapped on the glass with their gruesome limbs. Before I met her, I thought life was good. I thought the world had something to offer a hunter like me. Now I knew that I myself was prey. Not for a hungry hunter, but for the human need to imprison and gawk at other creatures. The cold woman opened the hatch above my back. I licked at the air and detected that she had a carcass with her. It smelled of death and cold as usual. A long time had passed since I was last given a meal. My body ached for food, but still I didn't want to eat. This cold carcass was an insult. I wanted to show her that this was no food for a creature like me, that I knew better. But it was no use. All she needed to do was gently shake the carcass and the movement triggered something in me, an internal reflex. Despite my lack of appetite, the intense feeling of never being able to have what I truly wanted, 
I never fought my reflexes. I darted up and snatched the piece of meat. Flesh of this kind filled my stomach, but it gave me no satisfaction. I ate only because my body needed food. It was the same with the lamp. It glowed, providing the warmth on which I depended in order to stay alive, but it gave me no spark, no energy for life. It seemed there was nothing to do but accept this. Acceptance was the only truth my mother had instilled in me, the utmost virtue for creatures like us. The limitations we faced, they simply existed. Trying to fight them or doubting them, it was all wasted energy. Acceptance, on the other hand, cost nothing. The days passed. The sun continued to rise and set outside the window. I had looked out through it a few times, had seen that there were lush plants, that there was a heat outside too. All this made me downcast, here where I was forced to lie beneath the artificial light. The days passed, and soon it was a long time since she had last brought food. Even more time passed, and the hunger ached in me. My lamp hadn't worked in days. It flickered on and off at appalling speed. Without the heat, I felt listless and empty. I lay still in my corner and waited for death to come. I decided to end it all, to stop drinking from the dirty water bowl entirely. If more carcasses appeared, I would not eat them. I would simply lie there and let my life ebb away. The cold woman wouldn't notice a thing until it was too late. I was tired. It took energy to rebel. And so I slept. When I woke again, there was an entire flock of people outside the barrier. They were buyers. That meant that they had come to lift me up, make noise. I licked the air but sensed nothing here inside the glass. I reminded myself that acceptance was a virtue. It would shorten the suffering. This was my life. Successive pain and suffering, and I awaited its end. So when the cold woman grabbed my coil, hard, and pulled me out into the room beyond, I remained calm, licked the air, getting to know the group of individuals that stood around me. Humans smelled of so much other than themselves, of flowers, dead plants and foreign animals. It seemed as if they took on the scents of other animals in order to camouflage their own but they couldn't hide their true odour from me. I licked the air and tasted all the sourness, all the salty bitterness that oozed from their bodies, tiny drops of sweat on their skin, the distant taste of the digestive juices on their breath, other juices from their genitals. Then I was set in the arms of a human female. It was easy to see that this was a female, their sex was something that humans clearly exhibited. She had long, dark hair which danced and smelled of acidulous plants. A more powerful glow emanated from her than from the others. I licked the air and noticed too that the bittersweet taste of her sex was stronger. She felt desire. She took me between her hands and lifted me across to the window permitting me to feel the bright rays of the outside world for the first time in months. My body was renewed at once, enlivened. As I enjoyed this revival, she touched my spine with her ape-like fingers and whispered in her curious language. I didn't understand the meaning of the sounds, but I understood that they were expressed with affection. I didn't like such caresses, but I had seen parrots stroking their heads against each other and cleaning each other's feathers, cats that licked each other's coats. They moved their bodies in a way that testified to contentment. Personally, I felt satisfaction only at good food and warmth. Caresses were for pack animals, those unable to cope alone as individuals. They gave and received caresses as a form of subordination, in order to be able to use each other at will. I understood this. 
as the rays of sunlight from the window brought my body back to life. It was her submission that had given this gift to me, and it could give me more. Live, Orlesund, Saturday the 10th of April, 2004. I was all out of my usual shampoo. I sniffed my way through Egil's many bottles of powerfully scented soaps and hair products, looking in vain for something neutral. I'd just have to smell like a man tonight. Maybe it might even keep the worst of the hunters at bay. The shampoo created a plume of foam that rose and fell around the drain. I wondered what the other girls on my course were doing now, whether they were meeting up beforehand and getting ready, enjoying a glass of wine together before the dinner. Such organised gatherings were only really good for the students who had already found each other. But it was better than staying here. There was a knock at the door. Hello, is there anybody in there? It was a girl's voice. I'm in the shower. I let the water run over my face, into my ears and on down my neck. Hello, can I come in and pee? There's only me here. I turned off the shower, sighed and wrapped a towel around me, stepping out into the tiny patch of floor that remained between the wet towels and dirty clothes, unlocked the door. In came a girl with long, bleached blonde hair and a nose ring, a few years older than the girls Egil usually went for, but other than that, she seemed to be his type. Be quick, I said. Oh, thanks, really, thanks. The girl took several long steps into the room, moving across to the toilet. I'm really sorry, honestly, I wouldn't have disturbed you if I wasn't desperate. But then I thought, well, since it's just us girls here... I dried myself as she peed. I'd never liked the feeling that anyone might see me naked. Didn't even like being naked alone. There was something tragic about it. Something colourless, like a juve without a cover. I waited for her to say something. To give me advice about hair removal or comment on my body in some way. Instead, she flushed and moved across to the sink. Is it OK if I do my makeup too, since I'm here? I shrugged, hung my head and dried my hair with a towel. She took my makeup bag from on top of the washing machine, pulled out an eyeliner and began to line her eyes. You weren't here yesterday, she said. I shook my head, making my tousled, uncombed hair dance. I was busy. Do you have a hairbrush? Mine's in my room. She handed me a white brush and continued the laborious process of applying her eyeliner. Slowly but surely, she began to resemble a cat. Egil says you've stopped hanging out with them. Oh, I know. I tried to brush out the worst of the tangles with hard strokes. Is it true that you have a snake in your room? Lots of things about me are true, I said, dragging the brush through my hair with extra force. A few black strands remained on the white brush. They didn't belong with the blonde ones that were already there. Does snot get stuck on your nose ring? I said. She laughed. One of her front teeth slightly crossed the other. <laughs> All the time. It's more original than a tramp stamp. I'll give you that. Oh, I have one of those too. She pulled up her sweater at her back. Look, right here. I love clichés. They're so fun. Don't you have anything like that? I looked at her, at the tattoo on her lower back, at her nose ring and her crooked front teeth. She wasn't like the other girls who constantly turned up at the apartment door. She seemed cool, different. I did consider getting a tattoo of a snake on my ass, I said, seeing as Egil insists on going around telling people that I have a python in my room. She clapped a hand over her mouth. You're kidding. So it's just something he's made up. She began to laugh loudly, clutching her chest. <laughs> oh, you've made my day. Liv, that's your name, isn't it? She took my hand. I'm Anita. What are you doing tonight? I'm going to dinner with the people from my nursing studies course. She laughed. 
Sounds like great fun. I shook my head. She put her face right up against the mirror and wiped away some mascara that had ended up on her cheek. I'm going out with some friends from my course too, from the art school. I reckon we'll go to Lilla. She rouged her cheeks with quick brush strokes. I occasionally went down to Lilla Leuvenvall on Fridays to drink cheap wine. It wasn't like the Smutula pub where I usually went with Ingvar and Egil. Lilla Leuvenvall was a more decent kind of place, cleaner. True, an atmosphere of drunkenness pervaded there too. Once it started to get late, after midnight, all the bars in Orlesund were exactly the same. But there was something different about Lilla Leuvenvall. The crowd was different. Are you an artist? Like, a painter? She nodded. I paint, mostly, yeah. And not just my face, either. She laughed and met my gaze in the mirror. Of course, my body is a work of art too, but I mainly paint on canvas. I realised she was making fun of herself. There was something that cut through her laughter, a sort of stutter. Her eyes met mine in the mirror. By the way, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but you have such interesting eyes. You'd make a good model for a painting. I looked down at the chaos of towels and other clutter on the floor, felt my cheeks turn hot. I hope that wasn't a rude thing to say, she said. Interesting eyes. What did she mean by that? For some reason it felt more forward than if she'd just commented on my body. No, I managed to say. Just a bit weird. Well, I'll leave you in peace, she said. Then she packed up her makeup bag, leapt over the dirty laundry basket and opened the door. If you get tired of the nurses, just drop by Lilla. Then she disappeared into the hall. I dressed quickly, surprised to feel that I was warm all over as if slightly feverish. I heard Egil's agitated voice coming from the kitchen. I followed the sound and saw him pacing back and forth across the tiny kitchen floor, his phone pressed to his ear. The voice on the other end sounded flat, emotionless. Do you know what you are? Egil said. You are a sea cucumber. You have no feelings for others. You're nothing but a blob. The voice on the other end of the line continued, unchanged, like that of a strict headmaster. Nobody likes you. No wonder Mama left you. Suddenly he turned, saw that I was standing there. The look he gave me was so hard that I immediately backed out into the hall again. My heart was pounding. I peeked through the open doorway to Ingvar's room. So, there you are, Ingvar said. There was a tension in his voice. I entered the room where the blind was pulled down so that no more than a few strips of sunlight made their way in around it. Ingvar lay on the bed with a book. I sat down beside his feet. I was just reading about you, Ingvar smirked. On the book's cover was a portrait of a man with a long chin and nose, wearing a headdress of green leaves. Dante Alighieri, the Divine Comedy. You're such a nerd, Ingvar. Listen. Ingvar began to read from the book. It was a verse that described two creatures, a man and a snake, that were turned into each other. The poem described the entire process, how the man's legs became entwined and his tongue split, while the opposite happened to the snake, how the snake grew hair and ears, while the man's skin turned hard. In the end, the man who had become a snake disappeared, hissing along the ground, while the snake, who was now a man, stayed standing. That's exactly what's happening to you, Ingvar laughed. You're turning into that snake. For all I know, it's already you lying back there in your room and Nero, who walks here among us. I shook my head, moved towards the door. You're leaving? See you in the next life, Ingvar, I said. Then I left. Mariam Christiansun, Monday the 21st of August, 2017 The light seeps in through the cracks around the curtains. 
a treacherously faint blaze that exposes everything I can't bear to think about. That day has arrived, that the world exists, and that I myself exist within it. Pulling the covers over your head is always futile. The head knows that the day exists. The head knows that it's still late summer outside, that today is the first day of school. The head doesn't forget her breath coming in little puffs when she was a tiny baby, her voice when it said Mama for the first time, or the feeling of standing before the mirror with her and pointing. The head insists on remembering how it was to kiss those little feet, to point to each toe and tickle them, the little lips that puckered as she slept, her forehead wrinkled by unknown dreams. The head knows it is guilty of destruction. There's a knock at the door. Tor comes in with a tense expression on his face. He's wearing one of his finest blue shirts with the silver stitching, the top button undone. It complements his eyes and his grey-blonde hair so well. In his hands he carries a plate and a glass of milk. Have you eaten? He puts the glass and plate on the nightstand, frowning when I shake my head. More than 200 people have signed up to take part in the search today. The entire school is going to join in. School isn't going to start without Eben. He doesn't look at me as he speaks, has a distant look in his eyes as he gazes up at the wall somewhere, at the family photographs that hang there. He isn't going to ask me to join them, and nor am I going to say anything. It must cost him a lot to be here in the same room as me, and to keep speaking to me after what I've done. And yet he's still his usual, patient, caring self. I always feel that his care for me should tell me something about how I should be towards him, that he's trying to teach me something, but failing. I sit up take the glass and drink small sips of milk out of sheer gratitude, pass my hand across the bedding with its pattern of spring flowers. Then he goes. I squeeze my eyes shut and try to pretend that I don't exist. Small flashes of memory, of a little girl's laughter, burning my ears. I see her over and over in the minutes before she disappeared, with her head bowed and that ridiculous comic book in her hand, moving away from me. The magazine they found. Her, they're still looking for. As if an eleven-year-old girl could simply get lost on the streets of the town centre or in the hundred-metre-wide forest opposite the house. She's sensible. She knows exactly where she lives. If she'd had any problems, she would have asked an adult for help or gone straight home. Almost two days have passed. Someone has taken her. No other explanation makes sense. If they find her out there today, no matter where they might look, she'll be dead. A memory from spring returns to me. I was sitting in the armchair in the living room, having just got home from work. I was waiting for Tor and Eben to get home. No, that's wrong. I wasn't waiting. I was pulling myself together. Preparing myself for my family's return. I could tell from the sound of the door opening that it was Eben who had made it home first. Her cautious nature sent vibrations through the house, as if from a frightened sparrow. She was on her way into the living room, probably to watch TV, but when she saw me she stopped in the doorway. I saw how guilt-ridden she looked how she didn't want to meet my gaze. A kind of irritation came over me, completely irrational. I felt mean. My body wanted to be unreasonable. How did the English test go, Eben? I stared straight at her, waiting. It went OK, she mumbled. I knew she was lying, so I pressed her. You'd done enough practice, hadn't you? You remember what you said to me yesterday, that you'd done enough practice so you could play instead? Yes, I practised enough. Her entire body showed that she was lying, and I... I took a mocking tone with her. I said, Wonderful, then I'm looking forward to seeing your results. I didn't stop there. 
Later, when the three of us were eating dinner, I said to Tor, Eben says she did so well on her English test today. Tor never picks up on my mean jokes. He'd smiled proudly at Eben and said, That's great, Eben. You see, it pays off when you do the work, right? Right there is where I know I hit Eben's conscience the hardest. Tor's pride in her. But I didn't stop there, either. Later that evening, when Eben had got into bed, I went into her room and said, I'm so proud of you, Eben, working so hard at school. Papa is so proud of you, too. He's just bursting with pride. Then I kissed her on the head and said good night. When I think about this, my stomach aches. But still, I wasn't done with my game. In the morning, when I saw her at breakfast, I spoke English to her, asked her whether she would like bread, butter, cheese. Then I asked her about other things, using words I knew she didn't understand. She hung her head and answered yes to every question I put to her. How often have I treated her like this? It isn't really even I want to torment in this way. It's the idea of a child. All the things I'm afraid that she'll become. I get lost in the dark place she came from, about which she's entirely innocent. Maybe she really has run away after all. I open my eyes, force the thought out of my head and get up. The cold floor against my feet feels deserved. My legs are heavy, my entire body stiff. The house will be empty now. Tor is out searching for Eben, who by now might be just a cold body lying out in the woods somewhere. Images I do not wish to see constantly appear in my head. Her skin is grey, cold and damaged, her hair dark with blood. I don't want to think about it. The wardrobe is open, so I can see all my beautiful suits hanging neatly next to each other. It gives me a certain sense of calm to buy nice clothes, something I can put on and show the world that I'm a woman who has style. The garments and shoes automatically make me stand taller, lift my head. They give me confidence when I'm about to enter an important negotiation at work. Clothes are far more than just clothes. They're control. At least, that's what these clothes are. I pull the wardrobe door closed, and see myself in the mirror on the front of it, standing barefoot in worn-out pyjamas, blonde hair dishevelled because I've been tossing and turning all night. I turn away and leave the room. I stop for a moment, before the capital letters on Eben's door, knock before you enter. It's years since she wrote this message. It hangs there as both a souvenir and a warning. The rule has long since been violated by forensic technicians in white suits with tiny brushes and swabs in their hands. I set the flat of my hand against the sign, push open the door and peer into the tiny yellow room. A chest of drawers with flowers painted on it. Walls covered with posters of horses. Pink bedding. In just a few years it will look completely different all stripped down and teenage, with pictures of boys on the walls. I've been looking forward to watching her grow up. The desk is overflowing with sheets of paper, stationery and toys. Whenever I ask her to tidy up, she only ever tidies things off the floor. I start to lift the pieces of paper, going through them. I'm suddenly afraid to find one of those drawings you hear about, of something grown up that's frightened her. Remind myself that the police would have taken anything like that. The drawings on the desk all feature safe motifs. Princesses, horses, dogs. On the wall hangs another drawing, sketched by an artist at a fairground. I remember that day so well. We took Eben on a roller coaster for the first time. Tor hit a bullseye and won one of the biggest teddy bears for her, that might be the happiest day we've ever spent together as a family. To top it off, we visited the booth where you could have your portrait done. We're drawn together as a family, sitting on thrones in a castle. The king and queen with the little princess on her father's lap. 
extravagant costumes with padded shoulders and narrow waists, beautiful and pure faces, smile upon smile upon smile. A happy family. I creep into her bed, pull the duvet over me and inhale her smell. Again, I'm struck by memories of a little girl, newborn, two months, a year, her first milk tooth, riding around on a tricycle in the rear courtyard of the building in which we lived, petting the neighbour's cat, trips to the beach with sunscreen and inflatable armbands, ice skating, jumping on a trampoline, eating lemon for the first time, sitting on Papa's shoulders as she moves through a crowd towering high above everyone else, her first day at school, running with friends in the playground, learning to ride a bicycle and to swim. My little girl. I pick up my phone, flick through old photos. Eben unsteadily riding her bike with stabilisers. A video from a school play in which she's dancing, looking shyly down at the floor. I watch it several times. Find a photograph in which she's two years old and eating porridge for all she's worth. She was so happy back then. Used to shout, Hello, 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 with rippling laughter. The police have Eben's mobile phone and iPad. Perhaps they'll find conversations she's had on Facebook with a grown man she doesn't know. They're out there looking for her. Something crawls through my veins at the thought. When I close my eyes, I try to see everything in black, only the black to disappear into it. But the head wants to remember. A little girl sticking her small chubby hands into the sand. A six-year-old with a new rucksack and new shoes. I open my eyes. See the empty chair where Eben has sat so many times with her head bent over her homework, her blonde hair in a braid at her neck, her hair so thin between my fingers that it's almost weightless. I can lie under the duvet and try to forget all this, but my head knows that they're out there searching. My head knows that her hair is out there somewhere. I get up. Go across to the bookshelf full of books for young girls. Trail my fingers across the pastel-coloured spines. A dedicated shelf full of boxes. A jewellery box, an old cigar box, a bowl full of beads. I start to open the boxes one by one. Look at the tiny pieces of gold jewellery she was given as christening gifts. The clip-on earrings she wore when they had a carnival at school. The largest box has... My Secrets, written on it. It shines there on the shelf. Young girls must be allowed to have secrets. I seem to remember reading in some advice column or other. But now I can't help but open it. In the box is a hundred kroner note, a plastic toy horse, and a gold chain with something on the end of it. I rummage around to pull it out, hold it up to the light, on the end of the chain is a key, a simple key, of the kind that might belong to any door, in any house. The only thing that sets it apart from other keys is that, like the chain, it's plated in a colour reminiscent of gold. Live, Orlesund, Saturday the 10th of April, 2004. Lilla Löwenvoll was already jam-packed with people, but that doesn't take much. The tiny amount of floor space on the ground floor was hardly enough for a counter and a queue at the bar. I stood on tiptoe, looking between all the heads for a blonde girl with a nose ring, then forced my way through the queue to the black spiral staircase up to the first floor. Disco lights surged across the black painted walls. At the tables, people were sitting and talking, trying to make their conversations heard above the loud techno music. It was too early for anyone to be dancing. For now, shouted conversations were the favoured activity, the buzz of vocal cords that screeched and rasped beneath glittering necklaces and shirt collars. I had no idea what she was wearing, 
didn't even know whether she had actually ended up coming here. After the student dinner, I had been left standing alone outside the restaurant as the others went their own way. I'd had too much to drink and too quickly. My usual clownish antics had emerged. The others had listened. They had laughed and seemed interested, but not in a good way. They had been interested in me in the way that children might be interested in pulling the legs off a spider. So as I stood there by myself outside the restaurant... The only thing I could think about was something the girl had said. Anita, the girl with the nose ring and the one front tooth that crossed the other. Not that I had interesting eyes, although that too was something I'd given a lot of thought over the course of the evening. She had said I should drop by Lilla. Why not? I'd thought. It was surely better than going home and locking myself in my room. But now that I was here, I was no longer so sure... It was probably the kind of thing you just said, dropped by Lilla. It didn't necessarily mean that she'd actually be happy to see me here. She was probably with her artsy friends. Maybe she'd turn out to be just like the others, to have a scornful note in her laugh, a false friendliness. I stood there, looking out across the first floor of the bar in vain. None of the girls looked like Anita. When someone finally shoved past me to come up the stairs, I turned and went back down. A last possibility was the rear courtyard, almost as big as the bar itself and far busier than the first floor. I pushed past smoking bodies, moving out into the cool spring night, tried to shut out the droning of the voices and look for Anita's blonde head. I felt tired. The alcohol was relinquishing its grasp, leaving me shaky, I may as well just give up. I pushed past the queue at the bar one more time and emerged on the other side. This had been a stupid idea. For a moment, I stood out on the street, the Art Nouveau buildings all around me, frozen there, just as I had been outside the restaurant, until I realised that there was nothing to do but go home. But just as I turned to look down the street to start the long walk back to the apartment... I heard a male voice calling my name. He drew out the I, live, like a long howl. I glanced up and down the street, but nobody seemed to be looking in my direction. Then he called out again, a long howling, live. And I realised that it was coming from above. There, from a window in the apartment above the florists, a man's head peered out. David waved. I crossed the street and stood directly below him. I could now hear other sounds from in there too. Rap music and the hollering and jeering of several voices. David stretched out his arm, his hand holding a cigarette. He stuck out his tongue a little and tapped off some ash. It seemed as if he were trying to hit me with it. I grinned. What are you doing? Waiting for you to come up. Are you coming? I pulled off my boots and set them against the wall along with a dozen other pairs of shoes. Took the beer David held out to me and followed him in the direction of the rap music. Loud cries and laughter. Down a hallway in which everything seemed to be from the 70s. The carpet was a pattern of red and yellow. The wallpaper striped yellow and brown. There was even an old telephone table in light brown wood with a built-in seat. An unease swelled within me when I looked down into the swirling pattern on its cushion. We turned into the living room and I saw what people had been shouting and whooping about. On the table in front of the brown striped sofa, a man lay on his stomach. His wrists and ankles were bound behind his back with gaffer tape. He turned his head and took a sip of a drink through a straw. Another fed a cigarette to his lips. Piles of curled gaffer tape also lay on the floor. I looked at David, who was now standing back beside the window. He lost at poker, he said. It was one of those apartments that it was almost impossible to see into. It had a view facing the street, but was too high up and too far from the nearest buildings for anyone to see inside. I'm not sure why I noticed this, or why it bothered me. Yes, I did know, in fact. 
It was something about the people and the atmosphere in there. The exhausted faces, the voices of a couple of them. This was no party. It was a drug den. David sat down on a poof and drew closer to the chair in which I was sitting. He had lit another cigarette and slowly blew the smoke towards the ceiling. He seemed drunk or high or both. I took a cigarette from the packet he held out to me. Welcome to my humble home. What do you think? I laughed. It looks like an old man's apartment. He looked around him at the furniture and curtains. Only the TV and speakers were new. Everything else looked as if it were older than me. David chinked his beer against mine. Now it's about time you told me something about yourself. I laughed again. <laughs> like what? Tell me something exciting. Some trauma from your childhood, something like that. I cursed my heart. Could Ingvar or Egil have told him something? No, I trusted them more than that. You're the last person I want to tell something exciting to, David. How come? I don't trust criminals. David laughed and lifted an index finger. My girl, you don't get how it works. It's precisely the criminals like me you can trust. Criminals don't blab. We have too many skeletons in our own closets. He was sitting closer to me than I would have liked, probably wanted to find out whether what he'd managed to get last time was on the cards this time too, and I had to show him that it wasn't. That's what was so difficult about this guy. I always had to be on my guard, but I refused to give in to that feeling of having to be vigilant all the time. I have one important thing to tell you about myself, I said, lifting an index finger just as he had lifted his. I'm not your girl. He smiled, leaned forward slightly and passed his hand over his skull, shaved so closely that it almost shone. My body flinched as he came near, reminding me of the last time we'd seen each other. Such memories always felt wrong to me, as if something were cutting into my body from my belly and upwards. Then he closed his eyes and inhaled through his nose, taking a long drag of the air. You smell good, he said. Men's aftershave, I said. I'll ask Egil to give you the name of it. He laughed. You really are a mouthy one, aren't you? People tell me it's my best feature. Oh, I can think of another feature or two. Go suck a clit, I said. I got up and staggered away from David's laughter towards the hall, found the bathroom and went inside. Sat on the toilet and counted one hundred, slowly. Then I got up, went across to the sink and rinsed my face with cold water. I didn't know why I felt so bad. That was a lie. I did know. For some reason or other, she had noticed me. And now I'd never see her again. I pulled my sweater up to my face to dry it and immediately noticed that something felt different. Something was missing. I looked in the mirror, touched the base of my throat, looking for the smooth chain, but my fingers found nothing but bare skin. The key! It was gone! I had taken it off when I'd showered and forgotten to put it on again. I thought of how eagerly Egil had clawed after the gold chain on my birthday. If he found it tonight, he would undoubtedly use it. I had to get back there. Mariam Christiansen Monday the 21st of August, 2017 the rainwater hits the windshield and trickles in small streams along the glass. The wipers squeak intermittently. They're on the second setting, a little too fast for the amount of rain, but the first setting is too slow. It seems as if the rain is like this far too often, just this exact amount. I put my foot to the floor through the sharp bends in the road. The forest becomes a blurred mass of green. The bills on the dashboard sail back and forth with each turn. I take a chance and overtake an old wreck, even though we're close to a bend, accelerating so I'm past it in an instant. 
The road is almost free of cars. It's a Monday afternoon. Just the odd lorry or tractor on its way somewhere. I drive across the roundabout and over the bridge, winding down the window to feel the fresh summer rain on my face. I have to drive, have to keep moving. Can no longer stand to lie there, following the train of my thoughts, that muddled collection of memories, becoming a mother for the first time, the first smile, the first step, the first tooth. I'd rather follow the road, let it challenge me, throw my body into the next corner, watch the rain change direction and the pile of bills fly across the dashboard yet again. If only I could drive even faster, turn even more sharply. If only the car could be the weapon with which I made an incision in time. On this side of the cut, my daughter is gone. On the other... Maybe there's something else. You don't leave town when your daughter is missing. You don't leave a note asking your husband not to say anything to the police, to wait, that he has to trust you, only to leave it all behind. Of course I get that. And yet that's exactly what I've done. The phone containing all the photographs of my daughter the video from the school play, I left it lying there on the kitchen table with the note. Tor won't like that. Maybe he'll call the police right away. If they want to come looking for me, they'll find me. They can do as they please. The only thing I want, the only thing I can cope with, is to keep moving, turning into the bends and out of them, feeling the car's power in my body, and the sense that at any moment I might accelerate too hard. Underestimate a corner. Make another mistake. This is what I want. To keep making mistakes until there are none left to make. When I don't know how to release these knots in my body, when they pull tighter and tighter with every attempt to loosen them, I'd rather destroy them. I want to break through and tear them to pieces, to turn and then float across another bridge and into a tunnel that is a single long, gentle curve straight to hell and out the other side. The sheep grazing in the fields are small clouds that vanish. I am constantly in motion. Marinas, boathouses, a dilapidated house atop a hill, black on the inside, just like me. The weather has begun to lift but my head is still dense with fog. I break and drive the last few kilometres into Molda Ferry Terminal more calmly, signal to turn in and stop at the back of the rows of cars with their rumbling engines, standing there waiting for the ferry. In the rear window of the car in front lies a pale yellow teddy bear, and behind the teddy bear a small child strapped tightly into a car seat. The driver is a woman, her elbow half out of the window, brown hair fluttering in the wind. There's somebody sitting in the passenger seat too. I guess it must be the father. I was so angry at Eben when she was small. Didn't feel I had the family idyll that everyone else seemed to have. I thought she had destroyed my life. But I managed to do that all on my own. I don't think Tor will have called the police just yet. Now that I've asked him to trust me, he'll try to do so. He'll wait for me to contact him. Will perhaps set himself a deadline. He's good like that. Always going the extra mile for me. But do I want to be wrong? Do I want him not to trust me this time, to call the police so they can stop me? There's more than just one answer, more than just a single question. We start to slowly drive aboard across the asphalt and the metal ramp, into the ferry's dark mouth. A man points to a vacant space for me. As the ferry moves off, it hits me that I haven't been on the other side of this fjord in almost twelve years. I'm almost about to faint by the time the ticket seller comes to the window and I pay for my ticket and forget to take the receipt. Sit and stare into the hard metal as the boat carries me across. There's still more than an hour's drive to go, the winding road across the mountains that will take me home again. I signal to the right and slow down, 
feel a heat in my diaphragm as I turn onto the road, driving up past the other houses with their swing sets and washing lines, not unlike my own neighbourhood, if a little more rural. Larger gardens and closer to the sea, where there's a better view. As I drive up the hill, the pile of bills on the dashboard finally lands on the floor. It feels like a relief. I park at the side of the road. Only around this house does the grass grow tall and the car outside is missing its tyres and windshield. All kinds of junk are scattered about the yard. A spade without a handle, a dirty rag of a thing that looks like an old tent. I leave my leather handbag in the car, along with the rest of my proper family life, which has already begun to come apart at the seams. Get out of the car and walk across to the front door. Knock. Those who knock have different intentions from those who use the doorbell. Or at least that's how it was twelve years ago, and the same is probably true now. Some dogs are barking and running around inside. Carol scolds them as she makes her way towards the door. I can hear her voice, loud and clear. She looks through the peephole, opens three locks and sticks out her head of curly hair. It's longer now, slightly grey at the temples. She tells off the big Weimarana that is trying to work its way loose from the grip she has on its collar. The dog snarls and shows its teeth. When she sees me, Carol beams. I have to see him, I say. She laughs, loud and shrill. Not even a hello for an old friend. I see you haven't lost your rudeness. She chuckles, rolling her American R's. We walk down the narrow corridor between old family photos, the dogs running around us. The baby pictures of her son have been hanging on the walls for years, always the same. Her husband is dead. Her son must have reached adulthood long ago. At the innermost door, Carol pulls out a bunch of keys and unlocks it. She shoes the dogs away as I walk ahead of her. The room is full of cages. There is singing, running, striking at the bars. A parrot begins to fly around its cage, squawking various terms of abuse. Now, now, Bella, Carol says, going across to the parrot. It calms down as soon as she begins to speak to it. Carol turns to face me. I almost sold them once. Somebody made me a good offer a few years back, but I couldn't do that to you. I always believed you'd come back. Carol moves to the door between the cages, pulls the bunch of keys from the pocket of her large trousers again. It jangles between her thick fingers with their stubby nails. She unlocks the door. I'll leave you be, she says, but you have to come drink a glass of wine with me afterwards. She nods towards the door and goes. I place a trembling hand on the door handle. Take a breath. He's lying on the bed, his body in an arc that stretches from the head end to the bottom. The uppermost part of his body rests on the nightstand. He's detected that I'm in the room. He seeks me out. His body glides, its pattern undulating across the brown skin, all the way from the tip of his tail to his head. It's like a prism of dark brown, black and yellow. I sit down on the bed beside him, wait for him to gather himself around me, to seek out the heat of my body and embrace me, just like in the old days. Liv, Orlesund, Saturday the 10th of April, 2004. When the taxi I got from David's pulled up in front of the house, there was loud music coming from our floor. Even the deaf old landlady must be bothered by noise of this volume. A light was on in one of the windows on the ground floor, so she was probably awake as usual. She'd stopped trying to get us to be quiet long ago. Wait here. I said, I have cash inside. Before the driver could protest, I jumped out of the car, hurried down the stairs and opened the door. The hallway was full of shoes and human voices. People standing outside the bathroom door, waiting their turn. It wouldn't be free for ages. 
If the key was no longer in there, I didn't intend to wait in a queue to find out. I could hear howling and somebody laughing in the living room. Managed to pull off my boots and hurry towards the door to my room. Suddenly felt a jolt when I pushed down the door handle and the door opened. I went in. Was sure that I'd put Nero in his terrarium before I locked the room earlier that day. Now it was empty. Nor was he under the duvet or under the bed or the chest of drawers. He wasn't hanging from the curtain rail, hadn't climbed up into the high plant or onto the lamp he used to get up there. He wasn't in the room. I checked to see whether the key was in the door, but that wasn't there either. Shaking, I pushed my way between the people who were standing in the corridor outside. Towards the laughter and the voices in the living room, the high-pitched squealing that was coming from there. As calmly as I could, I stepped over a girl who had decided to sit in the middle of the hall to take a phone call. I forced my way past a gang of people in the doorway. Then I stopped. The living room was packed. On the sofa sat a group of girls with big hair, short skirts and rosy cheeks. They were the ones who were squealing, and they didn't show any signs of stopping. They whined in rotation, the squeals of one replaced by those of another. On the table, towards which all faces were turned, stood Egil. He had his back to me. From his right hand hung Nero. The snake was clearly stressed, hissing at the girls on the sofa. I thought I could feel the anger burning in his veins. Egil swayed keeping his arm outstretched, and without warning jerked forward as if he were about to throw the snake. The girls squealed yet again. It was incredible that no glasses were broken. Egil swayed again. He must be really drunk. He jerked forward yet again, this time towards a girl who was sitting in the armchair. The girl let out a scream and spilled beer all over herself. Egil took a step back. Stood still for a moment and took a deep breath. Then he turned around and threw the snake. Nero flew through the air and landed on some guy's face. The guy flung himself backwards so that Nero fell down onto the carpet. I lunged through the crowd, grabbed the snake, which hissed with rage and lashed out at me. I only just managed to grab him around the neck and stop him from biting me in the shoulder. What the fuck are you doing, Agil? Agil looked towards me, his face still full of laughter. You do that again, and I'll kick you in the balls, I said. Nero hissed and tried to bite me in the face, but I held him. Had to get back to my room with him. Give me the key, Agil. Agil turned serious and sat down on the edge of the table. Only now did I see that there were several ashtrays on the floor, the ash now trodden into the carpet. Agil was red in the face. He swayed, then pulled himself together. I don't have your key. The door was open. You're lying. I haven't taken any key, Egil mumbled and lost his balance. He groped around in midair, then landed on the floor. I turned and walked back out into the hall. People thronged around me. Just then, I heard a voice. I heard it through the loud music despite the stress of having to hold Nero and avoid being bitten, despite the raging words I heard in his hiss, I would have known that voice anywhere. It was coming from Ingvar's room. I took long strides towards the sound. Everyone who stood in my path stepped aside. It was coming from in there. He was talking to Ingvar. I stopped in the doorway. His icy blue eyes met mine and it felt as if crushed glass ran through my veins. The sweaty fringe, the face full of pimples he always used to pick at with his fingers. His smile was stiff in the way that always made me nauseous because it awoke so many memories in me. Long time no see, Patrick said. The scent of him didn't need to reach me. I knew how he smelled. I looked at Ingvar who immediately lowered his gaze to the floor. I trusted you, I whispered. Rua, Christiansun, Monday the 21st of August, 2017.
It's already late in the evening by the time I leave the police station. I carry my wide bag under my arm, close to my body, taking long strides up the hill. It's a short walk home and the summer evening is light, but inside me burns a dark flame. I'm wittingly and willfully putting the brakes on the entire investigation. I know that I'm doing it, sneaking around in silence like a thief. Luckily, the stairwell is quiet when I let myself into my apartment building. I don't like bumping into my neighbours, don't like that they see my face and recognise me, that they say hello. On one of the first days after I moved into the building, the doorbell rang. It was a neighbour who had heard that someone had moved in and she wanted to come and introduce herself. She was in her fifties, wearing a light dress with pockets on the front, which was a little baggy across her chest. When I told her I was a police officer, she began to tell me about how her nephew had fallen victim to a swindler on the internet and lost huge sums of money and that the police had dropped the case. That's the sort of thing people do when they meet me for the first time. They see an opportunity to get help from within the system. From the moment they learn of my profession, they shed their skins and become vultures. I mumbled something about a lack of resources, then lied and said I was just in the middle of dinner, that I needed to get back inside. On the times I've encountered her since then, I've looked away, walked faster. I once harboured an idiotic dream of finding a new family in Christiansund, of starting again. A truly idiotic dream. Any woman with even a hint of emotional intelligence can tell there's something wrong with me from miles away. And if they can't, I manage to scare them off anyway sooner or later. It's dark in my apartment. The windows are at ground level and I don't like the fact that strangers can peek in, so I always keep the curtains closed. I shrug off my jacket and hang it up. There's only one jacket on the hook, only one pair of shoes. It becomes ever easier to be me, yet ever harder. I shove my feet into my slippers, try to think that I now have some time off, that the stress of the day can be released from my body. But I can't remember what it was like not to feel tense all the time. I go into the living room, simply furnished with a TV, a coffee table and an old second-hand sofa I bought for a hundred kroner, which smells as if someone has died on it. I clear away the dirty cups and plates, find a cloth from the kitchen and wipe the table before I fetch a roll of plastic wrap. Start to wind it around the tabletop in long strips. Soon the entire table is covered. Then I go back to the kitchen and take a light beer from the fridge. On the table before me are two Ziploc bags. In the first is a turquoise glitter pen and a notebook taken from the Lynn house. In the other is a piece of cardboard cut from the cover of a photo album. I've already got all there is to get from the album. Images of the fingerprints are in a separate plastic folder along with some other documents. Nobody at the station knows about this project and nor am I going to tell anyone there about it. In matters regarding Mariam Lynn, I crossed the boundaries of normal work ethics long ago. I open my briefcase and take out the bag of equipment I've borrowed from the laboratory. The forensic technicians always take so long to leave before the weekend. They stood there in the lab completing various tasks until late in the evening, so I had to wait until today to take what I needed. The field fingerprint kit for use at crime scenes, with a rabbit hair brush and black and white dusting powder. I've also borrowed a magnifying glass and a decent flashlight. I take a good swig of the beer before pulling on a pair of plastic gloves. Lay out the equipment on the table. She's held the pen between her thumb and index finger, so I start with that. I take the brush and choose the white powder. Bend over the tabletop and dip the brush in the jar, carefully shaking off the excess. The powder has a slight shimmer, like white sand. I set the magnifying glass over the pen and lightly tap the powder onto it. Turn the pen and brush it some more. 
repeat the process until I think I can see some ridges starting to take shape. At the pen's tip, I think a fingerprint is beginning to appear. It might be my own. I work the brush with care, applying several light coats. I can almost hear Mariam Lynn's trembling voice when I asked her where she went after Eben disappeared. Even the voice of the devil can tremble. I know what I'm going to find. I just want to be sure. I apply several more coats of powder to the fingerprint and see it become clearer, more visible. Then I take a plastic strip and carefully cut out a piece I can use. Rub the glue side of the strip against the fingerprint with even strokes before I lift it off and press it down against the ink plate. I'm left with a little fingerprint. It looks like the middle of a finger. It might be too small for identification on its own, but it might be of help if I find more on the notebook. I set the brush and white powder aside, take out the notebook, the box of black powder and the other brush. When I open the box, powder flows out over my fingers. Like the white powder, it's finer than ash and difficult to control. I dip the brush into it, then repeat the painstaking process by brushing the paper. The paper is high quality. Far easier to obtain fingerprints from this than cheap note paper. I find many fingerprints, and several of them will be mine. But I have plenty of time. The black powder is much easier to see with the naked eye. I find the photographs of the fingerprints from the photo album. Study the new prints under the magnifying glass in the light of the flashlight and compare them. I take a swig of beer. They're only partial prints. My methods are reprehensible. But now even the slightest hint of doubt is gone. The prints are identical. It's her. As soon as I've gathered my wits, I get up and walk out into the hallway. I think of Eben, the beautiful blonde-haired little girl, the way she looked when she came running out of the shopping centre. I open the door to my bedroom and turn on the ceiling light of a dark, unpleasant place. The blinds are always drawn. I hardly know what the view from here looks like. I can no longer sleep in here. The darkness is too heavy for that. And I can't let in the light for fear that someone will see the photographs that fill my wall. Hundreds of photographs, collected over the past few months, cover the wall from floor to ceiling. Old and new images, young people drinking and partying, dancing, smoking, their eyes red from the flash as they look towards the camera. A young girl with dark hair holding a snake, smiling at the person taking the picture. In the new images, she's older. Her hair is blonde and shorter. In the newspaper clipping from Tiedens Krav, she smiles in her neatly pressed shirt, pearl earrings in her ears. She looks like someone else. In the other photographs, she's generally looking away. They're taken from a distance, from behind a bush or a corner, speaking on the phone or on her way somewhere at top speed. I've taken the newer photographs on my mobile and printed them out. Times have changed. This room also testifies to that. I had an opportunity to speak to Eben one morning in July. Had driven around their neighbourhood many times to see if I could find anyone from the family. In the end, she came walking along, alone. I rolled down the window and asked whether she was Mariam Lynn's daughter, said I was her mother's friend. After that first meeting, I hadn't seen her again. Not until Friday, when I had gone out to buy a shirt at Strawkaya before going to that cursed birthday party. Something quivers within me. It always does when I'm in here. It's like staring straight into a hole in time. I open the door to the wardrobe, where the knife is in place in the tie drawer, I haven't owned a tie since the 90s, so the drawer contains nothing but the knife. I take it out, test the edge of the blade against my nail. It's been recently wetted, so it's at its sharpest. 
I put the knife back in the drawer and closed the wardrobe door. Stare into the mirror on the front of it, opening my eyes as wide as possible so that I can see myself. How crazy I am. Rua, the raging, the furious. Then I open the other wardrobe. Hi, Eben, I say. Eben doesn't answer. She doesn't move an inch. But her eyes meet mine in silence. Reptile Memoirs Those first small twists across the floor of my new home were eager. I quickly perceived that I was somewhere inside and began looking for a way out. Slithered alongside walls and under furniture, licking the air for the taste of rain and leaves. But I found only dead wood and dust, materials made by humans. The only living thing in the room, apart from me and the warm woman, was a plant, and even that was trapped. I had only just managed to figure out that I had been moved to a slightly larger prison when she threw herself over me. She lifted me up, turned her body from vertical to horizontal, and lay down flat beside me, so that all parts of her body were at the same level, like mine. When she lay this way, she immediately looked much smaller. I realised that the size of these animals was only a form of camouflage. They protect themselves by attempting to appear much bigger than they really are. With her apish hands, she clawed at me, everywhere, wanting to squeeze me against her body. For us to lie pressed together, as if we were two members of the same species. I tried to bite her, but her naked ape hands held my head. Even hissing seemed not to scare this human. Eventually, she let me go and concentrated on herself. For the first time, I saw an animal touch its own reproductive organs. I lay there, observing how she moved her long limbs, how gracefully her hands slipped across her body. I tried to imagine how it must feel to have such a body, one that could choose between horizontal and vertical, could bend at an angle and rest head against arms, arms against legs which had hands that could perform all kinds of tasks. An animal that could touch its own body. I admit that I was fascinated that first time, but my interest would soon wear off. I would soon come to hate this woman, just as intensely as I did the first one. At night, she lay close to me beneath the blanket, so close that I could taste the sweetish salt of her sweat with my tongue. She touched her own reproductive organs for pleasure. The sense that rose from her became stronger then. Her sweat and the taste of her came closer. I lay in the dark and felt a tension tighten in my teeth. I became hungry. She needed me. She seemed not to be able to function with other humans. That must be why she did things with me and not with them. If anyone could give me all I hungered and longed for, it was this woman. She was my only hope. That's why I continued to lie there, and that's also why I began to whisper faint little prayers to her in the night. Part 2 Live Orlesund Tuesday the 8th of June 2004 the rabbit sat on the bed. The fat, helpless creature was using all the senses it had to try to find out if the room was safe. Its long ears moved, seeking sounds. Its nose twitched up and down. Shining black eyes stared at me like an accusation. I bent down and patted it on the head. The rabbit flinched at my touch and started breathing more quickly. Nero came creeping from behind across my leg, he moved quickly now that he had caught the scent of the prey. The rabbit was too fat and heavy to escape his supple coil. Nero surrounded the animal with ease, his fangs snagging in its neck and forcing the animal down onto the bed. Then he began the slow process of opening his jaws over it. As I came, the pleasure mixed with a nausea that slithered through my guts, filling my mouth with a sour taste. 
I pulled the duvet over my head to block out the sight, to ease the queasy feeling that increased with every piece of prey I watched him devour. I tried in vain to muffle the sound of Nero's whispering thanks. Outside the window, the constant sound of passing cars could be heard, and I could smell cooking from the restaurant on the ground floor. I set my feet on the tiny patch of floor in this closet of a room, where there was just space enough for my bed and a kitchen counter with a hot plate and a small microwave. My clothes lay in a pile on the floor, my textbooks in a stack by the door. The room was also too expensive for me, far too expensive. But it was the best I'd been able to rent at short notice without having to pay three months' deposit. After what happened, I'd packed up my most necessary belongings and fled here the very next morning. Now I couldn't stand being here, but I didn't have anywhere else to go except the university. It was Tuesday. Since the night Ingvar had betrayed me, I hadn't wanted to speak to either him or Egil, and other than them, I had nobody in my life. Nero was still working to swallow the prey. This had long since stopped being a game. If he didn't get what he wanted, his whispering could keep me awake all night. It wore me down until my body took over, becoming a weak-willed servant who stood in the queue at the pet shop in order to quench his insatiable needs. He'd grown so much since we got him. I'd read on the internet that adult tiger pythons needed large prey, such as lambs or piglets. Where was I going to get hold of a lamb? I couldn't stay here. I had to get out of this tin can of a room, regardless of whether I had somewhere to go or not. I pulled on my jeans and hoodie, decided simply to get out anywhere, just to walk. Outside, the wind made it difficult to keep my hood up. I walked down to the wharf and stood there, looking into the dark water that foamed far below, the boats that rocked. Took my phone from my pocket. There were a dozen or so missed calls, most of them from Ingvar and Egil, a few from an unknown number, and the rest from the woman who called herself my mother. She, who saw fit to ask me for an apology, while at the same time looking her son in the eyes and accepting his version of events. Who could call me and force all the memories down over my head. They made me sick, all of them. I considered dropping the phone watching it disappear into the dark water, but changed my mind and put it back in my pocket. The wind blew my hood from my head yet again, sending my hair out in all directions. I pulled it up once more, turning to stand with my back to the wind. I followed the water to the end of the quay and glanced up at the traffic lights, where I could see the Kremergården shopping centre up ahead. I could warm up a little in the shopping centre, or the library, but I didn't want to bump into people. I already walked around too much. Orlesen was not a town in which you wandered restlessly. Here, if you wandered around long enough, you became part of the urban landscape, a curiosity. Still, I had to wander. The only alternative was to sit locked in a room with my own darkness. So I walked to the right and followed the quay further along. Thought I could walk to the bus station, see whether there was a bus I could get on, get away. Start again, somewhere else entirely. But strangely enough, that didn't feel like an option. It was as if I didn't believe it was possible. This body, eating itself up from the inside out, would be with me no matter where I went. Instead, I continued over the Hellebrua Bridge, walking to the right, towards Apotergogata, and on past the old buildings, past two hotels, and down, until I found water again. There, through an underpass, I came to the street that contained the old wooden buildings that remained from before the big city fire. Continued my restless wandering, past the old pier and onwards. I just wanted to walk until I was out of breath. Then I saw a poster on the wall of the old factory. Graduation exhibition, Orlesunder Art College. The opening was in two days' time. I came to a stop, stared at the painting featured on the poster. 
a dark-haired girl with something in her eyes, a darkness. She had captured me well. Ronya, Christiansen, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017. Stop tarting yourself up, Ronya. You're not going on a date. Vita laughs at me as she signals right and turns off the main road. Vita often laughs at me, emitting tiny grunting sounds from her nose when she does. I flip up the sun visor, feel my cheeks grow hot as I fix the last lock of hair in place with a clip. I'm not tarting myself up. I just think it's irritating to have loose bits of hair flying around. Vita lets out yet another grunt. But it suits you like that. You know it does. She lets locks of her red hair fall into her freckled face without thinking anything of it. Vita, who always stands up straight and keeps her elbows slightly away from her body to make herself look bigger, although I don't think she does this consciously. It's a habit, an unconscious defensive posture. I want to challenge you, Ronya, she says. You've been silent, just listening during our inquiries so far. It's a good and useful tactic that one of us talks while the other listens and takes notes. But you need the practice. So today, I think you should have a go. I've had plenty of practice. We practiced on each other at the Police University College, employing all available methods to ensure effective questioning. We made a good team when we practiced together, putting our best acting skills to use and laughing a lot. Interviews were a game. It isn't the same with a proper case, one without any set answers or tutors or grades and where a real person's life is at stake. Not that I didn't conduct interviews during my training, I did. Still, I often choose to withdraw. It happens automatically. I, I know, I say. It's just that you're so good at it. You always know the right questions to ask straight away. I only realise what I should have asked when I hear you say it. It would be stupid if we miss something important. Vita glances in the mirror and turns into the car park of the local outpatient psychiatric clinic. You've read all the textbooks, Ronya. You know what to do. Ask open questions where possible and let them talk. Don't interrupt. This guy will be challenging, but he's asked to have a nurse present, so we'll have help in handling the situation. I think you'll do just fine. Peter finds a parking space and pulls into it with the greatest of ease, turns the key in the ignition. We'll play it this way. You talk, I keep quiet. If I think you're ruining something, which I highly doubt is going to happen, I'll interrupt, OK? Peter is... I like Vita. She doesn't use the kinds of expressions some of the men use. Good girl. As if being good is something negative. And unlike several of the others, she didn't comment out of the blue on the fact that everyone saw me dancing with August on Friday. With Vita, I brought it up myself. And it was really nice to have somebody to talk to, knowing that our conversation wouldn't be repeated in the break room later on. Vita is cool. In her spare time, she's a member of an amateur theatre company. She's tried to get me to come along to a rehearsal, but I'm not good at stuff like that, at acting. But Beta is fantastic. The times I've seen her on stage, it's been like watching another person. She can make people laugh and cry. I introduce us at reception and say that we're here to talk with Robert Chiakaby. We've arranged to meet him here, I say, feeling Beta's gaze at the back of my neck. A couple of minutes later, a woman with short grey hair comes over to us. She gives each of us a firm handshake and introduces herself as the psychiatric nurse Shirkaby has asked to be present during our conversation. She shows us into a meeting room containing a long table and chairs. The fluorescent ceiling lamp casts a cool light over the white room. The nurse stays standing as Beta and I sit. Robert has asked me to inform you of his diagnosis in advance, she says. He's been diagnosed with paranoid psychosis. He struggles with delusions relating to conspiracies against him 
and he often has problems expressing himself in a way that is comprehensible because he confuses reality and his delusions. Recently, he's read a lot in the newspapers about the decision to build the new regional hospital at Yelset in Mulder and what that means for the hospital here in Kristiansund. He's created his own fantasy about the hospital, which often comes up when we're trying to talk about something else. It's important to remember that he doesn't lie, nor does he see people who aren't really there, but he can be challenging to communicate with. He can also seem intense, but as far as we're aware, he's never been violent. My heart pounds as she speaks. I remember one of the tests at the Police University College when I had to handle an aggressive man, someone who called me all kinds of terrible things and who threatened to kill me. I tried to remember how it felt to prepare myself mentally. On the day Eben disappeared, it's probable that he was in Nordlandet, the nurse says. He lives in the area and didn't have an appointment here until later in the day. He's regarded as well enough to live on his own and be a day patient at the clinic. We know that he often walks around the town centre when he isn't here. Paranoid people don't tolerate being contradicted very well. That was something my tutor told me at some point. The best tutor I've ever had, with so much experience, and who took such joy in teaching. It was as if all of Norway's police stations moved into the classroom. Is he prepared for the interview to be recorded? The nurse nods. We've explained that that's necessary in order to be able to use his information in the investigation. He's afraid of becoming a suspect himself, but he seems content with the fact that he's only being interviewed as a witness. The nurse flicks aside her grey fringe. Thank you, I say. As the nurse goes to fetch Robert Shirkaby, I meet Beta's eyes, which have a twinkle of laughter in them. She can see that I'm nervous. You can do this, Ronya. You're doing great. She lifts her hand in a high five, at which I feel embarrassingly touched, but I return it. Then the door opens, and into the room walks a young man of around my age. He has dark hair that's slightly too long, and he looks exhausted. His shoulders are hunched. Instead of meeting anyone's gaze, he looks down at the table. The nurse sits down beside him. This is Ronya Solshin and Beta Lee, she says. As we discussed, they'd like to ask you a few questions. Is that OK? Robert Shirkaby casts a quick glance up at me and Beta before he looks down at the table again and nods. He whispers something, his voice so low that none of us catches it. What was that, Robert? asks the nurse. He continues to whisper. I catch a few words, think he's maybe saying something about Tom Cruise, but I'm not sure. He seems extremely confused and anxious. It's hard to imagine him seeming threatening, but his mood may of course swing. I clear my throat. Hi, Robert, I say. M my name is Ronya. I'd just like to let you know that this interview is being recorded. You're being interviewed as a witness in connection with Eben Lynn's disappearance. Could you tell us what you told us on the telephone? He looks up at me, his eyes suddenly sharp. W w what do you get? W what, do you, what do you get? Tor Lynn's daughter is big business. Uh, how do you know what and what not? The city council has organised the whole thing against Christiansen Hospital and the city. Everyone ends up rotting away in their graves before the ambulance comes. It's the council's fault. His voice is suddenly high-pitched and shrill. It sounds as if he's on the verge of tears. His eyes are full of anger and pain. I take a deep breath. I can feel that I'm struggling to stop my voice from shaking. Can you tell us what you know about Tor Lin's daughter? Have you seen her? Little blonde girl. In all the newspapers and on TV, they're all showing photos of the missing girl. Nobody cares about the man she talked to. No pictures of him. Oh, no, none. His breath comes in brief, panting thrusts. He lifts his narrow shoulders all the way up to his ears. 
little blonde girl in the newspapers, but no big man. Oh, no, nobody writing about him. All the newspapers are looking down at the ground. Nobody cares about the city council, that they want to tear down the walls around us. They throw it right in your face and you refuse to see it. Turn away. What about all the dead? What about them? Tom Cruise. He's the one they're paying. Tom Cruise is getting the money, hanging off the mountainside. The rest of us have to watch the walls being torn down around us. The hospital we have to get rid of. Tom Cruise is the one we want. He hawks and spits a huge glob of phlegm onto the table in front of him. Slams two fists down into the spit, making the tape recorder jump. You mentioned a man, I say, who Eben Lynn talked to. Did you see her talking to this man? He turns his head in a sudden movement and sets his eyes on me. That's what I'm saying. They don't listen. The man talked to her and then she was gone. Nobody cares. The newspapers are just sticking up pictures of a sweet little girl and nobody cares. It's the same with... Where did you see this man? I know I'm not really supposed to interrupt the witness, but with Robert I have to do something to stop him from constantly going off the rails. It works. He stops mid-flow. Listen to me! Tor Lin was in on it. The city council and the hospital, he was in on it. And now his daughter, sweet girl. Nobody comes dragging a man with a wide jaw and grey shirt when it's Tor Lin, Tor Lin and his daughter. Man gets to go on killing girls, controlling them and killing them. He's evil, evil. His nose, like a big hook, like a witch. In Storgata at Storkaya, grey shirt and a carrier bag in his hand from Kurbus. I should have killed him there and then. How close were you? I ask. Were you close enough to hear what they said? He shakes his head, hard. Spoke quiet, spoke quiet, and planned how they would exterminate us all. It's like with all the dead, those who can no longer speak. I know that they hear us. They want to drag us down to them. She walked away. He was furious. He wanted something from her, but she walked away. My heart is pounding. Could this really be something? Where did Eben go? Up the road. She kept going up towards Lungweyen. The man watched her, probably planning how he was going to make sure that the money got to Tom Cruise. It's no use thinking we can change them. They hate us, want to destroy our city, calling us all towards the earth. His two fists hit the tabletop again with a bang. You think it's one of the lunatics. Of course you think so. You never think the powers that be are at fault. But the powers that be are always guilty. He killed that beautiful little girl and you're in on it too. You're in on it. He throws himself forward and puts his head in his hands. Begins to sob loudly, his face behind his palms. I think that's enough for now the nurse says, taking Robert Shierkeby's hand. Don't you think so, Robert, that we should stop it there? Robert nods and gets up. His cheeks are wet with tears, but he seems to be breathing more calmly and his eyes are clearer. I know who it is, he says in a low voice. You can't make me forget it, no matter how hard you might want to. You'll have to kill me first. Then he permits himself to be led from the room. How do you think it went? Vita gets into the car on the driver's side. I'm shaking. Take a box of cough drops from my bag and put two in my mouth. Chew, just to be in motion. It wasn't exactly easy. You did really well. For someone so new to this, you're great. I mean it. For someone so new to this. Did she have to put it like that? He blamed us. Eta snorts as she starts the car. He also thought Tom Cruise was involved, although I'm pretty sure he was busy elsewhere. Do you think we can use any of what he said? The description he gave of the man, can we use it for anything? It'll be difficult. We have to report it, but he's... Eta whistles and makes a hand gesture beside her head, which I find inappropriate. 
the whole situation is just so sad. That someone has to go around feeling so tormented. Has to wander around town afraid of everything and everyone, from politicians to ordinary strangers. We have a description, I say. Perhaps somebody else has seen the same man. Peter nods. We should definitely give the media something to run with and ask the man to get in touch, she says. But it's Shahid's decision, of course. She drives towards Gormalona for the next witness on our list, a man who believes he saw Eben all the way out there on Saturday morning, something I consider to be highly unlikely. He might have a point with his thing about the hospital, I say. People have been angry at the city's politicians for sacrificing the hospital's location. Could someone have been so angry that they wanted to exact revenge on Tor Lin? Peter shrugs again. Lin has received threats before, although none of them have ever involved Eben, but who knows? People do plenty of crazy things. I feel so sorry for the family, I say. It's not been possible to speak with Mariam Lind over the past few days, only the husband. She must be so low to just lock herself away because she can't even bear to participate in the search for her own daughter. I wonder what makes someone kidnap a little girl like that. What makes someone think he has the right to do such a thing? Peter stops for a red light and frowns. It isn't my job to understand the feelings behind people's actions, she says. I just want to catch the arsehole who did it. That's wrong, I think. Because in order to catch the arsehole, you have to understand why he acted as he did. How can you figure out the who and what if you can't link the actions to the feelings behind them? <laughs> I'm still shaking. I laugh. You would have done so much better than me. Oh, stop it, says Beta. You were great. And by the way, if you think you need more input, you can always watch recordings of previous interviews. I think that can often be useful. Ruhr Ulsvik, for example. He's a good role model. How about watching some of his recordings? Ruhr seems so... I just think he seems to be carrying so much. I don't know why I say this. Well, he's extremely competent and seems to care about what he does. Like the kind of loners you see on crime series on TV. Just you wait. It'll turn out he's undertaking some secret investigation on the side. Eta blinks. I shudder. So, which one of us is the female police officer sidekick with the stern expression, who always does everything right? Eta laughs. Doesn't sound like anybody I know. It occurs to me that I could have asked who she thinks is the young female police officer who sleeps with an older colleague. That would be me, of course. He's not an old man, though, and certainly not my boss. And anyway, I haven't slept with any of my colleagues. Just exchanged some saliva. Ugh. Rua's little speech at yesterday's morning meeting, it was hard to watch. I just don't get how a policeman with so many years of experience... True, Ronya, but even the best of us make mistakes. Do as you like. You can listen to my interviews too, if you think I'm such a good interviewer. Eta takes a left. Want to come out for a beer tonight? It's the opening night party. I've been out with Beta and her friends a few times. They're always so full of energy and self-confidence, playing out their acting dreams in the bar of the Grand Hotel, laughing too loudly at each other's jokes and making a scene by yawning theatrically and patronisingly when I say it's time to go home. I like them. It isn't that. They're too cool for me. Or maybe I just don't fit in. One of the best things about being at the Police University College was the sense of belonging we all felt in being part of the police force. It was fine if you didn't care about much other than that. We all spoke the same language. I miss it. I need to work out, I say, and after that I think I need to prioritise getting as much sleep as possible. I'm planning on working for as long as I can tomorrow. Beta laughs at me again as she reverses between two parked cars. Workaholic, she says. Live or listened.
Thursday the 10th of June, 2004. I picked up a glass of sparkling wine from the table of welcome drinks, cast a glance around the old factory premises with its columns and white painted walls. There were few places to hide. A couple dozen people were already walking around with price lists in their hands, studying the artworks. A video installation consisting of a torn-up map that was set out on a table, a sculpture constructed of industrial pallets, a collage of sheets of cursive handwriting and notebook pages. At the other end of the premises, I could see the outline of my own face. I did my best to sneak around the edge of the room, sticking close to the wall until I reached the portrait. She had painted me with my shoulders bare my hair wet and slightly tousled. Long, gentle strokes, as if done with care. Although I wasn't sure why I thought the person who had painted this picture had wanted to do something good. Now, looking at the painting again, I saw that not everything in it looked like me. She hadn't got the shape of the face quite right. The lips were a little too large, the nose too narrow. The painting seemed like a slightly blurred memory. Still, she'd done a good job after having seen me only once for a few minutes. The strongest thing about the painting was the eyes. The woman in the picture had eyes so dark they looked like deep holes or black stones. They seemed impaled by something sharp. But at the same time, there was life in them, something that insisted on its own existence. That gaze frightened me. I couldn't say that it was a realistic gaze. It was too brutal for that. Still, I recognised it so well that it hurt. At that moment, I heard someone say Anita's name. I turned and saw her come in, smiling in a loose, pale blue summer dress with a hemline that came to just below her knees. Her blonde hair was put up and she had huge hoops in her ears. She accepted hugs from this direction and that, and was handed a bouquet of yellow, red and white flowers that were radiant against her blue dress. Beside her stood a man of Ingvar's age, but with a far shorter and more well-groomed dark beard. He seemed to know the same people she did. I immediately regretted coming, felt weird, out of place and trapped at the far end of the room, not knowing how I was going to get out without her seeing me. I turned to face the painting again. Suddenly, I thought that the girl in the picture looked so naive, almost childish, and that there was something disgusting about her, something dirty. Liv! Anita came towards me with long strides and threw her arms around my neck. The locks of her hair closed themselves around me. Her bouquet of flowers crackled at my back. It's so great to see you! Actually, I have to leave, I mumbled regretting it as soon as I saw her face change. Nice painting. I'll walk you out, she said. Mama, could you hold these? She passed the bouquet of flowers to a blonde-haired woman who looked strikingly like her, only older. We walked out into the cool evening wind, sat down on some steps. I tried to call you, she said. I got your number from Egil. He says you moved out, that there was some kind of trouble between you. He wouldn't tell me what it was. Long story, I said, looking down at my hands. I wanted to tell you about the painting before the exhibition, but I couldn't get hold of you. I hope it was okay. You don't think it's rude, do you? Seeing as I don't even know you. I shook my head. I like it. It's pretty impressive that you managed that, having hardly even seen me. You know... I was pretty rude. I was going to ask you if you wanted to model for me, but I couldn't get hold of you. So I borrowed a photograph from Egil. Anita folded her dress around her thighs. As she did so, I thought her belly had become rounder since the last time we met. Yeah, that's really fucking rude, I laughed. I can't stay away too long, she said, but I mean it. It was really nice that you came. She pushed a stray strand of hair behind her ear. Listen, Birk goes to sea next week. He works four weeks on and four weeks off. Birk? She waved the question away with her hand. 
When he goes, I'll have the house to myself. Would you like to model for another painting? So maybe it'll be better this time? I thought about the painting back inside the gallery, the dark eyes that seemed somehow impaled. Had she used some red in them and some white too? How had she managed to make them look both living and dead? If I dare, I said. Mariam, Orlison, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017. I stick the spade in just as the water withdraws, filling it with wet sand that I drop into a yellow bucket. The waves embrace my legs. It's neither hot nor cold. I pat down the top of the sand in the bucket to make it as hard as possible. Turn the bucket upside down so that it sets yet another tower on top of the four that already stand there. Eben is on her knees, eagerly digging out a moat. She's wearing her white sun hat, her face turned down as she focuses on her work, digging even though the water continually returns to tear down everything she's built. She stops, sticks a chubby hand down into the sand to grab a stone. Look, Mama! She gives the stone to me. It's white and smooth beneath my thumb. That's nice, I say. We have to put that on the top. I hand the stone back to her. She takes it, stretching to set it atop the sandcastle. She's four years old, full of energy. I'm tired, very, very tired. But at the same time, so terribly happy to have her right now. A piercing, dazzling light breaks through, and around me the world changes colour. Through a haze of sea and blonde hair, I'm looking at a wall covered in flowered wallpaper. I sit up in bed and reality washes over me. She's gone. Someone has taken her from me. Outside I hear Carol trying to calm the parrot that is flapping and screeching. Shut up, goddamn parrot! The parrot shrieks with a dark voice I assume once belonged to Carol's deceased husband. My head feels heavy after drinking wine with Carol yesterday evening. I turn and see Nero lying there, stretching out his long body. He's now as thick as my thigh, and so long and heavy that if I want to lift and move him, I have to do it in several rounds. His tail hangs down towards the floor, out of sight. When I stroke his back, a quiver runs through my entire body. I didn't think it was possible to feel any more connected to him than I did back then, but now the connection is so strong that it frightens me. I slip beneath his belly, feeling the power of his muscles, and think I'm going to explode from the inside. Carol lives in a house with many rooms. Doors line the walls, one after the other, as if in a student house. She runs a major operation here, with various animals that are imported into the country, both legally and illegally. Snakes, lizards and fighting dogs. She waves to me as I walk past a room in which she's throwing feed into an aquarium. Her hair is twisted into a large bun on the top of her head, and she's wearing long black gloves. I go into the bathroom. The shower curtain has been drawn aside and the bathtub is full of water. In it swim a dozen sea turtles that stick their heads up from the water's surface in order to watch me and draw breath. Yesterday, she told me that several people had asked her whether it was she who had the penguins that were thought to have been stolen from Orlison Aquarium a while ago. Carol laughed her usual high-pitched laugh as she told me about it. I find a tube of toothpaste in a cabinet above the sink and look at myself in the mirror. I look ten years older than I did just a few days ago. The radio fills the kitchen with sugar-sweet pop music. Carol is standing at the closest of the overfilled kitchen's two stoves, swaying in time to the music as she heats milk in a saucepan. Her hands, short fingers, stubby nails, touch her face. She still doesn't wear makeup, doesn't dress up, and lets her breasts hang loose inside a baggy grey sweater. Still, she looks attractive with her grizzled curls. 
When she was young, she always wore bright colours and heavy makeup. Carol Holloway, a Norwegian American actress who starred in more than a few B movies in the 80s, before she'd had a child with a Norwegian and moved to Norway. She shown me photographs of how she looked back then, with the baby in her arms and an overly painted face, her head still full of dreams of making it big as an actress. When those dreams were shattered and replaced by new business activities, the need to dress up also disappeared. Now she seems to be facing old age and the extra kilos she carries with satisfaction. You look good, Carol. She snorts. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. She pours hot coffee from the pot into two cups, then empties the hot milk into them from the little saucepan. It's always surprised me that there were two stoves in this room. The one at the farthest end is older and perhaps never used. Carol loves old things. The walls are decorated with old kitchen utensils and rose malt porcelain. It's like a miniature museum. I lift the coffee cup she's given me. It has the word Mama on the front, the letters decorated with flowers. The music is interrupted by the familiar melody that indicates the start of the news. Eben is still the main subject. A witness is said to have seen her speaking to a man before she disappeared. The police are asking the man to come forward. The thought makes me cold. A man. They don't say anything about what he looked like, old or young, tall or short. There was a man, and Eben still hasn't been found. Then the newsreader changes topic. No search for Eben's mother, Mariam Lynn. I don't know whether that's because they don't know where to find me, or because Tor has chosen not to say anything. And if the latter is the case, how long will it take before they figure it out for themselves? I have to have him with me, Carol. Now the tears come too. This isn't the first time I've cried in this house, but I'm equally surprised every time I do. It's as if something about Carol's home opens something within me that has previously been closed off. Carol presses herself against me, putting her arm around my shoulders. There, there. She says no more than this. I'm the one who speaks. The words come in brief bursts, as if something is blocking them. I try to put all the impressions from the last few days into words, give them names. Carol rubs my back as I speak, big movements with the flat of her hand. My tears stain her grey sweater. She smells of cigarette smoke and something else, something sweet. The worst thing, Carol, I say, is that I actually believed I didn't love her. I thought that it was just a game, that I was pretending. Love is not a constant, dear, says Carol. You don't feel just the one thing. Don't you know that? I'm a pendulum, I say. I'm a pendulum swinging between love and destruction. I build up and tear down. I protect and preserve, only to crush everything in the very next moment. When you look at me, you see me as I am, a loving, caring wife and mother who adores my husband and my child. It isn't a game. That woman is no less me than the one who would have liked to see everything go to hell, who finds a perverse joy in the fact that her family is about to be destroyed forever. The person you see when you look at me is also the opposite of who I am. That which is real is also a game, a self-contradiction but no impossibility. Is there anything I can do? Carol asks. If there is, just tell me. She blows another cloud of smoke towards the ceiling. I have to have Nero with me. I need him if I'm going to get through this. I think I told you I received an offer for him. They wanted to take his skin and make a jacket or something like that. It was a good price they were offering too, but... I could never have done that to you. That means so much to me, Carol. Of course I'll buy him back. Just name your price. Carol waves the hand in which she's holding her cigarette. I'll give you a very good price, dear. Very good. And next time, 
Don't leave it so long before you come back. Live or listen. Wednesday, the 16th of June, 2004. I'd almost given up waiting when she finally came to the door. She smiled with her crooked front teeth, her blonde locks bold, her face free of makeup. She was wearing a white top flecked with paint. It was stretched tight around her waist and hugged her belly in a way that left no doubt that she was pregnant. I'm so glad you came, she said. I'm just putting the finishing touches to a painting. Do you want to come up? Her top was a little too short, revealing the tattoo on her back when she turned. I followed her up a spiral staircase to the first floor into a room that had been fitted out as a studio. An easel stood beside the only window. Tubes of paint and brushes lay strewn across a table. On the walls hung canvases featuring all kinds of motifs. Paintings of forests and animals, several self-portraits or portraits of other people. I bent closer to inspect a painting of a man with a closely cropped black beard, black hair, black eyebrows. He had rolled up shirt sleeves, his hands on his hips. His arms looked strong, muscular and hairy. It was the man I'd seen her with at the exhibition. Beak hates modelling for me, she laughed. That's one of the few times I've managed to get him to do it. There was something hard in his gaze, as if he were hiding a side of himself you probably wouldn't want to get to know. I wonder whether the painting exposed something about their relationship. You're really good, I said. She shook her head. The painting makes him look older than he really is. He didn't like it. Thought I'd painted him as a mixture of himself and my father. She laughed again, a tenderness in the sound. I turned to the next painting, a self-portrait in which she was half-dressed with a naked gaze. It's beautiful, I said, reaching out a hand to touch the painted version of her collarbone. Then my cheeks flushed hot and I withdrew my hand. Anita blushed too and turned towards the painting she was currently working on. A woman nailed to a cross by one arm, her head turned towards the sea. Behind her the sky was dark, the clouds appeared heavy with rain and a strong wind blew her hair in front of her face. That's intense, I said. Anita smiled. I'm inspired by stories about women who waited for their men back when they were all out at sea. They didn't know whether they would ever return. Using her brush, she mixed two colours on her palette and applied fresh paint to the woman's throat. Anita seemed older in these surroundings, not only because of the bump at her stomach, but because of the house around her. An old house, its floors lacquered with a dark varnish. I wondered which incarnation was most Anita, the young girl I met in the flat share bathroom or the grown woman before the easel. I liked both versions. The daylight from the skylight above cast a mystical sheen over the room. As Anita painted, I walked beside the walls and tables, looking at all the objects there. Piles of paper and sketches, boxes of charcoal, tubes of paint, chests of art supplies. What's this? I asked, lifting up an object made of compact glass, consisting of two balls on top of each other like a snowman. It was much heavier than it looked, and it glinted in the light. It's a glass muller, she said. It's for grinding pigments to make paint. <laughs> I hardly ever use it. I buy tubes of oil paint, but it makes a good paperweight. I put the muller down, went and sat in an armchair in a corner and studied Anita, how she seemed to become one with the painting on which she was working. It felt good to be in her company. There was something simple about it, which I liked. If we became friends, that's how I wanted it to be, uncomplicated. But at the same time, something gnawed at me, something unclear. She laughed, then, put her hands to her belly. <laughs> the baby's kicking, she said. 
I only started to feel her doing it a couple of days ago. It tickles. It's a girl. And we're going to call her Aurora. How pretty, I said. I love the northern lights. She looked down at her stomach, stroked it a couple of times. How long have you been together? I asked, pointing at the man in the painting. She gestured towards a stack of cardboard boxes in the corner. I moved in here at the start of this month. When we last met, I thought you were Egil's latest conquest, I said. She laughed, and again I heard the tenderness in her laughter. She took a step back from the painting, reached out her hand, and made a tiny white brushstroke at the woman's throat before withdrawing her paintbrush. There! We stood for a moment, considering the woman in the painting, her face half turned away so that it was impossible to see what emotion she was hiding. Maybe the stormy clouds said something about what was going on inside her, but it was ambiguous. Now it's your turn, Anita said. Do you want to get undressed? My cheeks burned. Oh, you meant naked, <laughs> if that's okay. I turned my back to her and began to take off my clothes. She had seen me naked before, but undressing deliberately was different. Now the whole point was for her to look at me. I set my clothes in a pile on the floor and sat down in the armchair in the corner. Is it okay like this? She nodded, and I now saw that her cheeks were red too. She picked up a brush and turned the easel so that she could stand and look in my direction. Just let me know if you get cold. The room fell silent, apart from the low sound of Anita's careful brush strokes. I wondered what would happen to the painting. Who would see it? I wasn't used to someone being able to observe my body like this. But as she painted, I became accustomed to the feeling. I have to admit, I'm curious, I said. Were you one of Egil's conquests? She shrugged. I end up doing a lot of things. Same here, I said, but that doesn't answer my question. I know, it must seem strange, she said. Her smile disappeared. Several seconds passed in which she simply painted in silence. The light from the skylight gave her hair a white glow. It's all right, she said finally, gesturing towards the painting of Birk. An arrangement that works. He's away for weeks at a time, and I can be here and do the work I want to do. She glanced over at me, seeming to compare me to something on the canvas. By the time I found out I was pregnant, it was already too late to have an abortion. We decided to try to make a relationship work, for the baby's sake. So I moved in with Birk. She inhaled, let out a long sigh. I guess you wouldn't have done the same, she said. You seem so free. For me, it didn't feel like a choice. But looking after a baby all alone, there wouldn't be much time for art. Her voice cracked. Instinctively, I got up from the chair, went across to her and hugged her. Her hair flowed over my face like lukewarm water. It felt like hugging myself. Don't cry, I whispered. Stuck out the tip of my tongue and licked the salty tears from her cheek. She giggled. I stroked her slightly damp hair, touched her throat with my fingertips. It felt more intimate than it usually did. Something entirely different to this cold, aimless pastime I'd been making attempts at previously, and usually while in an intoxicated state. This was more honest, in a way, filled with more blushing and giggling, as if with open faces. I trembled as I ran my hands over her body, felt the glow of her skin, and found that she tasted like caramel. I had my head under the juve my mouth buried in Anita's wet labia. She writhed, emitting tiny whimpers, and suddenly it seemed that there was someone there who answered. A similar sound from elsewhere in the room. 
The sound didn't seem to be abating, but rather to be increasing in volume and intensity. I wondered whether there was something wrong with my ears. It wasn't until afterwards, when I set my head beside hers on the pillow, that I saw where the sound was coming from. There, in a corner just behind a wardrobe, was a basket. In it was a miniature black poodle with a motley litter of puppies. <laughs> Aren't they lovely? Anita laughed as she got up, pulling a blanket around her and walking over to the basket. She picked up one of the tiny puppies and carried it across to me. It landed on my chest and immediately began to toddle across the duvet. Its ears were small, curly flaps on its little head, flecked black and brown. This little darling got out and went on a date with the neighbour's King Charles Spaniel. If you know anyone who'd like a little mongrel to take care of, just let me know. I held my breath for a moment. I felt my pulse rise again when I looked down at the tiny, curly creature. I opened my mouth, a reflex. Didn't want to say anything, but it was as if my lips and vocal cords had a will of their own. Actually, I said, then swallowed, my grandmother just lost her dog. I think she'd be really up for getting another. I buried my face in the dog's fur, wanting to wipe away the idiotic words. Great! That's perfect! Anita cried. She can have my favourite. Mariam Orlison, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017 Nero hisses as I push him down into the large suitcase I've purchased from Carol and which I've punched with holes using an awl so he can breathe. His open jaws are bigger than my face, a whitish-pink palette with two rows of small, transparent teeth. They're almost invisible, but they're there. Were it not for the teeth, his mouth might have given the impression of being a pink tunnel to paradise. A ridiculous thought. I close the lid over him and zip the suitcase shut. He hasn't spoken to me since I came back. Maybe it can be different this time. A friendship. Mutual. I start the car's engine and drive towards the town centre. It's a bright day and the roads are empty. I move up through the gears, watching all the small houses rush past. On the main road, between some small rocky outcrops, the nostalgia truly hits home. How many times have I driven these roads, through this tunnel, past the Sunmara Museum, where boats lie bobbing on the fjord, through the next tunnel, until I can see the first signs of Orlison Town Centre before me? My body lightens, as if I'm approaching something exciting. It makes me want to listen to music, so I turn on the radio, but it's the news. They're talking about the disappearance and the police search in Christiansund. I turn it off. Can't bear to remember that she's gone. I drive through the town centre a few times to take a look around. The town hall has been given a facelift. McDonald's has become a Henny's and Moritz. But the starting point is still the same. The buildings. The streets. It feels as if I've gone back in time. I half expect to take a look in the rearview mirror and see a girl, twelve years my junior, reflected back at me. To be able to turn and see my two friends sitting in the back seat. I drive on, past the old cinema and down Lervenvolgata, taking a left at the lights I have a feeling never worked, that these lights must have been standing here flashing amber for twelve years. At the next junction I turn right and drive past the old bus station, where we spent so many evening hours sitting and smoking on one of the hard wooden benches with a view of the asphalt and fjord. Asphalt and fjord. All that Orlesund is. The nostalgia is slipping away, replaced by the old feeling of boredom I so often felt when I lived here. On the other side of Hellebrua, where the roundabouts have been turned into junctions controlled by traffic lights, I take a left in the direction of Steinvorgen. I drive on across the bridge, out to Skarbovica, past the small boats and the old high school, 
farther out past the rows of terraced houses and detached properties, back to a familiar neighbourhood. I know exactly where to park the car. I pulled a shiny gold key from my jacket pocket, the one that was in Eben's jewellery box, rubbing it between my fingers. The key to my room. It means something. I don't understand how Eben could suddenly have it, but this key proves that the disappearance must have something to do with me. This isn't just a key, it's a message. The first thing I have to do is see my old room. I never thought I would one day come back here. This place belongs only in the worst of my nightmares. Still, for whatever reason, I was drawn back here. I open the car's back door, crawl in beside the suitcase, and unzip it. The snake slithers out over the edge, its coil bulging out across my lap. He moves towards the window, seeking the house. Do you recognise it? I whisper. He says nothing, but there's no doubt that the answer is yes. He licks the air with a tongue that has also grown longer. Then the silence is broken by a whisper, like a light breeze in my ear. It's enough for me to know that nothing has changed. He's dissatisfied in my company, at having been held captive all these years, and now at having been shoved into this suitcase. He doesn't care whether or not he gets to see our old shared home again. I swallow. I have to put you back in there just for a little longer, I whisper. I'll make it up to you later, I promise. With great effort, I manage to force his body back into the suitcase and zip it closed. A light drizzle lands in my hair as I get out of the car. I think of how rain on one's wedding veil is said to bring good luck, and how it didn't rain when I got married. There wasn't a cloud in the sky that day. It was one of the few truly hot days of summer, and I started to sweat at even the slightest movement. I remember what it was like pulling on my close-fitting dress, how it clung to my skin with perspiration. How I looked at myself in the mirror and thought it wasn't me, that I looked like some big white animal on its way to the slaughter. But with time, I got better at being Mariam. Now it's she who feels like a stranger. I see from the name on the mailbox that the same landlady still lives on the ground floor. She hasn't ended up in an old people's home just yet. She's such an old biddy, that woman. I walk down the steps towards the basement entrance. The light is on, and I can hear heavy music coming from inside. I creep over to the kitchen window, which is ajar, and peer in. A man stands bent over the kitchen counter, wearing boxer shorts and a black T-shirt. His beard is shorter than before, but his hair is longer and paler. He almost looks like Jesus. It takes time for him to notice me, but when he does, he jumps and comes all the way over to the window. I can see how his features look older. I stand there, looking back at him and waiting. Then the recognition clicks into place. Fucking hell, live, he says. As I laugh, I think my voice sounds as if it actually belongs to live. It dawns on me that this is how I used to be. Playful. I've lost that part of myself completely. Over the past few years, so much of my life has been about doing things right raising my child in a responsible way, ensuring she gets healthy meals and that the house has clean windows, maintaining normality. For Liv, this serious normality was something that happened elsewhere, never where she was. Ingvar disappears into the apartment, soon after appearing again at the front door. He holds it open for me, wearing a Slayer t-shirt and a pair of sweatpants. From the look he gives me, I think he finds my appearance terribly straight-laced. But he smiles and hugs me. I walk after him, through the long hallway and into the living room. The music is still on, but at a lower volume. Ingvar starts to roll a cigarette. I thought you must have died ages ago, he says. 
He puts the cigarette between his lips and holds the packet of tobacco out to me. A roly, I think. Wasn't that what we always called them? I quit. He shakes his head, lights his roly and gets up to open the terrace door, letting air and sunlight into the apartment. I look around the room. The carpet has been replaced with linoleum, a larger TV, speakers and new curtains. New shelves have been put up, but the red chest of drawers in the corner is the same. Ingvar's posters hang on every wall. His guitar stands beside the sofa. So, how you doing, stranger? Ingvar asks. I've changed. Yeah, I noticed. Got a husband and a kid? He raises his eyebrows. Liv, that's great. At least one of us turned out okay. Egil? I ask. In prison. Stabbed a guy while he was drunk. Ingvar picks tobacco from his mouth, then rubs his fingers together above the ashtray. Egil used to be the straightest of all of us. At least to start with, when I first moved in. I look at my hands. Clean nails, painted a pale pink, a wedding ring. How ridiculous it all seems in this room. You, I say. He shrugs. Same old, same old. Are you still making music? Of course. The band broke up, though. I've had a normal job for about ten years now, driving a delivery van. There's something I need to talk to you about, Ingvar. He looks down at the table. Probably thinks I want to talk about that night. And I do, but not for the reason he's imagining. You don't watch the news, do you? He shrugs again. It's only ever total shit, whatever's going on. I have quite a bit to tell you. I'm not entirely sure where to start. Ingvar leans back, puts his feet on the table and starts to roll another rolly. So, just start talking. Liv, Orlesund, Wednesday the 6th of October 2004. I sat in the library reading room, trying to read about unstable column fractures, a kind of spinal break that most often occurs in patients with osteoporosis. The illustration was a drawing of the spine, with the ligaments added in blue. I set my fingers on the drawing, straightened up, considering just how essential the spinal column is to the body, the very centre of the body's movement and internal communication. It struck me that the snake skeleton was the essence of the human one. Apart from the head, the snake's bone structure consisted exclusively of a backbone and ribs, not so different from the way a human skeleton looked from the waist up. Without limbs, snakes had mastered the spine. It had developed to its full potential. I tried to imagine what it would be like to lose these limbs I carried around with me, to be nothing but a spine and reptilian brain and to slither lightly across the earth. My telephone made a noise from where it sat on the table in front of me. Several heads dotted around the reading room turned to look in my direction. The message was from Anita. Thinking of you. Anita was heavily pregnant now. Just a few days ago, on the last day before Beak returned home, we had slept naked in her bed feeling Aurora kicking against our fingers. It was such an intense feeling to see someone with a real-life person inside their body. When I first met Anita in the bathroom of the flat share, the baby in her belly was a snail-like creature, its skeleton just a spinal column. She hadn't even known that she was pregnant. Now the little girl inside her had ears and fingers, and would have a chance of surviving even if she was born premature. Every time Anita asked me to touch her stomach, I felt an aversion, as if the thing inside her might come out and eat me. Thinking of you? I hadn't been thinking of her. When I couldn't see her, I entered a state of emptiness and snake-focused fascination. It was Nero who filled my days now, 
as if he were my lover now that my spouse was busy elsewhere. I wasn't sure why I thought of her this way, as my spouse. I knew only that I felt good when I was with her, when I didn't have to be alone, when I could set my head against her chest and hear her heart beating. But at the same time, there was something frightening about her growing belly, about all the stability with which she surrounded herself and her worries on the baby's behalf, how she thought about what she ate all the time. She was simply becoming more and more grown up. In a way, it made me feel assured to know that she had Birk. I didn't need to be afraid that she might want anything more than what we had. I didn't need to fear that she would find out what I had done, how I had watched her beloved curly-coated puppy sink down Nero's throat as if into quicksand. Anita regularly asked me how the puppy and my grandmother were getting along, and I had to lie over and over again. I typed out a quick, thinking of you too, sent the message and switched the phone to silent. I had just turned back to the unstable column fractures when I felt a hand touch my shoulder, making me jump. I looked up and saw Egil's slightly sunburned face. He was wearing a white shirt, his hair neatly slicked back. Oh my God, I whispered, bending over in my chair. Egil began to walk towards the door, gesturing for me to follow. I quickly gathered up my things and went after him. What are you doing here? I said once we'd moved out into the hall. Egil stuffed his hands into the pockets of his chinos and shrugged. It's not as if it's possible to get hold of you any other way. I bumped into Anita earlier. She's as big as a house. He gave a brief laugh. So I thought it was about fucking time you stopped hiding from me. We found a vacant seating area in the foyer. Egil sat down, one foot propped on the opposite knee. Anita says the two of you've got something going, he said. So? He glanced up at the ceiling. It doesn't make any difference to me. I just thought I'd let you know that's what she's saying. Is that why you came here? He sighed. Around us, student voices merged into a background hum. I just don't think you should cut us off completely because of what happened. I leaned forward. By what happened, I assume you mean stealing my key, letting yourself into my room and doing whatever the hell you wanted just so you could frighten the life out of the entire party? I'm sorry for that last thing, he said, but the first isn't true. I told you the truth. The door was already open. I fought the impulse to throw something or to get up and leave, dug my fingers into the edge of the sofa. Ingval's been really down since you left. What does that have to do with me? Egil shook his head. He didn't mean to hurt you. He's just a big pussy. That's bad enough. OK, but I hope you and I can still meet up sometimes. We'll see. I said, letting my head drop back onto the sofa. I realised that this was something I had missed. Everyday life in our shared flat, just hanging out together. How was your summer? I said. So damn boring. Not to mention fucking awful. Next summer will be better. I'm going to take a road trip through the USA. Hollywood, Las Vegas, Memphis, Chicago, New York. I laughed. I'd forgotten just how much of a cliché you are, Egil. Does that mean Daddy has turned the money tap back on? He fixed his blue eyes on me. Sorry, I said, old habit. Well, anyway, the answer is no, he said. But it doesn't matter. I have a much better idea. A real Al Capone kind of thing. I laughed. <laughs> you mean to say you actually have a plan? He glanced around him got up and came over to the sofa where I was sitting. I'm going to rob my dad, he whispered. I'm going to do it. Seriously? He put on a big, white smile. I've never been more serious about anything in my entire life, he said. I've been dreaming about this since I was a little kid. That fucker has no idea how much he's going to regret everything he's ever done. Are you in? 
I looked at him. Oh, come on, come on, it'll earn you so much cash. It's going to be totally crazy. It is totally crazy, Agil. How come you're not cool anymore? So that's why you came here? He sighed. Ingvar is game, but I want to keep him out of it. The guy is stoned literally all the time now. I mean it. He started drinking, too, and that's what worries me most. I'm afraid to leave him alone if he's been drinking, you know, because of his epilepsy. David says it isn't wise to involve him in the plan, and I agree. So you've started hanging out with David Lawrenson? Yeah, why shouldn't I? That means you already have someone who can help you rob your dad. You just want to drag as many people as possible into the prison cell with you. Into the fun, you mean? Come on. I shook my head. Keep me out of it too. Reptile Memoirs Slipping across the woman's sleeping body reminded me of hurrying up my mother's spine back when I was an unwitting child. I could cross it and the world was mine. I crept from her feet up over her belly. Her body was salty with tiny drops of sweat. Prey without fur are the best kind. The contact between tongue and body is more intense, the heat closer. Still, I couldn't make her my prey. She was too large, I was too small. No matter how hard I stretched my wretched body, I hardly came up to her thighs. Sleep made her face stiff, as if in death. Her breath and warmth were the only signs that she was alive. I crept up to her ear, lay close against her and touched her tender earlobe with my tongue. It tasted bitter, of earwax. I withdrew my tongue, lay completely still for a while before I opened my mouth, then began to whisper, quietly. The words I whispered were among the few I understood, words I had learned from the many humans with whom I had come into contact. I whispered, food and hunt. Then a third word, pray. The words were good, but the sound was lower than my own ears could detect. Still, I knew I made sounds because her ear quivered as she listened. Her face twitched in tiny contractions. She skipped a breath. Her skin became covered in goosebumps. During the day, I waited. First, she became more restless due to poor sleep. The next thing that happened was that she turned away from other humans, moving closer to me. She shut us away in the tiny room and did her lonely activities. She opened her mouth as if in a desperate hissing, unparalleled and free of enemies. After a few days, the next phase began. She started to wake in the night and look at me. She whispered back. At that point, I knew it wouldn't be long. Soon, I would be able to coil myself around a juicy, furry animal. Animals that were either too small to run away or which had been tamed by humans. Not difficult prey to catch, but they pulsed in my coil and gave me the wonderful taste of fresh flesh and blood. Instinct was a word I had learned from the humans. They used it about everything other animals do, as if it were only humans that have consciousness, or only animals other than them that act instinctively. But my actions towards her were conscious, deliberate, and her resulting actions, they were instinct. Liv, Orlesun, Saturday the 5th of February 2005 I buried my face in Anita's soft stomach. It was now almost completely flat again after the birth. She giggled and writhed. Her breasts bulged beneath the bra she hadn't wanted to take off, even in bed. She said that they were heavy and ached. If I came too close to them, she would pull away. She got up from the bed and put on her dressing gown, walked over and peered down into the crib where Aurora was commencing her little run-up to tears. She had screamed all through the night. The sound of her crying still vibrated at my eardrums. 
For her part, Anita seemed to have become immune to it. At least it seemed as if she had no problem tolerating it as she walked and pushed and comforted the tiny creature she held in her arms. Perhaps this was the way a mother should be, consumed by her child. I had ended up taking a walk around the block with the black toy poodle, thankful for a little silence. I walked through the snow, imagining that the dog was sniffing around for her puppies, even though I guess she'd probably forgotten them long ago. I hadn't been able to bear the thought of giving Nero any live prey since that day last summer when I had carried the puppy home. What I had done was unforgivable. Anita must never find out. Now she came towards me, carrying the half-sleeping baby, its head full of dark hair. Right now the little girl looked peaceful. During the night she had been red with agitation, an open-mouthed and screeching little monster. It occurred to me that there was no guarantee you would love your child, no matter how wanted it was. Have you noticed any difference? I asked. Anita smiled, surprised. Difference in what? In you, since you became a mother. She lay Aurora on her belly on the mattress. I don't know. I hadn't thought about it, but maybe I have noticed something. Not since I had her, necessarily, but I think something has happened, gradually. What? I think I've switched out who's most important. It's always been about me, me, me. Now everything is about Aurora. Aurora flailed her arms and legs, as if she were trying to figure out how to move forward. It sounds nice, I said. Yeah, I don't miss being so obsessed with Anita all the time, she laughed. I feel sort of wiser. I thought of my own mother, or the woman who claimed to bear that title. I wondered what had gone wrong, why she had never gone through such a change. Now I just have to figure out what I'm going to do about Birk, Anita said. Her face darkened. If I'm strong enough. But isn't it an arrangement that works all the same? She shrugged. It was an arrangement that worked, or rather I convinced myself that it was. But now I understand what I've been doing. It's prostitution and self-harm. I looked around me at the fancy bedroom with its dark lacquered wood, the windows in the sloping ceiling. Anita had said that the woodwork was old, that it was difficult to maintain, but beautiful. Those were the kinds of things that grown-up people said. Birk had inherited the house. He was the third generation to live there after his mother was diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's and ended up in a home. Was this a brothel? Was I one of its customers? An arrangement that worked for now? There's something you don't know, she said, a paleness coming over her face. I have to tell someone, otherwise I won't be able to... Aurora lifted her little head and let out a grunt. Anita automatically stretched out and moved her slightly, even though there probably wasn't anything wrong with the way she was lying there. Promise me you won't judge me. Why would I do that? She moved her hands behind her back, unhooked her bra and slipped it off, put it down on the pillow. Her breasts bulged, swollen and heavy with milk, large nipples and fine veins beneath the pale skin. He had punched her left breast. A bluish-green bruise almost completely covered the outside of it. The other bruises disappeared after a few days, she said. But right here, he really slammed into me. You should have seen what it looked like when it was fresh. I reached out my hand and touched the bruise with my fingertips. Her breast vibrated with her heartbeat. He's so jealous, she said. Accuses me of all kinds of terrible things. He says he can't be sure that Aurora is his even though all you have to do is look at her to know she is. He's jealous of my paintings, too. Says that I'd be happier if I stopped painting, and that I'd be a better mother to Aurora. That I don't take good enough care of her because I'm buzzing around in my own head. 
He's threatened to burn all my palettes and brushes several times. He doesn't understand that without my paintings, I don't exist. There's more me in them than there is in this body. The easel is my heart. My palettes are my lungs. Truly, that's how it is for me. So you're going to leave him? Yes, I want to leave him. She swallowed, bowed her head, shook her blonde hair several times. Fuck, she said. Really, fuck. That's the first time I've said it out loud. What am I going to do? I looked at Anita's bent head. Thought of myself, how I had taken Nero and my most important clothes and simply moved out of the flat share that day. How I found it so easy to close doors behind me. Maybe it wasn't like that for everyone, even after having lived with someone for only a few months. I'm so scared, she said, scared to stay and scared to leave. I'm mostly afraid of what he might do. There's a voice inside me that says it was just this one time, that he's not going to do it again, but I don't want to listen to that voice. I have to get out, get an apartment, somewhere I can hide. Anita put her head in her hands and began to sob loudly. There, there, I said, feeling awkward. You must have family you can stay with for now. I have a room at my mum's place, but I don't know how long I'll be able to stay there. I don't know whether I've told you, but Birk is the son of one of Mama's best friends, and we've broken up and got back together several times. Mama was overjoyed when she found out we were moving in together. She's convinced he's the perfect guy for me. I'm sure she'd soon change her opinion if you told her what he's done, I said, feeling weird and cold. I'd spoken like someone who knows something about mothers and daughters. Anita wiped away her tears, shook her head. I'm so scared, she said again. I don't know if I can do it. Just then, Aurora began to cry, a piercing howl. Anita lifted her to her battered breast, guiding her nipple into the baby's mouth. Aurora soon began to make contented noises, like some kind of murmuring machine. I wondered whether I had ever drunk milk from her breast. It was hard to imagine. Mariam, Orlison. Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017 I insert the old gold key into the lock. Try to turn it, but it's not like in the fairy tales where a long locked door is finally opened. The door has been open the whole time. I was the only one who ever locked it. Egil took over your room after you left, Ingvar says. I mean, he's been in prison, moved in with someone for a few years and then ended up in prison again, so it's mainly only been me here, but I haven't needed this room. He won't be needing it for a while either, so you may as well use it. He pauses for a moment, while you're looking for your daughter. The air in the room is stuffy, and a new, unfamiliar smell has entered it. But it's still my old room, even though the carpet is gone. The walls have been painted a pale grey and the bed has been exchanged for a new one. The plant that stood in the corner is no more. An old Nintendo and a cardboard box stand in its place. The room's main feature is still there. The window facing the garden and the plum tree. On the floor are a towel, some boxer shorts and a pair of Nike trainers. I think there's something missing. The thing that would really make this Egil's room until I turn and see the poster on the wall beside the door. Glossy, silicon with long brown legs. I turn to face Ingvar, holding up the gold key. Have you seen this since it disappeared? Ingvar stares at the key, wrinkles his brow. No, I haven't seen that since you lived here. This key, to this room, was in Eben's jewellery box. You're kidding? Do you remember the night it disappeared? He looks down at the floor, kicks at the door sill with his foot. He's never been good at conflict. 
It was his cowardice that enabled him to invite my brother here that night, as if they were good friends. Somebody who was here that night took my key and kept it for all these years. Whoever that person is somehow made sure that it ended up in my daughter's jewellery box. They were sending me a message. It's serious. Who do you think it might be? The way I see it, there are two people who could have taken my key that night, Egil or Patrick. They both had reason to want to go into my room. Egil because he wanted to get the snake. Patrick because he's Patrick. He probably wanted to snoop around in my stuff or something like that. I imagine Patrick picking up an item of my clothing and sniffing it. I can't imagine anyone other than the two of them wanting to get in here. Can you? Ingvar shakes his head, seems embarrassed. If it was Egil, he might know who sent me this message. So I have to speak to him. If it was Patrick, I swallow. Well, yeah, then it was Patrick. It can't have been Patrick. Did he even know what the key was or what it was for? I think of the day I met Patrick in town, when he leaned forward to touch the key with the tip of his finger. Have you become a latchkey kid, Sara? At the very least, he knew it was mine. He saw me wearing it. It wouldn't have been much of a leap to guess that it belonged to a door that was mine. You're afraid, aren't you? Says Ingvar. That it's Patrick. Just remember that there were loads of people here that night. It could have been just about anyone. I shake my head. Just about anyone hasn't made sure that my key ended up in my daughter's jewellery box around the same time that she's disappeared. It has to be someone who knows me. Somebody who wants something from me. Ingvar shakes his head, his long hair dancing. I just can't see it, he says. Patrick has always been so pitiful. Do you really think he made his way to Christiansund to kidnap her child? I stare at him, feel a strong need to finally sock him with the punch that has lain dormant within me since that night. I end up hitting the wall behind me instead. You're defending him, I say. You're still friends. No, no, we're really not. I see him around all the time at Smutten, but I never talk to him. That's what you said back then, too. He looks down, like a little boy. This time it's true, he mumbles. We stand there for a while, without saying anything. Ingvar scratches his beard and glances behind him, as if looking for an escape route. Have you kept any of my old things? I ask. He clears his throat. Check the storage closet. There might be something in there. He nods towards the small door in the wall. I open it, turn on a light inside. In the box room are many of the landlady's old belongings. A large trunk, a cast iron bottle rack, a box full of all kinds of junk. A black bin bag has been set atop a cardboard box labelled books. I open the bag stick my hand into it and pull out a sweater that seems familiar. I drag the bag onto the floor and turn it upside down so books, CDs and various toiletries pour out. A dress I used to wear all the time. A perfume I can't even remember. I don't usually tend to travel back in time. I only ever move forward. There's something wrong about looking back. You don't recognise yourself. I walk over to the window and peer out at the garden and the plum tree. Feel for a moment that I'm still live, looking out. But only for a moment. Next, I see Eben hanging there, dangling from a rope attached to the tree, swinging back and forth. I squeeze my eyes shut. Sit down on the bed and take a deep breath. Are you OK? Ingvar's voice is gentle. Leave me alone. He closes the door behind him. I hear his footsteps disappearing down the hall. I lie down on the bed, looking up at the white ceiling tiles. When Eben was six years old, she once drew an animal on the wallpaper of her room, something halfway between a dinosaur and a cat. When I first saw the drawing, I thought the animal's long, slim neck was a snake and my heart skipped a beat. 
I was unreasonably furious at her for drawing it. I sent her to her room, threatening that she wouldn't be allowed out until she had washed away every last trace of it. She couldn't manage it, no matter how hard she scrubbed, and that had, in fact, been my aim, to make her understand what she'd done. I've been so hard on her. On the nightstand are porn mags, condoms and a green slice of bread. I now understand where the smell is coming from. I sit up again, almost wretch as I shove the bread onto one of the magazines and carry it out into the hall. Ingvar's music is back in full swing, stinging my ear canals. My ears have become sensitive. I have no idea what band it is either. Haven't kept up with that kind of thing. In the kitchen, the bin is so full that I have to take the bag out in order to make space for the mouldy bread. I throw the porno mag in at the same time. It looks like an antique. Maybe it's something Egil feels nostalgic about, but I couldn't care less. I tie the bag's handles and carry it out, feeling like a goddamn mother, a mother who might never have the chance to come and clean up her daughter's flat share. Could Patrick have killed her? Should I have gone straight to his place? I step into my shoes and go out to the dustbin, shove the bag down into it and only just manage to close the lid. Only when I'm outside do I go to the car and get my suitcases. Think I can hear just how much Nero hates being moved around while inside that dark space. I drag the suitcases after me, stop on the steps, pick up the suitcase with Nero inside it and walk down. The suitcase is so heavy I almost collapse under its weight. It won't do to move him around so much. I drag the suitcase into my room and park it neatly beside the window before I go and get the other. Nero tries to attack my arm when I open the suitcase. I leap back, whisper that I'm sorry. Offended, he disappears under the bed. I let him lie there and calm down for a few minutes while I look for a clean bedding in the wardrobe, where everything is crumpled up into a ball, clothes and towels. There are boxes of painkillers and more magazines, and an unopened bottle of beer. In the end, I manage to find a sheet, duvet cover and pillowcase, and begin to make the bed. I left this life. I've become someone else. Every cell of my body has been replaced since I was last here. Part of me misses that earlier version. Another knows that she never wants to go back. When I'm done, I lie down on the floor and look under the bed. Nero is curled up, his head behind the nightstand. I try to draw him out, but he just lies there, threateningly opening his mouth. There's something behind his coil. It looks like a photograph. I reach for it, but he darts at me in attack. I manage to grab it and pull my hand away just in time. When I enter the living room, Ingvar is sitting there with his eyes closed, listening to music. He's playing air guitar with his fingers. I sit down on the sofa beside him, nudge him in the shoulder and hand him the picture I found. It was taken here, in the living room. Ingvar. Egil and me sitting on the rug in the apartment. In the background is the lower half of the TV and the bench illuminated by the red of the lava lamp. That's from a long time ago, he says, the good old days. I found it on the floor under the bed, but I couldn't see any others. Do you know where the rest of my pictures are? Ingvar shrugs. Maybe Egil took them to prison with him or something like that. That sounds unlikely. So you don't have any? A strange expression crosses Ingvar's features, as if his mouth has been sewn shut. He closes his eyes and leans his head back against the wall. No, he says. None. He's lying to me. I don't understand why. Can I borrow your phone? I say. Live, Orlesund, Wednesday the 13th of April, 2005. I stuck my fingers in my ears, shoved them in to block out Nero's insistent hissing, closed my eyes so that I wouldn't have to see him coiled up there on the bed in front of me. 
All night I had struggled to sleep because of his furious noise. I had to find some food for him, something he wanted to eat. Rats no longer satisfied him, and he regarded all dead animals with contempt. He tried to bite me on several occasions this week. One time I sprayed Listerine on him to make him keep his distance. Every single day I felt that I was failing him. I just couldn't bear the thought of another kitten or a puppy like Anita's. He knew what this meant, that I had started to put others before him. My phone vibrated somewhere nearby. I found it lying under a pile of clothes on my chair. It was so cramped and messy in this apartment. That's what I told Anita every time she begged to come and see where I lived. It was she who was calling me now. Where are you? she asked. Can I come over? I glanced down at Nero, who opened his jaws, showing me his pale pink palette. It reminded me of something, something I couldn't quite grasp. I'm kind of busy. It's bad, she sniffed, her voice high-pitched and thick. A total emergency. I've done it. I've left Birk. I inhaled, stared at the pink tinge of Nero's open mouth. Mama won't help me, she sobbed. I'm sitting in the car. Mama thinks Birk and I have something valuable that I shouldn't throw away. She doesn't want to listen to me. Accused me of lying about him, of only thinking about myself. She said that Aurora needs her father. She let out a husky wail and in the background Aurora also piped up. It sounded as if Anita took the baby in her arms, began to rock her to sleep. I don't know what I'm going to do, Anita squeaked. Can we come and stay with you for a few days, just until I find something else? I opened my mouth to say that it was so cramped here that it was a mess, the usual arguments. I imagined what it would be like to have Anita and Aurora here with the snake hidden somewhere in these paltry few square metres. It was impossible. But then I started to imagine Anita sitting in the car with the baby in her arms, her cheeks stained with mascara. If she couldn't find somewhere to stay, she would have no other choice than to go back to Birk. And what would he do to her then? Give me an hour, I said. I carried the bag in which I had put Nero, carefully down the stairs and back into the flat chair. I could hear him hissing furious commands from inside it. I had failed him. Of course he wanted to get out. He wanted to be free and hunt and live in harmony with nature. In his mind, there should be nothing to prevent him from slithering straight out onto the grass and making his way off into the forest, even if he might freeze to death in just a day or two. There was still only the mildness of spring in the air, but he could still freeze to death at night. The door was open. I went into the hall and kicked off my shoes. It was quiet in the apartment, no music, which probably meant that Ingvar wasn't home. On the other hand, I could hear Egil's voice coming from the living room. It sounded as if he was speaking on the phone. I should have done it ages ago, he said. I've never been so sure of anything. His voice sounded fervent. I stuck my head around the door, knocking lightly on the doorframe. I have to go, Egil said. I'll call you later. We're doing this. What are we doing? I said, after he had hung up. The robbery. This Saturday, in three days. He clapped his hand against his mobile. Papa has an important dinner with a client in town that day. He gave me access to his calendar years ago when I lived with him, so we could schedule when we would see each other. He laughed. <laughs> that says a lot about my father. Anyway, I know where he usually parks the car, so all we have to do is wait and attack him. Egil pretended to punch his phone with his fist. Bam! Hit him from behind. When he's flat out, we'll steal the keys to the house. I know where the safe is, and I've given the code to David. Easy. You can still get in on it if you want. I shook my head. I still don't intend to go to prison? His eyes met mine, and he gave me a roguish grin. But I haven't told you the best part. On Saturday, 
It'll be the first ever football match at the new stadium. The city will be crawling with people wearing football shirts. So all we need to do to make ourselves invisible is dress as if we're going to the game. It'll be the perfect crime. Who's going to hit him in the head? He grinned. I'm going to do it. With pleasure. If he sees you, he's going to know who mugged him. Obviously, we're going to hide our faces and it'll happen fast. He'll never have a chance to recognise me. He smacks his own palm again. He seems over-eager, almost manic. And you think you'll be able to do that? Hit your own father in the head? I mean, you're really going to need to hold your nerve. What is it you want anyway? He said, frowning. I set the bag on the floor and opened the zip. Nero lay still, licking the air with the two tips of his tongue. You can have him, I said. Agil stared down at the snake, the irritation from a moment ago seemingly erased. Do you mean it? On one condition. You can't ever tell anyone that I had him. You have to say that you only just got him, just now. He laughed. But <laughs> I've told everyone. Make something up. I'll talk to Ingvar too. I've never had a snake. Do you understand? He nodded if it's that important to you, and especially don't tell Anita. Anita? But she used to hang out with us when you lived here. I, I talked about the snake all the time back then. Well, I told Anita that you've been lying this whole time, and she believed me. But now you've finally been able to get yourself a python to play with. A girl took a seat on the leather sofa. I bent down and stroked Nero's scaly head. Silently, I told him that this was for the best. Our relationship was a black hole that was eating me up. It was time to put some distance between us before it swallowed me completely. Now do what you want, I said to Egil. Then I got up and started to walk towards the hall. Wanted to get out of this house as fast as possible, to put this phase of my life behind me. Every minute of my life up until this point had been parenthetical. Maybe my life would really start this time. Have a good road trip, I shouted on the way out. Mariam, Orlesund, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017. I sit on the bed, my legs pulled up under me. Listen restlessly to the ringing on the other end of the line. Egil is the reason I came here. He has to know something. Either he took the key himself and is responsible for where it ended up afterwards, or he knows who might have taken it. He knew everybody back then, darlings and criminals alike. All is in prison, a cold male voice says. I'd like to speak with one of your inmates, Egil Brinsep. He's an old childhood friend of mine. Telephone conversations and visits have to be arranged in advance. How far in advance? I'll only be in Ullison for a few days. I'm just visiting. It varies. Let me take a look. Call us back in an hour. I give the man my details and hang up. My fingers are trembling as I punch in Tor's number. If everything were business as usual, he would be busy at work but I don't expect things to be business as usual. Tor answers in a thick voice. It sounds as if he's just woken up. He never usually naps in the middle of the day. Is something wrong? I blurt out. A few long seconds pass before he answers. You're asking me if something is wrong? His voice cracks. I swallow. I don't know what to say. Say that you'll come home. I imagine him lying there in bed, fully dressed and red-eyed. There's something wrong with this picture. Tor isn't like this. Tor is strong. For as long as I've known him, he's used his sensitivity as a force to be reckoned with. He builds safe environments, creates, strengthens and transforms. I can't. He hangs up. I sit there, 
watching Nero trying to find space for his large body under the chest of drawers. I count to one hundred in my head, then dial Tor's number again. It rings for a long time. Yes, he finally answers. I think Eben is in Orlesund. If you have information, you have to give it to the police. You're not a detective. You're playing with my child's life. She's not your child, Tor, I say, regretting it straight away. Of course she's my child. I can't sleep at night. I've been put on sick leave. Today I was offered some pills to calm me down, but the only thing that will help is to find Eben. That's the only thing that will help me too, I say, immediately realising that this isn't entirely true. It's helped to come here. It helps that Nero has climbed up onto the bed and is now resting here across my stomach. This attempt to flee, back to another time where the tragedy hasn't yet happened. I so wish I could come home right now. I will come home when I'm ready. But there are people I need to speak to, people who might not want to talk to the police. I know I'm doing the right thing. You know nothing. I study Nero's unmoving figure. He's so much bigger than he used to be, but he's the same. I try to understand how I might explain this to Tor. His world is so different from the one I'm currently in. For him, it's easier. Laws and rules have to be obeyed. Customs must be followed. There's no alternative for him. Everywhere, eyes are turned in his direction, assessing everything he does. That's how it is to be a politician. Everything he does is in the public interest. If he keeps information from the police for my sake, it might be enough to derail his career. Still, this is something I have to ask of him, without him even being able to know why. If I told him why, our marriage would be over. I'm calling the police today, Tor says. I'm going to tell them that you've left and that you have information you believe might lead them to Eben. They'll find you. Can't you just wait one more day? Trust me, I would never have asked you if this wasn't really important. He's quiet. That means he's either shocked by my behaviour or that he's thinking. If they ask, just say that I went to visit family, I say. Burn the note I left. Tell them you never intended to mislead them, you just didn't think it was important to tell them that I was gone. Blame the situation we're both in. And if they don't ask, don't say anything. Just give it one more day. If Eben is alive, Tor says, one day might be the difference between life and death. That's exactly why I need you to wait, I say. This isn't something the police can do. I have to do this myself. The words make a knot form in my stomach, right below the warm area where Nero is resting. Is there something you haven't told me, Mariam? Is it him, Eben's biological father? Do you know who he is after all? I'm sorry, I say. There are some things you simply don't want to know about me. Will you give me one day? He sighs. I have to think about it. Once he's hung up, I lay flat on the bed and stare up at the ceiling tiles I studied so often during the years in which I lived here. I understand that Tor is desperate, and I'll understand if he calls the police right away. It bothers me that he has to go through this alone. Still, I can't turn back now. I have to find Eben. Live, Orlison, Thursday the 14th of April, 2005. Anita passed her hand over one of the biggest bruises on her thigh. She kept her T-shirt on, said that she didn't want to show me how bad it actually was. Aurora lay on a baby duvet on the floor, a pink blanket pulled over her. She had slept through the night, perhaps worn out after everything she'd witnessed yesterday. 
Mama didn't even want to see Aurora, Anita said. She wiped away a tear that had landed on her leg. She's been hard to get on side before, but now? I can never forgive her. I put my arms around her, gently stroked her back. You're tough, I said. I'm proud of you. A sound pierced the room and Anita jumped, so I let go of her, pulling back. It was her phone, vibrating on the bedside table. She picked it up, read the message. It's Bic. Again. She threw the phone so that it flew across the room and landed in the pile of clothes I had gathered in the corner. I have to tell you something, she said. I don't have the money for my own apartment, and I've no idea how I'm going to get it. Mama isn't going to give me anything. What about your dad? She shook her head. He'll just say that I never should have given up my studies at the Norwegian Business School in order to become an artist. I'm going to have to get myself a job, something that can earn me some money, fast. So live here for now, I said, until you find a better solution. Just then, we heard a loud crack. It came from the window. Another crack, and then another. Now we could see that someone was throwing stones. Anita got up, went over to look. No, Anita! I cried, but it was too late. She withdrew. He saw me, she said. How did he find me? It must be the car. I didn't think he would come looking, she said. He's crazier than I thought. He's probably gone around throwing stones at every window where there's a light on inside. What do we do now? The doorbell rang. Anita shrieked and curled up on the bed, pulling the duvet over her. Let's just hope nobody lets him in downstairs, I said, cursing my own words. Of course somebody was going to let him in. We sat there, unmoving, and waited for several seconds. Finally, we heard the echo of footsteps running up the stairs. Somebody grabbed the door handle, tried to turn it. Then there was the sound of a voice swearing followed by a hard hammering on the door. Should we call the police? I whispered. No, no, please. Why not? If I don't, the neighbours will. Anita leapt over to the pile of clothes and rummaged around in it until she found her phone. I'm calling Agil. Now Aurora woke up too. The baby's anguished cry rose and fell, out of rhythm with the hammering on the door, Anita picked her up and rocked her as she held the phone between her cheek and shoulder. Then someone answered, and she began to talk over the sound of the crying, over the shouting from the man in the hall. I held my breath. I'm not leaving until you talk to me, Anita, Beak shouted through the door. I'm sitting down on the steps now, and I'm going to sit here until you come out. Anita hung up. I looked at her, standing there in nothing but her T-shirt, her baby in her arms. How calm she suddenly seemed, despite the situation she was in, almost as if ready to fight. He said, someone called David can probably help, she said. Egil's calling him. Hardly five minutes could have passed before I heard David's voice out in the hall. He must have run straight out of his apartment and over here. There were a couple of hard knocks at the door. Open up, David said. I went over and twisted the lock, and David entered the room backwards, pulling Birk, twisting his arm behind his back. He crushed him against the door, twisting his arm even further until Birk gave out a howl of pain. David forced Birk's head against the door and leaned all the way forward. You've touched Anita for the last time, right? Birk nodded as well as he could with his head held fast. Now you're going to go home and you are going to behave yourself so that we never have to see each other again. I'm going to be watching at the window to make sure you've gone. He opened the door, shoved Birk out into the hall and slammed the door behind him. I'd managed to throw on some clothes, but Anita had been busy with Aurora and was still only wearing her underwear and a T-shirt. She sat on the bed 
rocking the baby, who had finally stopped crying. She didn't even seem to notice David's gaze, which flitted between me and her. Then David went over to the window. I went with him and saw Bick walk out of the building and across to a car. He seemed to be in great pain, nursing his arm. When we turned back around, Anita had pulled the juve over her. Thank you, she said. That was quick. David nodded. I'm guessing that's his kid. Then he shifted his gaze in my direction, set his dark eyes on me. Anyway, he said, smiling. I do this kind of thing for mummy, not for thanks. You know that, right? Anita turned pale. Because I'm guessing you must be able to afford it. Otherwise you wouldn't have ordered the torpedo. He looked at me again, a hint of laughter in his eyes, and I realised that he'd probably just made all this up on the spot. Was it a way of getting one over on me? His eyes drilled into me, challenging my ability to win staring contests. I was still good, but he was a pro. How much? Anita said. Her voice was shaking. David looked up at the ceiling, stuck the tip of his tongue out from beneath his narrow lips. I have an idea, he said. On Saturday, I have a little job that needs doing. If one of you helps me with it, we can call it quits. Oh, and I'll even throw a few thousand kroner into the bargain. David smiled at me, defiant. Now it was his turn to humiliate me, that smile seemed to say. Now he wanted to see me work for him. I bit my lip, tried to think of another solution, but my mind was a complete blank. I'll do it. Anita's voice was firm this time. She had already shown that she knew how to handle herself, and now she seemed eager to prove it. Anita, I started, I'll do it, she interrupted. Agil has already mentioned it to me anyway. Don't try to change my mind. Aurora started to scream again. Her powerful cry cut through the room. David laughed, a brief, high-pitched laugh. I like you already, Anita. Ronya Christiansen, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017 I have foam earplugs in my ears, blocking out the humming of the machine. Instead, I hear my own heartbeat, feel the vibrations when my feet hit the treadmill, the sweat that runs down my face to drip from my chin. I have to run without stopping, to push myself harder. My muscles can do it. My muscles can do it. I want to focus on running, to refuse to let my head think about work right now. I want to shut out the divers who sink far too slowly into the water, who should instead be hurtling down into the depths. The helicopters that take too long, they should be whizzing through the air as if in an action film. The ground is on fire beneath our feet. We have to search. But I also have to run. If I don't, I'll go insane. I have to run and give my mind some rest, so it will be ready to do what it can to help. This is what the investigation is like. A treadmill we're running on, without getting anywhere. No matter how fast we run, we remain in the same place. And maybe we'll never find her alive the little blonde girl who's laughing with her mother in the photograph, two happy girls in matching sweaters. If she's still alive, she must be held captive somewhere, gagged and bound, even starving perhaps. I mustn't think about it. I have to think of the sound of my own heart, the buzzing of the treadmill, the smell of my sweat, and focus on keeping up the intensity. I keep an eye on how many kilometres I've run, the incline and speed. The equipment registers my pulse, too, and I know how much my body can take, that I can push myself even further. Past glimpses of memories of the hours spent in the car with Beta, on our way from place to place, the people we've met. Last Friday's drunken memories of me and Auguste in a close embrace on the dance floor. 
how I later staggered home to sober up because a little girl was missing. I pick up my towel and wipe my face without stopping. When I run, I always take out my contact lenses so I don't have to see the other people in the room. I can't take any more input, can't bear colours, light, voices. All I want is to feel my heart beating. It usually helps to run, but today not even running keeps the thoughts at bay. In my head is an image of a little girl lying battered and bruised on a stone floor, crying because we haven't found her yet. Tomorrow, we're going to make even more inquiries, and I, the rookie, am going to conduct even more interviews. What if I ruin the entire investigation? Me, who couldn't work on the case on Friday night because I was drunk and messing around with my colleague. I slam the button to shut off the treadmill and wipe my face again. It's no good. Today, not even running helps. I have to do something. Anything. Mariam. Orlison. Tuesday the 22nd of August 2017. Mariam Lynn, I say. I was told to call back. It's about Egil Brinseth, who I need to see as soon as possible. He says he knows you, says the officer. Your old friends? I clear my throat. Th that's right, from when we were kids. You have a clean record, he says. Usually it takes time to be able to visit an inmate. But if you're only in Orlison this week, we can make an exception. You can come this Thursday at 10.30. I can't come earlier than that or speak to him. That's the best I can do, he says. Ingvar looks up as I walk into the living room. He's sitting on the sofa with his electric guitar in his lap and a plectrum in his mouth. He's been passionate about music as long as I've known him. Not in an ambitious way, not because he dreams of becoming a rock star, or at least I don't think so. It's more something he can't live without, as important to him as sleep and food. I've never had anything like that. True, I've built up a company from nothing, have invested God knows how much time in it. It was something I wanted to do, which I succeeded in, but there's no passion in it. I could have abandoned it and never looked back. I've hardly thought to check whether my deputy is managing to keep control of the new project. I simply slammed that mental door shut when Eben disappeared. How many other doors can I close? I can't visit Egil until Thursday, I say, slumping down on the sofa beside him. That's fast. I haven't been allowed to visit him at all, Ingvar says. They've got it into their heads that I have friends in the scene. He makes air quotes with his fingers. Well, don't you? It's years since I hung out with any of those people. I nod. So when you're not working or hanging around here, what do you do? Who do you hang out with? Ingvar reaches for his pouch of tobacco. I'm at Smutton, quite a bit. Have a few friends who hang out there. None of the people you used to hang around with. He shakes his head and takes out a fresh cigarette paper. Or, well, yes, maybe. I sigh. So, what are you going to do now? He says, lighting his roly and brushing away an ember that falls onto his jeans. Like I said, there are two people who could have taken the key. Egil or Patrick. It's too long to wait until I can speak to Egil, so I have to get hold of Patrick. If it's him... I stop myself. I don't think so, Ingvar says. I just can't see it. I look down at my phone. My hands are shaking just at the thought of opening a website, starting to look. Something stops me. I hand the phone to Ingvar. Do you have his number? Or do you have him on social media or something? Can you try to get hold of him? But... I told you that I don't... Can you find him? He starts to tap the screen. Sits there, like that, as I watch him. He's older, with wrinkles at his forehead, 
and new depressions in certain areas of his face. He's hollowed out. There's always been something slightly apathetic about him, and this seems to have become more pronounced as the years have passed. Then he makes a noise, lets out a kind of whimper with his breath. It seems unconscious. What is it? I say, and he straightens up. Nothing. He's on a few music sites I use. I'll send him a message there. What about a phone number? I can't find one. He might be ex-directory or have a secret number. I nod. Send a message to every profile you find. Tell him you have to talk to him. Don't tell him what it's about, just that it's important. If Patrick has done something to Evan, then he'll know that the messages are coming from me. Maybe that's what he wants, to make me come back. Why else would he send me a strategically placed message in Eben's room, something only I would understand? I take out the key, letting it dangle from its chain in front of me, follow it with my gaze as it rotates in the air around and around. I spread my fingers inside the chain so that it opens into a kind of heart. When this key first disappeared, I also disappeared from this apartment. I no longer felt safe here. Now I'm back, going around in circles, becoming a snake that bites its own tail. I have to relive everything I've spent my entire life trying to run away from. If he doesn't answer, I say, I'll have to go visit her tomorrow. For a moment it seems as if he's wondering who I'm talking about, but then he gets it. I never say mama. Bronya, Christiansun, Tuesday the 22nd of August, 2017. August looks at me in surprise as I come walking down the corridor at the station. Are you working now? I shake my head. Not really, I just have something I need to sort out in the office. He nods, looks around him in the otherwise abandoned corridor, following me as I take the few steps over to my office. He stands in the doorway as I go in. I sit down on the desk chair and look towards him, hoping he isn't planning on having a chat right now. He smiles and nods towards the enormous jigsaw puzzle of the Rakotsbrucker in Germany that hangs on the wall above my desk. That's a lot of pieces, he says. Mama and I spent a total of six months completing the puzzle. We would roll it up on a tablecloth each time we did a bit, so we could continue later. It became our joint project. Other colleagues who have seen the jigsaw have laughed at it. They think it's nerdy to hang a jigsaw puzzle on the wall at work. None of them understands what it means to me. It's a Teufelsbrücke, I say, a devil's bridge. It's constructed as an optical illusion. Do you see? It looks like a perfect circle of stone. He laughs. Yeah, very cool. Is it like the entrance to hell? Or the exit, I say, depending on which side you're standing on. Perspective, he says. Interesting. He nods towards the picture. It reminds me of the infinite bridge in Aarhus. Although that bridge isn't an illusion, but a true circle, you can walk around and around it for all eternity. He laughs. That's also a kind of hell, in a way. Why did you leave Denmark? I ask. Because I was walking around in circles. He laughs. <laughs> no opportunities for development, either at work or in the relationship I was in. I wanted to try something new. And I have family up here. He stands there, rocking on the soles of his feet. Listen, he starts, his Adam's apple bobbing up and down his skinny, poorly shaved neck. I shake my head. You don't need to say anything, just leave it be. He shoves his hands in his pockets, perhaps wondering whether he should say something regardless, but he stops. When he holds his head like that, he's sort of handsome in the way that boys were in high school. It's about perspective, like the jigsaw puzzle. After he's gone, I fire up my computer and open the programme in which all criminal cases are stored. Search for the right case and find the first interviews. 
click on Rua Ulsvik's interview with Mariam Lin just hours after Eben had disappeared. There's the sound of somebody clearing their throat and the rustling of papers as the sound file begins to play. Let's see, Rua says before pausing. I've been provided with a reasonable summary of the statement you've already given, but I have some additional questions. Live, Orlison, Saturday the 16th of April, 2005. Anita had pulled on a pair of black jeans, a black T-shirt and an orange and blue hoodie with a football logo and zip at the front. She tugged her hair into a bun at the nape of her neck, lifted the hood over her head and hung a matching scarf around her neck. How do I look? I laughed. Like a football supporter? She looked at herself in the hall mirror. I could use some lipstick, she said. Maybe some earrings? Only if you want to attract attention to yourself. She pulled out her nose ring and set it on the kitchen counter. I won't be long, Anita said. The bottles of milk are in the fridge. Heat them to body temperature in the microwave. Nappies and wet wipes are in the changing bag. If for some reason you have to go anywhere, just use my car. I'm not going anywhere. Just in case, you know? It hadn't occurred to her until last night that she might get caught. She had lain there crying in the dark for several hours. I tried as hard as I could to convince her not to go through with it, but it was no use. She imagined all kinds of awful things that might happen if she pulled out now. The doorbell rang, and from the window I could see that it was Egil down there. He waved his scarf above his head. From one of his hands hung a supermarket carrier bag. Anita pulled on her shoes, stopped for a brief moment as if she wanted to tell me something, then shook her head. I'll see you soon, she said, and then she was gone. Aurora lay on the floor, sleeping and still. With any luck, she would sleep until Anita got back. I'd never had anything to do with babies before, had no idea if I would manage to get her clean if she filled her nappy, or if I'd be able to put a new one on her. I glanced down at the tiny human. She was snoring lightly. Her nose was so small, her lips puckering as she slept. She looked like her mother, an absurd copy in miniature, almost frightening. But not only that. She sort of looked like me, too. She could just as easily have been my child. I'd never imagined it before, had never considered that possibility. But right then, I thought that one day, I might be someone's mother. Why not? Outside, I heard a group of male voices singing a football song, probably on their way from the pub to the match. The thought of Anita out there, risking everything right now, made me dizzy. I just hoped it would all go as smoothly as Egil seemed sure it would. Just then, I heard a piercing howl. Aurora screamed, becoming almost blood red in the face. I held her close against my chest, as I had seen Anita hold her, and tried to lull the tiny creature to sleep. She was hot and heavy in my arms, yowling out a possessed yearning for her mother. I rocked her as well as I could, taking care not to drop what Anita had entrusted to me. I opened the fridge and took out one of the small bottles of Anita's breast milk. I put it in the microwave to heat as I tried to soothe the baby. She seemed to have the world's strongest vocal cords. I took the bottle of milk from the microwave, but it was far too hot. The bottle burned my fingers, and I ended up dropping it into the sink. Aurora screamed. I'd have to try another bottle. This time, it went better. I bounced Aurora on my hip and dripped lukewarm milk onto my wrist, as I had seen Anita do, sat on the bed and tried to put the bottle's teat to the baby's mouth. Aurora howled and twisted and started to cry more loudly. What is it, little one? I said, rocking her. Maybe it was the lack of her mother's scent, or the bottle that was a poor replacement for Anita's warm nipples. I tried again, but Aurora bristled, resisting with everything she had. 
Her howling exploded against my eardrums, hard and painful. I tried to push the bottle into her mouth, tried to soothe her, but nothing worked. In the end, I sat there, half-heartedly rocking the little creature, hushing and shushing her. Then the telephone rang. It was Ingvar's number on the screen. At first, I just wanted to let the phone ring until it gave up. But then I changed my mind. Aurora's crying filled me with an aggression that I wanted to take out on somebody, anyone at all. I threw myself forward and grabbed the phone, ready to fight. What do you want? I shouted above the baby shrieking. On the other end of the line, I could hear music from Dope Throne, Ingvar's favourite album. Hello, I said. Are you there? Aurora continued her long, grief-stricken wailing. The music was still playing, but Ingvar was silent. Ronja, Christiansun, Tuesday the 22nd of August 2017 August! August! I stand in the corridor shouting in the direction of August's office. I haven't heard whether he's left. I've been far too busy listening to the interviews. But now my body is vibrating with anxiety, and if August isn't here, I don't know what I'll do. August! I'm just starting to take long strides down the corridor when he appears in the doorway. He's smiling in surprise, puts a hand to his hip. What's up? He's flirting. And it's my fault. If only I could 